Hello, everypony. One of the first episodes of My Little Pony that I watched was the pilot episode. I wasn't hooked, but for all intents and purposes, I liked it. A problem I had with it right off the bat was Twilight's element of harmony. Before it was revealed, we had all of these real-life qualities. Kindness, loyalty, things that real friends have. Then we get to the element of magic. This always upset me, but then it dawned on me. Twilight Sparkle represents the element of friendship. How can she represent two elements? She doesn't. Magic and friendship are one and the same, hence friendship is magic. If this isn't enough proof, I'd like to refer to the season 2 premiere, The Return of Harmony. When Discord corrupts the ponies, he says a line referring to the opposite of the pony's element. For example, for Applejack, sometimes a lie is easier to take. Or for Fluttershy, time to be cruel. Under this newly shedded light, Twilight's makes more sense. With friends like these, who needs enemies? There isn't really an opposite of magic anyway. Except for maybe witchcraft, but Hasbro wouldn't go there, right? Oh, well, back to the point. Twilight has always been the center of the friendship, like how she brought her friends back together in Equestria Girls. And the mastering of friendship made her a princess, for goodness sake, so it only makes sense to say Twilight's the element of friendship. I want to hear your opinion, so leave a comment. I'll probably be posting a video every Wednesday, so subscribe for more videos and stuff. This is The Notion, signing out. Goodbye. Hola, every pony. I'm going to share my Season 4 predictions. This is based after the Comic-Con sneak peeks, so spoilers, I guess. Okay, remember how Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon told the Cutie Mark Crusaders that they would never represent Ponyville or the Equestria games because Scootaloo can't fly? I've noticed that whenever the bully antagonist characters tell the good guys they can't do something, the good guys rise to the challenge and prove them wrong. That's what I think is going to happen in this episode. They are going to represent Ponyville. But how will Scootaloo do her part in the games with her disability? I think she's going to use her scooter. Here's the scene I hope to see in this episode. Scootaloo confidently screeches to a halt, finishing her act in the games. The crowd goes wild, Scootaloo finally sees her potential, and then... Her long-awaited cutie mark appears, and the fandom goes wild. Silver Spoon and Diamond Tiara just stand there, their mouths agape, as Apple Bloom and Sweetie Belle run up to congratulate Scootaloo. You did it! Sweetie Belle gasps. Your cutie mark! If something like this plays out, I called it. So, here's a toast to Season 4. This is The Notion, new vids every Wednesday, so subscribe. Adios, mi pony amigos. <laughs> I've noticed that lots of cutie marks don't match up with the pony's special talent. Look at Diamond Tiara. Her special talent is... a Diamond Tiara? Unless she's a jewelry maker, that just doesn't make sense. This leads me to question, what exactly is a cutie mark? In the episode called The Cutie, Twist defines a cutie mark as something you get when they discover that certain something that makes her special. But when the cutie mark crusaders look for the cutie marks, they try to find their special talents. I'll explain why these two approaches are different later. In Magical Mystery Care, the cutie mark is directly linked to the destiny of the pony, which gives us a third definition, destiny. I think that every pony's cutie mark can fit under these three definitions. I made a chart to help see where every pony's cutie mark fits in. Diamond Tiara's cutie mark can be what makes her special, basically being spoiled. The same can be said for Silver Spoon. Twist's cutie mark is both her special talent and what makes her special. She makes good candy, not many others can. In the same way, Rarity is good at finding gems, and that's what makes her special. Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie, and Rainbow Dash also fall under this category. But as for Applejack and Twilight's cutie mark, Apple's are AJ's special talent, and her destiny when you think about it. This is Twilight's destiny. Wait, what? How can a pretty star be Sunpony's destiny? I'll explain. In Magical Mystery Cure, Twilight fulfills her destiny by becoming a princess, a big star among her five friends. Sound familiar? The princess of friendship. Wow, so that blew my mind. I hope this explanation of cutie marks makes sense to you all. If you have your own interpretation of a cutie mark, leave it in the comments. I'll probably be making a video about Cadence soon, because she has a very confusing backstory. So stay tuned for that. I go. I recently watched Digibroni's review of Equestria Girls. If you haven't seen it, go watch it now. It's thorough, and I agree with most of its points. Except for this one. 
Did you seem disturbed with how many times they set up these plot elements, like the school segregation, but take them away or solve them within the minute? I, on the other hand, see the beauty of these setups. Lauren Faust set the world up for another flat, plain, girly show. But nope. Ask any brony. FIM might be girly, but to call it flat or plain would be an insult. In Equestria Girls, the writers set up these scenarios you would see in any other high school drama. But they take us by surprise. Honestly, I expected Equestria Girls to be High School Musical 4, only worse and with ponies. And except for the cafeteria musical number, I was dead wrong. They bring up the segregation. I was expecting them all to join together like High School Musical. We're all in this together. But no. It stayed original. Who else expected Sunset to change the ballad so she would win? I could have sworn in this scene Celestia would pull out the paper and say, Sunset Shimmer is the princess. And they'd all be like, what? Like High School Musical 2. But no. The scene where Sunset Shimmer accuses Twilight of messing up Pinky's decorations reminded me of something Sharpay might do, but they didn't go anywhere with that. And with Last Century, I thought there'd be a, another subplot with Sunset being jealous of Twilight because Twilight has her old boyfriend, but no. I think what Hasbro's trying to show us is, if we can beat one stereotype, we can beat this one. And they did. Bad writing or a hidden message? Decide for yourself. Wait. When you think about it, they actually did go somewhere with the whole segregation subplot. In the cleanup scene, they have a song about mm, together, together, blah 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 now. And you see all of the groups helping each other to clean up the mess Sunset made. So, I admit, the High School Musical Equestria Girls parallels are striking, but for the most part, they broke the high school stereotype pretty well. I tend to look really far into these things, so check out my channel for other crazy conspiracies and theories and stuff like that. In closing, I would like to wish you all an early Merry Christmas. Before Canterlot Wedding, Princess Celestia and Princess Luna were the only alicorns that we knew of. Because of this, Cadence intrigued me right from the start. The show gives no insight on how Cadence came around, but it's implied that she is not related to the royal sisters. Although the show is sparing in its canon, a certain book called Twilight Sparkle and a Crystal Heart Spell enlightens us on Cadence's backstory. According to the book, when she was a baby Pegasus, a group of Earth Ponies found her all alone in the woods and took her in. She was raised by them and always spread love like she does now, but one day, an evil queen cast a spell that steals love. Cadence confronted her and her love power reversed the spell. This bit I find interesting. Then, a magical energy surrounded her and took her to a strange place where Celestia adopted her as her royal niece, making her an alicorn princess, just like how Twilight became a princess. Whether this story is canon or not is up for debate, but personally, I believe it. At the end of the Crystal Empire, we see that Cadence was already a princess of a different land. A crystal pony actually recognizes her. Behold, the crystal princess. This forces me to believe that Cadence was part of the Empire before it disappeared, but why didn't she disappear with it? Suddenly, the pieces of her puzzle came together in my mind. My headcanon goes like this. As a baby, Cadence's raw abilities aren't correctly contained, so she can do things like pumpkin cake and baby cakes. Because of this, she puts a love spell on Sombra's guards and escapes the Crystal Empire. At that moment, the curse is put on the Empire and it disappears. Cadence finds herself lost in the woods, and the rest is history. If this is the case, then how did Cadence get her crystal heart cutie mark when as a child, the entire empire would just be a vague memory? Hmm... Conspiracy time. Remember in a previous episode where I said that some cutie marks represent a pony's destiny, like Twilight's? I think that the same is for Cadence, and in this scene, she's fulfilling her destiny, or her cutie mark. Like this scene for Twilight. Wait a second, what was that? Yeah, that magic aurora. What was that? Her soul? Her magic essence? And how about that? What was that? Both strange auroras occurred when the ponies fulfilled their destinies. Is there a connection? In both of these moments, their cutie marks suddenly make sense. If you have an idea on what's happening here, please leave a comment because I'm confused. This is The Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Make sure you subscribe to be notified of my weekly videos. Ciao. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, so Sunset Shimmer wanted to end Celestia's reign. She wanted to set the sun. Sunset. Intentional or not, Shimmer isn't the only pony with a name describing something they did, or almost did. Who else? There's a certain time of day where the sun is down, but it's not quite night either. A beautiful blue glow can be seen. This time of day is called twilight. Yes, I think twilight was named after the balance between the sun and moon, which is what she did in the pilot. She made peace between Celestia and Luna after a thousand years. Here's where the headcanon comes in. I think Nightmare Moon didn't just make night last forever before she was banished, but I think she also used her dreamwalking abilities to give the ponies nightmares. But can Luna even control dreams, or just walk in them? Here is my proof for the former. Remember the trees and giggle at the ghosties? Luna was responsible for these, yet they are identical to the trees in Skilloo's nightmares in Sleepless in Ponyville. Coincidence? Probably not. So... Luna is still giving Pony nightmares? Maybe they're going somewhere with this, in the Season 4 episode where she comes back. Maybe, maybe not. If you have any other thoughts regarding this, or your ideas or predictions, leave them in the comments. This is The Notion, signing out. Goodbye. Today I'm tackling a pretty big question. Where is Equestria? I highly doubt any of the MLP universe takes place on our humble planet. Still, you gotta wonder, how does the MLP solar system work? Because the seasons don't come naturally, winter wrap up in the running of the leaves, we know that the planet Equestria is on doesn't have a crooked axis of rotation, like our planet. It might look like this. Now, we know Celestia raises the sun, but does that mean she rotates the planet, making it look like the sun is rising? Or can this be taken literally? Maybe Celestia legitimately revolves the sun around Equestria. This is impossible, considering the sun is 333,000 times more massive than our planet. And if it's not different in the My Little Pony universe, it would take a mother load of magic. However, being her special talent, I would subscribe to the notion of Celestia literally revolving the sun. The geocentric model is pretty cute anyway. As for Luna, she just revolves the moon. That simple. Now, we know for a fact that Equestria is not the only place on the planet because of this helpful line from Applejack. What in the name of all things cinnamon swirl is a full-grown dragon doing here in Equestria? Sleeping. Huh? So there are lands outside Equestria? Maybe. I like to think of Equestria as a continent like Burke and How to Train Your Dragon. The dragons come from other islands or nests and occasionally fly over or, or migrate. Hmm. Conspiracy time. Think back to Egyptian history. The pharaohs would sit atop buildings in the morning and focus, claiming to raise the sun every day. This way, no one would deny his right to the throne because of all the power he has. Where am I going with this? Celestia is a fraud. Bear with me here. Let's assume Equestria's home planet doesn't spin, it just revolves, so each day comes each year. Now let's say the orbit is elliptical, so it travels in an oval around the sun. The gravity pulls harder here, causing it to move faster. So that no pony challenges her, Celestia claims to rise the sun in the annual summer sun celebration, which only comes around when the positions of the planets are like this, which explains why the sun rises so fast in this scene. Very clever, Celestia. What's that? This conspiracy is bullcrap? That's what she wants you to think. Okay, so maybe this is a little off the wall. Subscribe for more crazy conspiracies like this every week. Signing out. Peace! <laughs> When I saw Equestria Girls in the theaters, something intrigued me. Pinkie Pie. How in the hoof did she guess Twilight was a pony princess from Equestria? Most would view this as comic relief, but I tend to overanalyze things. Earlier in the movie, Pinkie claims that Twilight is psychic, and when Twilight says, Is that something you can do here? Pinkie replies with a suspicious, not normally. In my head canon, Pinkie is psychic. But she can only read immediate thoughts, like her pinky sense, only good for vague and immediate events. 
In both scenes with Pinky's strange knowledge, Twilight was about to say what had happened, so her thoughts would be easily accessible to Pinkie Pie. This would explain her incredibly lucky hunches. We've already seen that Pinky is special, and has a strange interaction with the future, and can essentially read minds. Heck, she can even remember every birthday in Ponyville. And if you notice, she's the only one to interact with the audience. All of this is begging for a backstory. How did Pinky get her strange mental powers? Maybe there's more to her usual one-dimensional self. If any of you have a good headcanon, leave it in the comments. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. This is The Notion. Subscribe for more weekly videos. Signing out. After the main six use the elements of harmony against Luna, this happens. Indeed you do. <gasps> Princess Celestia! The sun rises and becomes Celestia. At first viewing, I figured this is something Celestia always does. But no, this is the one and only time this happens. This got me thinking. Maybe to get revenge, Luna, who had been banished to the moon for a thousand years, banished Celestia to the sun, which is why she was absent for the whole of part two. Once Luna was downgraded, the spell broke, and Celestia was free. Just a thought. Subscribe for more weekly videos every Wednesday. We all love that klutz of a character whose mistakes outweigh everything else they've ever done. Watching them somehow makes us feel better about ourselves. Most of the time. Hasbro gives us an example of how to do it right, and how to do it wrong. But which is which? Okay, number one. Slapstick comedy is the lowest form of humor known to man. People admire the socially awkward. All aspects of their character have already most likely been explored. So many story possibilities. Intentionally stupid to gain attention. Accepts her stupidness as a uniqueness. Becomes the slaves of literally every popular girl to gain popularity. And finally, Derpy has real friends. If any of you still think Derpy is an offense to disoriented children, just look at snails. Always the last one to figure out what's going on. What are snails known for, after all? His cutie mark literally displays the fact that snails is mentally retarded. That's right, mares and gentle colts. Hasbro openly makes fun of the mentally retarded. And takes Derpy off the show for no good reason. I hated these two from the beginning of Ghostbusters. They're easily my least favorite characters in the whole of Friendship is Magic. No, in the whole of My Little Pony. In fact, they're the worst characters the world has ever seen! Derpy wins. Slavery is no foreign concept in the MLP universe. For example, in the Crystal Empire, Sombra enslaved the Crystal Ponies for a good long time. But I'm not talking about kings owning slaves. I'm talking about normal civilians owning slaves. Can proof of slavery be found in Equestria? First, let's look at A Hearthworming's Eve. I enjoyed this episode for its expansion of the MLP world, Equestria's origins, and history. This episode shows us that the three pony types come from three distinct tribes. These tribes were often prejudiced of the other two. In American history, whenever we found a race inferior to our own, what did we do? We enslaved them. So it isn't a stretch to imagine one of the snobby dignified unicorns forcing the earth ponies into unpaid labor. We can't prove this ever happened though, right? Enter Suited for Success, a good episode, except for one extremely questionable quote from Twilight. You shouldn't be overly critical of something generously given to you. In other words, you shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> what? A gift horse? Wouldn't that be like a gift person in Equestria? We humans got that phrase basically meaning, if you get a workhorse for free, don't get picky about its defects. This doesn't translate well into pony speak. If you get a free slave... Equestria obviously doesn't have that problem anymore. 
But in the lifetime of Granny Smith, however... There was no pony bill! That's right, my little ponies. Me and my family were pilgrim pony folk back when I was a little filly. Right there. Pilgrim pony folks. Pilgrims, according to history, are people who travel to a holy place. A place without slavery, maybe? Yes, it is strange how Ponyville was originally a village of earth ponies, explained by Twilight in Winter Wrap-Up. Maybe there is something to my nonsense. Just like our culture today, though there isn't slavery, there is still racism in Equestria. Not directed to the earth ponies, but surprisingly to the mules. I get sick of these cute catchphrases, too cool for mule, etc. Ponyville residents are still racist against mules, offspring of a horse and a donkey. Phillies and gentle colts, the ugly side of my little pony. Little jabs like this, I, the only part about the show I don't like, basically. Thanks for watching, see y'all next Wednesday. Okay, this episode was awesome. Major spoiler alert. First of all, you know season 4 is off to a good start when Twilight is learning how to use her wings. She can actually fly now, really well, which is awesome. But instead of just developing Twilight, this episode fills us in on the world before the Elements of Harmony were ever used. We get to see not only Celestia banish Luna to the moon, but the royal sisters turning Discord into stone. Of course, Twilight sees all of this using Sakura's freaky hallucination-inducing vial, but it is good to see Sakura again. This, plus another reference to Pinky Sense and Discord coming back, helped to really make this episode for me. This episode was far from perfect. Far from perfect. For example, to help the plot along, the main six forget everything they've learned up to this point, and all agree that Twilight should stay back while the rest of them journey into the Everfree Forest just to stay safe. Real smart, guys. This actually provided a chance for Discord to become the good guy by setting Twilight straight. Of course he did this in his own chaotic way, but he helped nonetheless. In previous vlogs, I've talked about how I like the episodes that expand on My Little Pony's world, its canon, like A Hearthwarming's Eve and Family Appreciation Day. In the same way, the Summer Sun Celebration, or Princess Twilight Sparkle, or whatever it's called, revealed the origin of the Elements of Harmony, the Tree of Harmony. However, the origins of the tree are still unclear. Was this planted by the sisters? Discord? or maybe even someone before Celestia and Luna. Let's look at what the tree is. Five branches extend from an image of Twilight's cutie mark, and each branch has a place for the other five elements. After the tree takes these elements, a plant grows from the trunk. The plant reveals a box with six keyholes. Of course they leave this mystery unsolved, but I believe they'll connect the further episodes using this plot element. Maybe each of the elements will be put to the test using the individual ponies. Speaking of elements, they're all gone. The tree has them, and Ponyville is left exposed to any evil that wants to invade. And about Twilight using the dark magic on that potion Zakora had... Why? Really? Zakora specifically stated that the formula could only be changed using alicorn magic, not dark magic. Wait, what is alicorn magic, and how does it differ from normal magic? I honestly don't know, but this Wednesday, hopefully I'll know it by then, because I'm posting a video all about that. Be sure to tune into that. Today, I'm going to talk about dark magic, but first, let's talk about normal magic. This mysterious force controls everything in Equestria, and much like the force from Star Wars, magic seems to lose balance often. What has always been the great equalizer to set Luna, Discord, and other villains straight? The Elements of Harmony. They're the most powerful magic we've seen so far. And I recently had an epiphany. One of these elements is not like the others. Can you guess which one? That's right. All of the Elements of Harmony molded to the pony's cutie mark. Except for Twilight's. Twilight's cutie mark was on the Tree of Harmony eons before Twilight even came about. Why and how? Right now I'm trailblazing a path into headcanon territory. I think that instead of Twilight's cutie mark being foreseen, maybe the six-pointed star is the universal symbol of magic. And because magic happens to be Twilight Sparkle's special talent, 
her cutie mark adopted this form. I believe this is Twilight's new part in the Summer Sun celebration. Luna sets the moon, Celestia rises to the sun. This little pink flash that Twilight does. I think she's maintaining the magic balance with her little flash. We've talked about the light side of the Force, so to say, so let's go to the dark side. Dark magic has always confused me. There's no clear pattern on its use. Sometimes it helps, like Zakora's tonic and Sombra's secret entrance, but it also destroys, like how Sombra perverted the Crystal Empire and enslaved the population. Speaking of Zakora's tonic, why did Twilight use dark magic when Zakora said to use alicorn magic anyway? Maybe dark magic is alicorn magic, but we've seen normal unicorns use dark magic, so probably not. And besides Celestia and Luna's special abilities, we haven't even seen evidence of alicorn magic being different from normal magic. Or have we? In the Season 3 episode, Magic Duel, Trixie returns with incredible skills, but they aren't natural. They come from the alicorn amulet. Does that mean Trixie was granted alicorn magic? If so, why did it corrupt her? Maybe this supports the theory that alicorn magic is dark magic. However, the magic animations differ greatly. The alicorn amulet gives a red glow, and dark magic still gives the purple and green swirls. So now we have three different types of magic. Alicorn magic, dark magic, and normal magic. And we know little even about normal magic. I can't help but feel that with the Tree of Harmony business, we'll go deeper into the roots and origins of magic in Equestria. If any of you guys can explain, please enlighten me, I'm still clueless. At the release of the Season 4 premiere, a new meme was born. Apparently, many bronies got a kick out of the mocking scepter that Discord gives Twilight in the second part. That night on 4chan, it became a thing. Many gifs and videos were made, photoshopping the staff into the hoofs of other ponies, or even totally unrelated people. Here's a couple of other examples. Besides the hilarious meme, I believe this scene was a hint at the future of Twilight's character. Let me explain. In putting her hoof down, Fluttershy went from being a pushover to a monster in the matter of minutes. This episode may have started a theme that reveals how easy it is to go from one extreme to the next. And though Twilight obviously looks upset by Discord here, there seems to be an extra look of regality. And though she has seemed to be underconfident in her skills, like in Ghostbusters and Equestria Girls, she might do a 180 and totally be full of it, like Rainbow Dash. She is the embodiment of magic for Celestia's sake. What doesn't she have to be proud of? And if you look at this scene, Twilight seems to enjoy giving orders. Once she gets past her lack of confidence. Oh, and by the way, everypony, I'll be posting a video next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that. But I'm going to take a break for the holidays for the next couple of weeks after that. So, so don't be expecting any videos then. Thank you all, this is The Notion, signing out. Hello every pony! Last weekend, I watched Season 4, Episode 4, Daring Don't, Air on the Hub. I won't give any spoilers, don't worry. In this episode, they revealed the author of the Daring Do books to be a pony named A.K. Yearling. Now, if Daring Do is a play on Indiana Jones, then why would they make the author resemble the author of the Harry Potter books, J.K. Rowling, A.K. Yearling, at the end of Read It and Weep, they give us this. Daring Do and the Griffin's Goblet. Awesome! Though this sounds like an Indiana Jones title, it also resembles The Goblet of Fire by J.K. This isn't the only similar aspect between Harry Potter and My Little Pony. Here's another parallel. Watch in the second movie of Harry Potter, as the bird saves Harry from the giant snake. Now in the episode, Owl's Well That Ends Well, watch as Owlicious saves Spike from the evil dragon.
suspicious. Hmm. How about this clip? Professor, so your bird. There was nothing I could do. He, he just caught fire. Oh, and about time too. He's been looking dreadful for days. Pity you had to see him on a burning day. Fox, is a phoenix, Harry. They burst into flame when it is time for them to die, and then they are reborn from the ashes. And then this clip. is going on here? Twilight? Yes, your majesty. Oh, stop fooling around, Philomena. You're scaring every pony. This is Philomena. She's quite a sight, as I said, but nothing unusual for a phoenix. Isn't that right, Philomena? A, a phoenix? A phoenix is a majestic and magical bird. While it appears healthy and happy most of the time, every so often it must renew itself by shedding all of its feathers and bursting into flame. Rather melodramatic, if you ask me. It then rises from the ashes, fresh as a daisy. All just a normal part of the life cycle of a phoenix. I'm afraid mischievous little Philomena here took the occasion to have a little fun with you, Fluttershy. Say you're sorry, young lady. Yes, the parallels are quite striking. And you can't forget the wand battle scene between Harry Potter and Voldemort. Have it your way. Expert! <laughs> Protect my subjects from you. Obviously, many of the writers get inspiration from the Harry Potter series. Don't tell me that's a coincidence. Now, I have an idea for a fan fiction. I think the fandom needs a crossover. We could call it Celestia School for Talented Wizards, starring Pumpkin Cake. Why? Now let's assume that a witch slash wizard is the equivalent of a unicorn in Equestria. They both use magic, after all. Because both of Pumpkin's parents are muggles, that would make her a mudblood, after what Malfoy calls Hermione in one of the movies. No one asked your opinion, you filthy little mudblood. Call me a mudblood. He did not. What's a mudblood? It means dirty blood. Mudblood's a really foul name for someone who is muggle-born. Someone with non-magic parents. Someone like me. Imagine the opportunities this storyline provides. Get creative, you guys, because I'm not writing this. When you're done, send me the fanfiction. I, I want to read it. <laughs> Please note that I haven't read the Harry Potter books, and I've only seen the first three movies so I'm sure I missed some parallels. Leave a comment on any that you know about that I missed. Thanks for watching this video and subscribing. This is The Notion, signing out. Like many other analysis, I'm a big continuity freak. When some aspect of the canon differs between episodes, I can hardly stand it. Like Bon Bon's voice. Oh, I didn't put those in my bag!
Is she still here? We heard Fluttershy was here. That incredible, amazing doll! Mine's got rocks in it! <laughs> Go ahead, try one of your jokes out on me. I laugh at everything. Things like this make me upset, which is why at first, Carrot Top's hair disturbed me in the episode Ghostbusters. Throughout the rest of the show, her hair is orange. You might be thinking, well, Ghostbusters was pretty early on in the series. Uh, what was it? Season 1, Episode 6? And they're still figuring things out. No, here's Carrot Top previously that episode. <laughs> so it goes from orange to green back to orange. So was this a mistake? Actually, no. From the episode Ponyville Confidential, we know that Main Dying exists in Equestria. So here is the story I think may be behind her hair. Maybe orange isn't so bad after all. This announcement is to my subscribers. Yes, all 10 of them. I will not be posting a video during Christmas break, so that will be December 25th and January 1st that I'm taking off. January 8th, I'll be back on track. For the new year, I have some great videos planned, including a couple of top fives, a response argument, and some pony genetic stuff. It's gonna be very interesting. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching, Notion out. Frankly, Bats disappointed me. Everything about it seemed off, and I don't know which one was worse, the musical number or the storyline. I'm not saying the song itself was bad, it may have been though. It just didn't meld to any of their characters at all. Look at Twilight's expression here. I don't think she's ever looked that grave. Instead of saying, stop the Bats, they could have been saying, kill the Bats, and it would have felt the same. Don't you think they're being especially rude to Fluttershy here? Other than Fluttershy, of course, Pinky was the only one in character, not giving her two bits about the entire matter. Unfortunately, the song was only one of the things I didn't like. Every character was off. Fluttershy? <sighs> if Flutter Hulk wasn't weird enough, now she's a bat. A stupid bat. Although the character designs and animations are amusing, I didn't like it. Then there's Rainbow Dash. Has she even mentioned Cider since the Super Speedy Cider Squeezy 6000 episode? It just seemed unnatural how she would pick up on her addiction after all these years. And you can't forget Spike, just there for comic relief, even though we just had an episode stating the otherwise. What the episode lacks in these aspects, it makes up for in its moral. Now, Fluttershy talked about resisting negative peer pressure and saying no, which is good and all, but the better moral isn't even stated at the end. It's more subtle. Keep in mind this is only my own interpretation. Now, let's say Fluttershy represents mankind. In this case, this story shows the struggle between man and nature. In real life, man ignores nature, plowing through fields, dumping waste products on habitats, being careless with nuclear radiation, the list goes on. Fluttershy is representing that choice, and choosing the good of Applejack's farm, or industry, human advancements, and technology, over nature. This only backfires on them, however, as it is on us. Here's where the writer got sneaky. It hit me that this doesn't just represent man versus nature, it's representing a more specific interaction between man and nature. GMOs. For those of you who don't know, GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, are in many food products across America, ranging from corn, snack foods, to other crops. Similar to the way Fluttershy changed the way the bats functioned for their own convenience, Humans have added extra genes to crops, affecting their lifespan and resistance to pesticides and disease. While this is a good short-term plan to solve current problems with crop famine and shipping products overseas, it will have long-term effects on nature and humanity. Negative effects. Like Applejack said, Be sure to put in there that I came to see that my short-term solution was a little short-sighted. Now, how do we know that GMOs is what this writer is hinting at? Okay, GMOs are often used to change the size, therefore value, of the product. Like the apple in this comic. Wait, does this seem familiar to any pony else? Of course! Applejack's prized apple. This here's our entry into the Appaloosa State Fair's produce competition. 
You know how much TLC goes into getting an apple to grow like this? TLC? More like GMO. Am I saying that Applejack uses GMOs? But biotechnology isn't that advanced in Equestria, is it? I didn't think so. But in that same episode, look at the cutie mark on Rarity's hazmat suit. The bio-warning symbol. Besides, I'm sure some unicorns specialize in genetic mutations anyway. Like, I don't know, an orange frog hybrid? This story also shows us how we can fix our problem. First, just like the episode, we need to know what we're doing to ourselves. We need to see, like the mirrors. Maybe, if we knew the effects of what we were doing, we would stop. This is why I still sort of appreciate the episode, though its plot might not be the best. On a side note, it is funny that after this Big Apple, we would have an adventure in Manhattan the next week. You know, New York City, the Big Apple. It seems like last time there was a giant apple in the show, it also had to do with Manhattan. Thanks for watching and subscribing for videos every Wednesday. Notion out. <laughs> guys, guys, guess what? Sombra is coming back. How do I know? Scrolling through my Spanish-English dictionary, I stumbled upon a word. Sombra, meaning shadow or shade. It makes sense, that's pretty much the only way he advanced on the Crystal Empire in Season 3, through shadows. Of the many mystery endings of Season 4, perhaps the most intriguing was at the end of Castlemania. <laughs> shadow ponies! How ridiculous is that? So, the Shadow Pony wasn't just a legend. Although the legend states that the Shadow Pony was leftover evil from Nightmare Moon, I think the Shadow Pony was actually Sombra. His name meaning shadow and all, he is literally the Shadow Pony. Though this theory has more holes in it than Queen Chrysalis does, I'm willing to bet Sombra will have a part in the finale. Maybe they'll go further into his character and, and give him motive rather than just crystals. What do you think? Is Somber coming back? Maybe it's a ridiculous theory, but leave a comment and tell me your opinion. Notion out. It's over 9,000! This video is a response to I Love Kim Possible Lots, Why Discord Is Not Star Swirl the Bearded. After watching and thinking about both parts, I still disagree. Here's my argument for why Discord is Star Swirl the Bearded. In her two-part series, she took the perspective on how it didn't seem like the whole Discord equals Star Swirl business is where the writers are going. After all, like she pointed out, John Delancey didn't even know who Star Swirl the Bearded was in his interview. But I'm taking a different approach. Could this theory be possible within the show's given information? Sure. Although Megan McCarthy and John Delancey basically stated this to be false, nothing in the show can prove this theory wrong. And besides, this transformation fits perfectly in the timeline of Equestrian history. Let me explain. Let's look at Celestia's monologue in The Return of Harmony. Discord is the mischievous spirit of disharmony. Before my sister and I stood up to him, he ruled Equestria in an eternal state of unrest and unhappiness. Luna and I saw how miserable life was for Earth ponies, Pegasi, and unicorns alike. So after discovering the elements of harmony, we combined our powers and rose up against him, turning him to stone. All right, princess! Now, because of this, we know that Celestia and Luna probably came into power after turning Discord into stone for the first time. And in a hearth-swarming eve, Spike says this, once upon a time, long before the peaceful rule of Celestia... And in that play, Clover the Clever said that her mentor was Star Swirl the Bearded. Therefore, Star Swirl comes before Celestia, right? It stands to reason. Keeping that in mind, let's move to the next part in my theory. In Magical Mystery Cure, Celestia gives us a line that would lead us to assume that Star Swirl didn't really have any friends. You did something today that's never been done before. Something even a great unicorn like Star Swirl the Bearded was not able to do, because he did not understand friendship like you do.
And in that same episode, what did Star Swirl's unfinished spell do? It switched the identity of Twilight's friends. Now, imagine Star Swirl, who had no friends, using this spell. With no friends to swap, the spell would swap his entire body. In his new Draconicus form, he is quickly outcasted. Of course, being famous for his time spells, he finds a way to become immortal. And finally, after eons of being bored, he tries to have some fun by taking over Equestria. This reign of terror doesn't last forever. Fast forward to where Celestia and Luna turn Discord into stone for the first time, shown in the second episode of Season 4. The sisters end the chaos and usher in a new age of peace. Celestia and Luna rise to power. It all works perfectly. Now, I won't forget Kim Possible's ideas altogether. She made the valid point that if Star Swirl was kicked out after his transformation, he would be stripped of all honor and wouldn't be remembered as the hero Twilight admired so much. She certainly wouldn't dress up as him. So, if Discord was originally Star Swirl who had this big fall from grace, wouldn't society stun him? Though she makes a good point, maybe no pony ever put two and two together. Perhaps the town knew about Discord appearing and about Star Swirl disappearing, but didn't know the two events were connected. This would be similar to how, in C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, when the snobby character Eustace goes missing and a dragon appears, it takes them a while to realize that the dragon is Eustace. Even when they do realize it, it's because Eustace told them. And we all know that unlike Eustace, Discord would keep his transformation a secret. Although Kim made other good points that would try to disprove his theory, this theory does seem to fill in a missing piece of equestrian history. To review the timeline, Clover the Clever and the gang ignite the Friendship Fire. Equestria lives in harmony. Darsworld the Bearded, after trying to finish his spell, undergoes a horrific transformation and goes missing. Sometime later, Discord appears for the first time to take over Equestria. As a result, Equestria lives in chaos. Two ponies use the elements of harmony to end Discord's reign, and they rise to power. Equestria is in a state of peace. One thousand years later, Discord is freed and shortly after sent back to his stone prison, only to be released again a year later. In an extension of my theory, where does Season 4 and the future of Equestria come in? Tune in next week to find out. So, last week I promised to fill in on how the Star Sword equals Discord theory will play out in Season 4. For those of you who don't know, the theory goes like this. At some point in his timeline, Star Shore the Bearded underwent a transformation and became Discord. The answer I found to how the theory will play out in Season 4 was, well, a whole lot more complicated than I expected. Like, a whole lot more. As in two of my other theories and an overarching force playing into it. So I have some more thinking to do. However, I'm not one to break my promises. Well, I might be if my hide wasn't saved by last Saturday's episode. It actually provided more evidence towards the theory. If you haven't seen it, slight spoiler alert. Spoiler alert! I will only be giving a, a light synopsis, though. So, in this episode, Twilight and Cadence are spending some sister-in-law time together at the Star Swirl the Bearded Museum when Discord appears and distracts them with the urgent task of taking him in. They never get to spend more than two minutes at the museum. Now, Discord didn't just randomly appear. We know that he knew of the get-together because of Fluttershy's letter. And if anyone would draw the connection at the museum, it would be Twilight. So, I think Discord was keeping Twilight from discovering the truth. And the friendship test he claimed to be giving Twilight was just a cover-up to hide the true reason why he appeared. I feel like they've mentioned Star's World too many times in the series not to go back into his backstory especially this season. And with Reformed Discord, the timing couldn't be better. Next week, when I finally get this whole issue sorted out, I'm going deep into the theology behind Friendship is Magic in ancient equestrian history. So stay tuned for that. Notion out. Okay, so three weeks ago, I posted a video about how the Shadow Pony from Castlemania was Sombra, but my evidence was limited to the fact that his name in Spanish means Shadow. Now that I think about it, Nothing else supports this theory, and Sombra for sure died already. The evidence just isn't that convincing. So, the question remains wide open. Who is the Shadow Pony? 
It seems like every season, some new evil is awoken. Season 1, it was Luna. Season 2 was Discord. And Season 3, it was Sombra. This order is the opposite of how they were originally banned. First it was Sombra, then Discord, then Luna. How do we know? So after discovering the elements of harmony, we combined our powers and rose up against him, turning him to stone. So Discord was the first victim of the elements of harmony, according to this. In the Sombra flashback, the sisters don't appear to be using the elements, so this must have come before Discord. And of course, Luna was there to banish Discord, so her own banishment had to have come after Discord's. According to this pattern, the big bad villain of Season 4 was banished before Sombra. Wait, if the sisters didn't use the elements of harmony on Sombra, what did they do? He was ultimately overthrown, turned to shadow, and banished to the ice of the Arctic North. Turn to Shadow. Does that mean he's the Shadow Pony? No, before the Elements of Harmony, what's to say that the sisters didn't banish every villain using the Shadow Method? So whoever the Shadow Pony is, was most likely banished before Sombra. This eliminates some other candidates. Sakura, although her eyes are similar to her first appearance, and Trixie, although the hat is similar. You guys don't always comment on my videos, but when you do, you have some awesome stuff to say. On my Sombra is the Shadow Pony video, mcody97 commented, Yep, not a bad theory at all, but at the end of the episode, we see the Shadow. The Shadow Pony does have a witch hat, like we saw with Trixie or some Star Swirl the Bearded artworks. Oh. So, Star Swirl is the Shadow Pony? Witch hat? Yellow eyes? Yeah, we found him. Or at least it looks like we have. When I was just a filly, Granny Smith told me of an ancient legend. When Nightmare Moon was banished, not every last bit of her dark magic went with her. Granny used to say, when night falls on the castle, that magic takes the form of the Pony of Shadows! You mean like a ghost? No pony knows. Ugh. Some major problems with this theory is Granny Smith's story doesn't line up with this at all. This leftover evil from Nightmare Moon she describes couldn't possibly look like this. So, maybe Granny Smith was wrong. Although she had been in the Everfree Forest once, her memory would have long past faded on the specific details of the Shadow. The second problem is that this would go against the otherwise convincing theory of Discord having once been Star Swirl the Bearded. I'd like to see the writers pull this off in the season finale, or explain what Star Swirl did in the first place to get him banished. What do you all think? Is Star Swirl really the Shadow Pony? Please share your thoughts in the comments. Notion out. Exactly how little are My Little Ponies? I'm sorry, but to answer this question, we'll have to use math. The horror! The horror! It's not that bad. We don't know the dimensions of anything in Equestria. They never give any measurements in the show. So if we want to find the height of any object in Equestria, we need to assume the height of one object and set up ratios to find the heights of surrounding objects. I'll show you what I mean. We'll take the height of something we do know, humans. The average height of an 11th, 12th grade girl is anywhere between 5 foot 4 inches and 5 foot 6 inches. We'll just call that 5 feet 5 inches. In metric, this is 1.651 meters. In this picture from Equestria Girls, let's say Fluttershy is 1.651 meters. In this program I'll be using, she is also 608 pixels tall. Angel Bunny, not including his ears, is 101 pixels tall. See? We can set this up in a ratio. Here's what it would look like. 1.651 meters over 608 pixels, Fluttershy's height in meters over height in pixels, equals x over 101 pixels, where x equals Angel's height in meters. If you do the math, this puts Angel at around 0.27 meters. Now all we need is a picture of Angel Bunny with Pony Fluttershy. 
Let's use this one. This is from the intro. Let's set it to scale with Angel Bunny. Not including Fluttershy's head or her arched back, Pony Fluttershy stands 188 pixels tall. So let's reverse the project we used to find Angel's height to find Fluttershy's height. The ratio would look like this. 0.27 meters over 101 pixels, Angel's height in meters over her height in pixels, equals x over 188 pixels, where x equals Fluttershy's height in meters. You can do the math in the same way. This puts Fluttershy's height, excluding her head and neck, at 0.5 meters. Her total height is just under 2.5 feet. Wow, that is small. And because a real-life pony becomes a horse at around 1.47 meters, excluding the head, that means a full-grown equestrian pony is less than half the height of most ponies on Earth. I guess the show isn't called My Little Pony for nothing. Wait a second. Why don't ponies in Equestria turn into horses? Tune in next week to find out. This is a filly, this is a pony, and this is a pony. But at what point do ponies become horses? Friends. Assuming that Granny Smith is considered a pony, even at the end of a pony's lifespan, they still haven't developed into horses. While looking for an explanation, my first thought was maybe the pony stage is the equivalent to our adult stage the final stage of development, and equestrians just don't turn into horses. We do know, after all, that our own ponies and equestrian ponies are drastically different. However, this theory was debunked in the show, more than once. Take the season 4 song, Heart Strong as Horses. Horses are alluded to every so often in My Little Pony. In fact, in Philly Vanilli, they even make a his voice is a little hoarse, pun. But we haven't seen any horses in Equestria, right? Actually, think back to the Season 3 episode, Magic Duel. I have to be at my best when she arrives with the delegates from Saddle Arabia. Oh. Oh. These delegates from Saudi Arabia have the most horse-like figures we've seen in the show. Saddle Arabia must be a play on Saudi Arabia which is on the other side of the world for us Americans, but there are apparently horses there. Why? Beats me, but the best theory I could come up with is that Canterlot and surrounding cities and villages are like Neverland from Peter Pan, where no one ages. The reasons why could be their proximity to the royal sisters or possibly the strong magic that surrounds them. These delegates give us the first idea of Equestria, Celestia's kingdom being one of many. Wait, saddles? Saddles are tools we humans use to ride horses. Then are there humans in Saddle Arabia? Well, humans are actually canon in My Little Pony, besides Equestria Girls. How? This guy. Yes, he is a minotaur, not strictly human, but in Greek mythology, minotaurs are known to be half man, half bull. So does that mean they're humans in Equestria? Maybe living with the horses in Saudi Arabia? Would these humans be the same as the ones shown in Equestria Girls, or totally different? Wow, these horses brought up a huge range of topics, and most of them remain a mystery. What do you guys think? Leave a comment in the description, and I'll see you all next Wednesday. Notion out. Who is Best Pony? Some of you might not be too happy with the answer. Ah yes, the age-old question. Like Twilight in the Ticketmaster episode, I'm going into some pretty dangerous territory. If I announce one pony to be better, then all the fans of the other ponies will dislike, unsubscribe, block, report, burn down their computer, and all that fun stuff. And knowing this fandom, that's hardly an exaggeration. Come on guys, love and tolerate. In the end of the episode, Twilight never had to choose, and everybody won. Unfortunately, this won't play out the same way. So here it goes. <sighs> of the main six, the best pony is... 
Fluttershy. Yay! And no, she's not my favorite pony because she won the fan favorite poll. In fact, it's the other way around. She won the fan favorite poll because she's my favorite pony. That's right, 121 of those winning votes came from me. Now, before you guys dislike, unsubscribe, block, report, burn the computer down, let me make it clear that every pony has strengths and weaknesses. And who your favorite pony is depends on which strengths you prefer to see. For example, people who like character development might think Twilight Sparkle's the best pony. People who like the ponies who have better episodes may think Rarity's the best pony. People who value strong family connections would like Applejack. People who are super ultra extreme mouse amazing might think Rainbow Dash is better. Super ultra extra, whatever you said. People who admire the humorous side of My Little Pony would like Pinkie Pie. In the same way, the reason I like Fluttershy is, well, she's adorable. Yes, it's true that she may be the weakest in all these other aspects, but what she lacks in those, she really makes up for in her kind, loving, understanding personality. And of course, her adorableness. Look at Discord, for example. Fluttershy is the only one of the main six to really understand and befriend Discord while the others are still holding grudges from Season 2. And as we found out recently, they even write to each other. Well, she told me about it in her last letter. You and Fluttershy write each other letters? Well, of course we do. We're friends. Ship, 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 ship what? Moving on. Another thing that makes Fluttershy so lovable is her relatability, especially in her social tendencies. Even the best of us have trouble introducing ourselves, having stage fright, or just being shy. And even though she has the same character flaw she had in the beginning of the series, she's making baby steps in the right direction. A realistic transition, if you ask me. Yet another thing I like about Fluttershy is her passion. I love seeing her get passionate about singing, about animals, and singing animals. Lots of you guys probably still disagree, and that's okay. Everyone's entitled to their wrong opinions. And to my fellow Fluttershy lovers, number one, you're awesome. Number two, you all should go follow my Instagram account. I pretty much just post pictures of Fluttershy every day. None of the pictures are my own, but I'm nine followers away from my goal of 100 followers. So go follow at flutter underscore butter underscore. This is the Brony Notion signing out until next Wednesday. Rohoof. Despite their cruelty, annoyingness, and the fact that everyone hates them, Silver Spoon and Diamond Tiara are actually interesting characters. Just like Babs, you can tell they don't bully the Cutie Mark Crusaders just for the sake of being mean. They have motives. But what are their motives? Well, getting a Cutie Mark is one of the, if not the biggest, part of a pony's life. At that moment, their entire future is revealed. Twist describes cutie marks as something you get when they discover that certain something that makes her special. And in that same episode, listen to what Twilight says about ponies without cutie marks. They still get to experience the thrill of discovering who they are and what they're meant to be. And they've got all the time in the world to figure it out. With all those things said, let's look at this through the perspectives of these two fillies. Imagine the day when Diamond Tiara, or Silver Spoon, got their cutie mark and realized their spoiled personality had just become their destinies. The other blank flanks could be anything they want, but not them. They could only ever live up to the crown on their head or their Silver Spoon. This perspective is actually pretty depressing and definitely changes the way you think about them. It also explains why the two are so inclined to bullying. They're jealous of the blank flanks. I'd be too if I was stuck being a snobbish brat. I feel like something between them and the Cutie Mark Crusaders is changing in Season 4. In Flight to the Finish, the usual insults weren't bothering the Cutie Mark Crusaders. But you know what you don't have? You are Cutie Marks! Flags, 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 flags! What does that have to do with flag carrying? So Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon took it to the next level and made fun of Skulu's handicap. But how do we stop them? We already called them Blank Flanks! And we need to find a new way to get under their skin! Or maybe... get under 
their wings. You have a Pegasus pony who can't even fly! Although this did create the response they were looking for, the two just stopped bullying. In Twilight Time, they seem to be almost friends. Now, I understand that they were just using the Cutie Mark Crusaders to hang out with the princess, but usually, the two would have nothing to do with the Cutie Mark Crusaders at all. It definitely is a big change. I can't help but feel like these two actually admire the Cutie Mark Crusaders and wish to join their clubs despite the fact that they've already found their Cutie Marks. What do you guys think? Are these guys good characters, or are they just the stereotypical bully characters you find in any other movie? Tell me what you think in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoo. From one to another, another to one. A mark of one's destiny singled out alone fulfilled. What in the huff is that supposed to mean? I'm glad you asked. Friends. Out of all the mysteries in Magical Mystic Cure, perhaps the most mysterious is Star Swirl's unfinished spell. We know that the spell switched the cutie marks and therefore destinies of Twilight's friends, but let's take a deeper look. We'll take the original spell apart phrase by phrase. From one to another, another to one. This is obviously talking about the way the cutie marks switched from one to another. A mark of one's destiny, probably referring to the cutie mark as the mark of one's destiny. Singled out alone, fulfilled. This one is more complicated. When the elements of Harmony swapped, Twilight's was unaffected. Her element was singled out alone. And because the element of Harmony is synonymous with the cutie mark, you could say the mark of her destiny was singled out alone. But was it fulfilled? First, let's talk about what the spell means by fulfilled, or at least what I think it means. Looking at Cadence, we can observe that her cutie mark didn't make sense for most of her life. She had this cutie mark of the Crystal Heart long before she had even seen the Crystal Empire. In the Crystal Empire episode, at this very moment, her cutie mark became clear. Or crystal clear. <laughs> no. Or anyway, her mark was fulfilled. In the same way, Magical Mystery Cure brings about a change in Twilight's life that fulfills Twilight's cutie mark. Alright, get ready for this. When Twilight became a princess, she became a big star among her five friends. Just like her cutie mark. Mind blown! Now, I know I said this in a previous video, but I wanted to restate it with more context. Let's think about it this way. Twilight's mark is the symbol of the elements of harmony. The same symbol that was put on the tree of harmony, eons before Twilight's birth. Looking at it this way, Twilight has a huge part in equestrian history. That being said, let's look at the second part of the spell. The part that Twilight filled in afterwards. From all of us together, together we are friends. With the marks of our destinies made one, there is magic without end. When are their marks made one? The marks of their destinies, aka cutie marks, aka elements of harmony, are made one whenever the elements of harmony are activated. Each of the six parts work together to create that one rainbow death orb of friendship. Well, what else was I supposed to call it? While writing this part of the spell, with that final stroke of the pen, Twilight put Equestria into a Ford Princess balance. Obviously, it was Destiny that brought her to this action. Let me explain. The final connector to these theories is the spark from the pilot. Before Twilight's sixth element of magic was revealed, Twilight said this. Where's the sixth? The book said, when the five are present, a spark will cause the sixth element to be revealed. And when Twilight's friends came to save her from Nightmare Moon, this happened. My friends! This spark, whatever it was, gave Twilight the final push towards completing the elements of harmony, creating that essential part of Equestria. If it weren't for this realization, the episode would have taken a very different course. A mark of one's destiny singled out alone fulfilled. <gasps> Wait a second, that's it! I understand now! I know how to fix the spell! Two and a half seasons later, the same spark pushes Twilight to completing or fulfilling her element, magic. 
Whatever the spark was, had to have been destiny pushing Twilight to this very moment. This magical mystery cure wasn't just a cure to the cutie mark swapping the bottle, but also it secured Equestria's peaceful standing. These theories, accurate or not, do hold true to the core idea of the show, friendship is magic. Wow, it, it's amazing how interconnected the smallest details in the show are. If you have anything to add or contradict, please leave your thoughts on this topic in the comments below. I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about this one. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoop. Rainbow Dash doesn't deserve to be the element of loyalty. Try to think of more than twice when she's done something loyal. In the pilot episode, Rainbow Dash chooses her friends over being in the Shadow Bolts, which is her first act of loyalty, but she doesn't really show another good one until Season 3. I'll go through a list of significant episodes between those two points. In Griffin the Brush Shop, Rainbow Dash avoids Pinkie Pie to spend more time with Gilda. You'd think with her element, she'd be able to consider both of her friends at the same time. In Dragon Shy, Rainbow Dash was very short-tempered with Fluttershy, even though she had a really important part in the mission. In Mysterious Meriduel, Rainbow Dash's self-image gets ridiculously huge, and her ego becomes more important than the safety of Ponyville. And in Super Speedy Cider Squeezy 6000, she is quick to abandon Applejack Cider for Flamin' Flams. I couldn't find another act of loyalty until the Wonderbolt Academy, where Rainbow Dash is willing to risk her entire future with the Wonderbolts because of her standards and her friends. However, in Season 4's episode Rainbow Falls, Rainbow falls back into her pattern. She seriously considers giving up on Ponyville's team so she could join the Wonderbolts. Element of loyalty fail if you ask me. There's an idea that's been floating around the Bernie community that Applejack should have had Rainbow Dash's element, and Rainbow Dash should have had Applejack's. Link in the description. If you think about it, Applejack is loyal to her farm, her family, her friends. And Rainbow Dash is brutally honest. Take Art of the Dress, for example. They're very nice. And we're plum grateful because you work so hard on them. Mine's just not as cool as I was imagining. I think the writers are catching on, though. In the episode Mod Pie, the most recent episode as of the posting of this video, Pinky compares Mod to her friends, pointing out their likes. But unlike the others, Applejack's element is mentioned. She expresses herself through fashion just like Rarity, and she's really smart. She's honest, and loves bars things, and is good at games, and, well, uh, she's awesome! And later in that episode, Applejack redeems her element by being the honest one. You're ever so thoughtful to share your special bonding ritual with us, but, uh... But what? <sighs> the truth is, we've all been trying real hard to get closer to Maud, but, well, maybe some ponies just don't click the way others do. Uh -huh. We just wouldn't feel right making something that means we're best friends if, well, we aren't. Usually in a situation like that, Rainbow Dash would have been the first to blurt out the truth. But that problem is being solved by the writers. Good job, writers. But Rainbow Dash on the other hoof still needs more chances to prove her loyalty. Or else Spike might have to replace her for the elements of loyalty. Wait, that's not a bad idea. Spike puts up with a whole lot from Twilight, especially in the early seasons. It can only be expected for a loner, the only dragon in a town of ponies, but still, he could easily just walk out and join his dragon friends, but he doesn't. Spike will do literally everything for Twilight, or Applejack in that one episode. If Rainbow Dash was asked to, I don't think she would count every blade of grass in Sweet Apple Acres. By the way, are exactly 24,567,837 blades of grass at Sweet Apple Acres. Maybe the writers were acknowledging this in the Return of Harmony episode, where Twilight assigned Spike to the element of loyalty. At first I thought it was a joke, but Spike actually works better than Rainbow Dash. What do you guys think? Am I being too hard on Rainbow Dash? I'd like to see your thoughts on this in the comments. I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone for 100 subscribers. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoof. Why was Spike so grumpy in Winter Wrap-Up? And no, it's not because he didn't get enough sleep.
So imagine you're the only dragon in a world of ponies, and you don't know where you came from other than some egg. You don't know who your parents are, and you struggle with your identity. Ladies and gentlemen, the world of Spike the Dragon. Now, imagine one night you have a dream where you meet your parents for the very first time. Watch this clip from Winter Wrap Up through that perspective. Here's Spike in the corner dreaming about his parents. <gasps> Spike, wake up! Wake up, wake up! It's Winter Wrap Up Day! Huh? Huh? Mommy? Winter Wrap Up! You're not mommy. According to my headcanon, this is what happened to Spike, and why he was so desperate to go back to bed, so he could finally see his parents again. It's sad when you think about it. Look at his face here. That face doesn't just say, I want to go back to sleep. He looks like he just lost something very close to him. When he finally sleeps again, it doesn't last long. Spike's sure gonna be in for a hog-sized surprise when that last piece of ice melts. <laughs> <laughs> And they laugh about it. Really, how rude can you get? They just let Spike fall into the icy cold water? He got a cold from that. Aw, oh, poor Spike. But really, he's a very unappreciated member of society for all he goes through. I mean, it's not like growing up in a totally different culture won't affect you. He's even developed a crush on a different species. I think Spike deserves a little more love from the fandom than what he gets. Especially from Friendship is Witchcraft. Oh, I'm so glad we released that panther for Spike to play with. <laughs> My Lord, help! I distracted the panther, so he should be safe for now. <sighs> Whether he actually had the dream or not, I still think Spike is an underrated character. What do you guys think? Is Spike a good character, or is he really just there for comic relief, like Cumdrum? I want to hear both sides of the argument, so let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. bro -hoof. Despite their stupidity, annoyingness, and the fact that everyone hates them, Snips and Snails are actually interesting characters. That opening statement was the exact same way I started my video about Diamond TR and Silver Spoon. Reason being, I feel the same way about both duos. In the past, I've been nothing short of harsh to Snips and Snails, for obvious reasons of course, but recently I've come to realize you can't truly understand a pony until you've walked a mile on their hoofs. And if you look close enough, Snips and Snails are surprisingly deep, which contrasts their shallow exterior. To prove my point, I'll reference their main appearances throughout the show. We'll start with Ghostbusters. These two made a rather negative first impression with me, as their humor seemed to have a self-deprecating basis. Pretty much, their only source of humor comes from them making themselves look stupid. Although what I did find interesting was how fast they gravitated to Trixie, and instantly became her slave. The exact same thing happened in Equestria Girls, when the two practically became henchmen of Sunset Shimmer. I believe these two are victims of low self-esteem. Think about it. Everything we've ever seen them do has revolved around a popular figure, who was in or trending. Whether it was Rainbow Dash, Mare Duel, Trixie, or Sunset Shimmer. So if they do have a poor self-image, they would naturally highly admire the popular kids, and would associate themselves with that person. Which of course we see happen, several times. I think these two have made the tragic assumption that no one will appreciate them for who they are, so they resort to being the clowns that people laugh at to gain some attention as opposed to none at all. The one time Snips and Snails had the spotlight, they couldn't get enough of it. They weren't getting positive attention from the full free press, but it was attention nonetheless, so of course they had to have more. This is all part of the natural need to feel belonged in a group of peers. Just like Silver Spoon and Diamond Tiara, lots about Snips and Snails can be observed without it being directly mentioned in the show. You just have to read between the lines to pick it up. What do you guys think? Let me know your opinion on Snips and Snails in the comments. As always, I love to hear all sides of the argument. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday, bro -hoop. And the best moral of Season 4 goes to... Testing, testing, one, two, three. There's definitely been a ton of good, applicable morals this season.
but this one really takes the cake. I feel like the entire story can be summed up in one quote from Albert Einstein. Everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing that it's stupid. When Rainbow Dash didn't learn anything after the five teaching methods from her friends, she became that fish, until she finally found her teaching method. Not everyone learns the same way. I love this episode because this is what every student needs to hear. And teachers should watch this episode too. This episode is definitely to the kids who look at a history book for two hours or sit in a classroom for days and get absolutely nothing out of it. They're not stupid, that's just not their style of learning. And they need to seek things that'll help them remember more, whether it's music, or theatrical productions, or costume design. Although, I do feel like they were a little easy on Rainbow Dash, who wasn't even trying to listen in the classroom scene. After all, kids who could do well, but don't because they decide to goof off in class, are totally different from the kids who just learn differently. Another great aspect of this story is any student could see themselves mirrored in the story and how they learn throughout the different teaching methods. Speaking of teaching methods, each one was incredibly hilarious. The entire school scene was totally relatable, especially this clip. The magic of learning. That open mouth just makes the scene for me. Not to mention, Fluttershy's play was adorable and made me laugh pretty hard. Pinky's 90s style rap was even funnier. The writer of this episode did a great job at portraying the main six in perfect character. Fluttershy, for example, showed little trouble breaking up the fight. In any other season, it would have been like, Oh, maybe you should stop fighting. That is, if, if you want to. Oh, okay. Whatever you want to do, I guess. She's definitely picked up assertiveness since the Breezy's episode, which made me happy. Her characters finally developing constantly throughout the episodes. Then there's Twilight. Since season 3, Twilight just sort of lost all flaws by becoming the perfect pony princess. But in this episode, we finally got to see some of her irritation, which was a huge part of her character, Circa Magical Mystery Cure. On a final note, did anyone notice that Rainbow Dash has a very Sherlock-like ability to analyze small details? And even without realizing it, her method of learning was pretty incredible if you ask me. What did you guys like or dislike about the episode? Share your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof! Twilight Sparkle is pretty incredible. She is after all an alicorn, but she's actually more important than we thought. One of these things is not like the others. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that Twilight is different from the other five ponies. But why? Well, the fact that Twilight's element of harmony is a crown, as opposed to the other's necklaces, isn't the only thing that sets her element apart. In the pilot episode, the elements of harmony molded to fit the cutie marks of Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie, Applejack, and Rarity. But not Twilight's. When the sixth element of magic appeared, it already had the form of Twilight's cutie mark. Even a thousand years beforehand, Twilight's element of magic kept the same form. This can mean one of two things. One, the element of magic looked into the future and took the form of Twilight's cutie mark ahead of time. Or two, Twilight's cutie mark is an image of the element of magic. I prefer the latter, since her special talent is magic, it would make sense that her cutie mark reflects that. Besides, this does explain why her cutie mark keeps popping up everywhere. If Twilight's cutie mark is just the symbol of magic, then it would appear in the most magical places, which it does. This symbol, whatever it means, wherever it's from, is now the cutie mark of a princess. That princess is what magic itself has been building up for years. Zap to it revealed the episode synopsis for the finale of Season 4, Twilight's Kingdom Parts 1 and 2. And apparently, the other princesses transfer their magical power to Twilight to save Equestria. If Twilight follows the pattern of all the other key scenes, she will see a totally new aspect of her element, magic, through this situation. This is where it all comes together. I don't know about you guys, but three weeks is way too long to wait. 
Well, in the meantime, I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Several weeks ago, I made a video about who is best pony. Today, I'll be talking about who is worst pony. Let me get this out of the way. This is only my opinion. So, to anyone I happen to offend, get over it. Alright, my least favorite pony is... Applejack. And it's not that I don't like her, it's just that she's the bottom of the list. Although, let's be honest, Applejack does have some pretty major flaws. Flaw number one, she's stubborn-minded. AJ is usually very down-to-earth, but if she gets an idea, she takes off with it. Here's some examples from the show. In Apple Buck season, she decides it would be a good idea to help every pony in Ponyville, running off zero sleep. This ends up getting lots of ponies sick and in danger. Although after several talks, she still holds her ground. In the last roundup, Applejack is so determined to get that prize money, she abandons Ponyville and her friends to raise money without even making it clear what she was doing. In Apple Family Reunion, it just gets worse. She goes on and on, trying to make the funnest get-together, and doesn't so much as stop to get the big picture. In Bats, she doesn't even consider Fluttershy's friendly means to stop the Bats, and almost loses Fluttershy altogether. And then, the worst one yet. In Some Pony to Watch Over Me, Applejack gets the idea that Apple Bloom isn't responsible enough, and all of a sudden starts treating her like a baby. She needs to at least think things through before she totally changes her mindset or takes drastic action. Flaw number two. Applejack is totally oblivious. She may be hardworking, but she's hardly observant. Take this scene from Call of the Cutie. I'll let you be. Looks like your friends want to talk to you. Do those two look friendly? At all? In this scene, Applejack already knew how insecure Apple Bloom felt about the party in her non cutie mark. -ness, I guess. Then we have one bad apple. Y'all are letting Babs ride in your golden apple boat? Yeah, we thought she deserved to be the center of attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just super sweet of y'all, making Babs feel so special. You know, after all the heartache she's been having in Manhattan. Is that not the slightest bit suspicious to anyone else? I mean, I don't know, they're sort of deviously smiling. <sighs> the third flaw, Applejack is the least developed character. Has Applejack even developed in any of her flaws? If anything, her stubbornness has gotten worse. Now she has learned some good lessons about honesty and such, but that's about it. Number four, apples. Just look at this clip from testing one, two, three. Well, I think we should just go back to old fashioned studying. What about our play? Just look at these costumes. Surely something resonates with your inner Wonderbolt. And Granny Smith discovered the first Granny Smith in Philadelphia when she was just a Philly. I mean, I know apples are her life and all, but random apple facts aren't gonna help Rainbow Dash learn about the Wonderbolts. Yeah, I'm definitely being hard on Applejack. She does have redeeming qualities. One thing I absolutely love about her is how well she gets along with her family and friends. Even after a small fight, they're able to quickly make up. She's definitely the most dependable of the six as well. I want to hear what you guys have to say about Applejack, whether you agree with me or whether you want to defend her character further. Also, be sure to put your least favorite pony and why in the comments. I reckon I'll see y'all next Wednesday. Bro hoof. On her own, there's not a whole lot to say about Lightning Dust as a character. What makes her interesting is how she relates to Rainbow Dash. Let's compare their characters first. Aside from the fact that they're both excellent flyers, both of these characters are competitive, prideful, and headstrong. What sets Lightning Dust apart is her incline towards being a reckless overachiever. But that's not important in this video. What sets Rainbow Dash apart, wait for it, is her element of loyalty. Throughout the episode, most of the disagreements these two had were due to Rainbow Dash's loyal tendencies. And because their characters are so similar other than that, it really makes Rainbow's loyalty stand out. 
For this reason, Lightning Dust can be seen as a foil to Rainbow Dash. For those of you who don't know, a foil in literature is someone that by striking a contrast, highlights the characteristics of someone else. This is exactly what Lightning Dust does whenever she acts without loyalty. She emphasizes Rainbow Dash's loyalty. Something tells me that if Rainbow Dash didn't have this quality, she'd share the same tragic fate with Lightning. If you put yourself in Rainbow Dash's hoofs, she was ready to give up a whole lot in this episode. Her entire life, she strived to be a Wonderbolt, and in this episode, she was forced to choose. Friends? Or future? This conflict is not unlike the central conflict in the High School Musical trilogy, where Troy constantly has to choose between getting his name out to big colleges or spending time with his friends in his final years of high school. In both stories, there are forces on both sides pushing the character to making a decision. Of course, in both instances, they never had to choose and achieved both sides in a happy ending. But real life will drive you to make decisions where you have to pick one side or another, making a huge sacrifice both ways. These guys just got lucky. I cannot believe I just made that comparison. Well, as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the matter in the comments below. I'll be seeing you all next Wednesday. Bro hoof. The introduction of a seemingly harmless creature that makes purr-like sounds, brought from one world to another, only to start reproducing rapidly beyond control. Now, where have I heard that before? In Season 2, Episode 15, no, not of My Little Pony, of Star Trek The Original Series, in an episode entitled The Trouble with Tribbles, a situation similar to the Paris Brights occurs. Of course, this episode aired 40 years before the Paris Brights. The storylines are practically identical. In a short summary of both episodes, a girl in an area outside their normal habitat comes across a cute creature and must have it due to its adorableness. The creature is then brought back to their habitat, where it starts reproducing. But by the time they realize their mistake, it's too late. Curiously enough, both crews solve their problem in relatively the same way. Not by ending it, but by passing the trouble to someone else. In Star Trek, they beam the Tribbles from the Enterprise to the Klingon ship. Although this scene was funny, we learn later that this action pretty much started a war between the Klingons and Starfleet. In the Swarm of the Century, their first attempt to oust the Paris Brights, which didn't work, only relocated them in a giant ball. Which is why near the end of the episode, I think Rainbow Dash indirectly reveals the results of that method. What happened to the princess? Emergency in Philadelphia. Some sort of infestation. Good thinking. Not really. Overall, these two incidences could have been handled a lot better, especially Twilight. She could have solved that problem so much more responsibly, instead of making an even bigger mess in Philadelphia for Celestia to clean up. Twilight didn't even tell her the truth of what really happened, although her responsibility does improve drastically throughout the season, so that problem is solved. Searching around the internet, I found a few others that drew this connection, including this gem from Friendship is Witchcraft, where they directly allude to the Tribbles. I'm sorry to have to put you through so much Tribble. My question is, is this episode of My Little Pony a direct reference to Star Trek, or a knockoff of Star Trek? Tell me what you guys think in the comments. Yeah, maybe changing into a Paris Bright wasn't such a great idea. But how was I supposed to know for sure that I'm truly still friends with one of the most important ponies around? I'm not more... By seeing if you would go to the ends of Equestria, for me, of course. Which you did, literally. Congratulations, Twilight, you passed my friendship test. <laughs> but when I say that it is a sign of our true friendship, I am telling the truth. Can we just appreciate this foreshadowing for a moment? That was pretty genius, and so was this episode, for the most part. <laughs> Twilight's Kingdom put an interesting spin on Discord's character. First, I want to point out that Discord's relapse into villainry wasn't just evil resurfacing after two seasons. No interesting villain is evil just for the sake of being evil. 
They have to have motive. Of course, the motive in this episode was freedom. Freedom. We haven't really seen hints of Discord being held back from his desires since his reformation, but scenes like this only confirm that freedom is something he misses from his old life. Why don't you go and have a little fun? I won't stand in your way. <laughs> Literally being the spirit of chaos, it's only in his nature to wreak havoc, something Discord is no longer allowed to do. It's really no wonder Tirak didn't have trouble convincing Discord to give up his friendship. This need for freedom is just gonna build up until the dam breaks and he falls back into evil again. It was also good to see some of the relationship between Fluttercord and Dishai. I mean, if the fact that they write letters to each other isn't cute enough, this scene was just, I admit it, adorable. Oh, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for my friends. Just between the two of us, it's mostly for Fluttershy. Fluttershy? But later, their special bond made this part nothing short of hard to watch. Wait a second, does this whole betrayal business mean that Fluttershy was wrong in being trusting to Discord? Not at all. If it weren't for the benefit of the doubt Fluttershy had given Discord, he never would have experienced true friendship. I don't think anyone can say any of these ponies displayed friendship in quite the same way Fluttershy does in relation to Discord. While this episode did wonders to develop the characters of Twilight, Discord, and Fluttershy, I do have some complaints. Number one, I thought Twilight had already adjusted to her role as a princess by the end of Equestria Girls, but they unnecessarily dragged this plot element through 26 more episodes. It all seemed rather old hat to me. Number two, didn't we just have an episode about the sentimental value of otherwise useless objects? And now here's six sentimental objects being lost forever. Fluttershy's only physical memory of the Breezies, gone. Pinky's treasured gift from a close friend, gone. The symbol of friendship between Twilight Sparkle and Discord, lost forever. Not to mention, oh, I don't know. Twilight's house? All the times and memories spent in this nice, natural treehouse gone. Just like that, and replaced with this monstrosity. I'm sure Hasbro's already manufactured the Twilight's Kingdom playset, complete with the six rainbow-powered ponies. <sighs> A marketing ploy worse than Equestria Girls, if you ask me. Maybe it's just four seasons of nostalgia talking, but if they don't re-treehouseify her kingdom in season five? I don't know guys, I just might lose it. Well, maybe not, but really, let's have a moment of silence for Twilight's old library. No, seriously, it's not just me. There's an entire Facebook page dedicated to this. Number three. Ugh, you're giving me nightmares. What is that? Really? Yeah, I feel like that awkward shot could have been avoided pretty easily. But those are my only real problems with the two-parter. Other than that, it was a pretty fantastic finale to season four. Wait, wasn't this video supposed to be about Discord? Oh yeah, I was talking about the problem with Discord wanting more freedom. What do you guys think would be a good solution to this? Preferably one that doesn't end up like this. Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you all next Wednesday. Bro -hoof. After watching the finale of season four, I noticed something very interesting about how magic relates to cutie marks. So lots of people, including me, were intrigued by the fact that if one's magic is stolen, their cutie mark is taken with it. Since the cutie mark is a representation of that pony's destiny, this shows that destiny can be stolen in the same way it can be reassigned to someone else. While a lack of this magic can make their cutie mark just disappear, I think an excess of this magic makes the cutie mark even more evident. Here's an example. With this extra magic flowing through them, notice how all of these ponies have smaller versions of their cutie marks all throughout their bodies. I think that's the extra magic magnifying their destiny and therefore cutie mark. Another thing Season 4 showed us more of is that not only can magic be stolen or swapped, it can also be possessed. Let me explain. These two ponies both have a rather odd experience with magic. 
In Magic Duel, the Alicorn Amulet corrupted Trixie and bloated her small desire to get back in Twilight into a full-out battle. She lost all control to the amulet and became subject to its ways. Rarity shared a similar experience when she recited the Inspiration Manifestation spell. Her small desire to bedazzle Ponyville was amplified into this huge sparkly mess. Along with these similarities, also notice how their magic color changes, and eye color also plays a role in a pony's magic. This connection is not as consistent, but it's definitely intriguing because it explains why the eyes of most ponies go dull after their magic is extracted. Scenes like this help us to see more of the nature of magic in Equestria, because now we know that the horn isn't the only magic containing part of the pony anatomy. After all, T-Rex did steal magic from Pegasi and Earth ponies, so magic is a force that resides in all ponies across Equestria. While many aspects of magic, destiny, and such are still unknown, Season 4 has provided us with a new way to look at just how fluid this force we call magic really is. If you guys have anything to add, or even contradict, please leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. bro -hoo. Throughout the course of Season 4, several new faces were introduced in the show. Many of these you could easily forget after one day, but for the others, you couldn't if you tried. So here's a list of the five most memorable characters of Season 4. Number 5, Claude the Puppeteer from Inspiration Manifestation. And yes, his name is Claude. His heavy set body type definitely complements his huffy attitude. The irony of his character is that while his job is to make kids laugh and smile, he has the opposite effect of other ponies outside the puppet stand. His intolerance of the stand Rarity put hours of effort into made him all the more hateable. Even scarier than Claude is his puppets. Ugh. Number 4, T-Rex from Twilight's Kingdom. As far as character goes, T-Rex doesn't have a whole lot to offer. However, line him up with any other villain and he's definitely the most threatening villain we've had to date. So much more was at stake when he tried to take over, even more than Eternal Night, Eternal Chaos, or even Slavery. At one point, he contained the magic of every pony in Equestria. All of that, plus the fact that his character design seems to have a satanic influence, definitely make t a very memorable villain. More so than Sombra, at least. Number 3, Goldie Delicious from Pinky Apple Pie. Goldie is actually the character I relate to the most. And not just because I have a horribly messy room, although that's also true. I sort of share Goldie's obsession with cats, and I can see myself becoming the crazy old cat person living in the middle of nowhere, munching around on overdue gingerbread houses? Well, maybe not that part, but in all reality, Goldie was definitely a very charming pony. I've always noticed that the most lovable ponies are usually the ones that are weird. Ow. Number 2. Now who could forget Cheese Sandwich? A pony so funny, he even rivals Pinkie Pie, which is quite an accomplishment. His crazy off-the-wall mannerisms might even surpass hers. Also funny is Cheese's western Clint Eastwood side, when he's not busy being a wild party animal. The most memorable character of Season 4 is... Number 1, Mod Pie, from Mod Pie. Doesn't she just look so happy to be in first place? I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't show my enthusiasm for things quite in the same way my sister does. Mod Pie is hooves down the most memorable character perhaps in the whole series. Her unchanging deadpan expression is more than hilarious, and it's fun to see how one who conveys no emotion can still show love and devotion to family. Mod's character and design are so bland and paradoxically interesting at the same time, making that episode the most humorous episode in season 4, in my own opinion. Honorable Mentions, Maniac, Seabreeze, Boneless, Boneless 2, and Boulder. Who else do you think should be on the list? Let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. bro -hoo. Many cutie marks are pretty straightforward. Celestia's talent is raising the sun, Luna's talent is raising the moon. However, other cutie marks are a little more cryptic. Now let me clarify what a cutie mark actually is. Yes, it is linked to a pony's destiny, but I think the cutie mark is more than that. 
I see cutie marks as pictorial representations of a pony's character. Sometimes this picture is literal, but for the most part they hold symbolic meanings. Let's look at Pinkie Pie for an example. Sure, balloons are part of her job as a party planner, but what else do balloons represent? Lightheartedness, joy, fun, things that describe Pinkie Pie to the point. On a more visual level, both Pinkie and Balloon seem to deflate after they've been hurt. I believe the same can be said of Fluttershy. She's pretty great at handling a whole ton of creatures. Butterflies are only a small fraction of those. But if you look at what butterflies represent, fragility, gentleness, you can see Fluttershy's character. Same with Rarity. Jewels are only a portion of her skills. But like Rarity, jewels show beauty, purity, and are also quite fashionable. Now let's look at Twilight and Shining Armors, since they seem to have some sort of connection. First, as I've stated in many videos, Twilight's cutie mark represents her friendship with the other five, where she's the star in the middle. Now, Shining Armors is interesting. We see the same star being guarded by a shield. But why would his cutie mark have Twilight's symbol on a shield if he wasn't meant to protect Twilight? If anything, you'd think he'd be more focused on protecting this princess which he has done faithfully, as a knight in shining armor should. Maybe protecting Twilight is a job yet to come for good old Shining. For a more literal translation, the shield represents how he's captain of the royal guard, and those blue five-pointed stars can be seen on the front plate of any member of the royal guard, representing how he's their leader. We can use this cutie mark translating skill to learn more about the characters of other ponies as well. For example, Silver Spoons comes from the saying, born with a silver spoon in her mouth which shows that she's been spoiled from birth. Diamond tiaras I find more interesting. Tiaras aren't just a sign of wealth and class, but also a sign of power. She does, after all, have every pony in her class wrapped around her hoofs, but maybe she'd be a good leader, too. I would like to see her eventually become mayor. Besides, she has already been seen in leadership positions. Even my own cutie mark has a cryptic meaning. It's a 16th note, which would indicate that I have a passion for music. But more specifically, it's an 8-bit music note. It looks more electronic. Electronic music is something I love to listen to and compose. <laughs> to top it off, derpy. Bubbles are pretty fun. And sort of hollow, if you know what I mean. There are so many more ponies with symbolic cutie marks that I can't cover them all in one video. So definitely be expecting a second part to this in the near future. Once I post that, I'll put a link here. This is the Brony Notion signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Cutie marks can be split into two different categories, single cutie marks and triple cutie marks. But why three of all numbers? Friends. Triple cutie marks are probably the most common of the two. I mean, look at the main six. Four of their cutie marks are three smaller pictures, but what's the significance of the number three? Last week, I talked about Shining Armor's cutie mark, pointing out that the stars represented a member of the Royal Guard. In the comments, you guys suggested that, along with that, these stars represent the three princesses, since Twilight was already taken care of. This would signify Shining Armor's loyalty to the princesses and his job of protecting them. You guys also threw around the possibility of the three representing the other three members of his family. Let's try this theory out on, say, Applejack. Applejack seems to be the head of the farm and the family, so it would make sense how she's the only one in the family to have a triple cutie mark. But what about ponies like Fluttershy, who seem to live by themselves? Remember that just because a pony doesn't have three family members living with her, doesn't mean that pony won't have a family in the future. Cutie marks are, after all, for an entire lifetime. They aren't necessarily fulfilled right away. But where else have I heard the number three? Oh yeah, the three tribes. Earth Pony, Unicorn, and Pegasus. Maybe there's a connection here too. But none of these theories are really set in stone. I want to hear what you guys have to say about this. Leave your thoughts on the matter in the comments. This is the Bernie Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. What's black and blue, has four legs, and more holes than Swiss cheese? Queen Chrysalis. And of all the villains, she had the best reason to invade Equestria. Friends. Let's look at the motives of the other villains compared to Chrysalis. 
Nightmare Moon was driven by jealousy. Discord was driven by his desire to stir chaos. Sombra, well, we don't really know, but we can safely assume he was driven by selfish motives. T-Rex also wanted power. Then we look at Queen Chrysalis. She had an entire kingdom to feed. It's sort of her job as a ruler to do what she did. And being the parasites that they are, there wasn't really a more peaceful way to take over and feed off their love. Makes me wonder what other choices Chrysalis really had. Now, I'm not saying I'm on her side, although that might be true, but I'm not really fond of how the problem was solved. Sure, the changelings were threatening Equestria and the safety of everyone, but it's a real shame the only solution was blasting them away. In this day aria, Chrysalis, in the form of Cadence, seems very haughty and eager to rule Equestria, which would imply that she has selfish motives along with the rest. But then you get lines like this. No, I do not love the groom in my heart. There is no room. It brings a totally different implication. It sounds like her priority is elsewhere, on her kingdom, so she doesn't have any room to sincerely love Shining Armor. So this means if Chrysalis was absorbing Shining Armor's love for Cadence, she must not have been storing it in her heart. I think when they feed on love, the love literally empowers their body's functions. A lack of this love would mean death. In the future, I want an episode where the Changelings return, but this time, the ponies realize that not giving them love would be letting them starve to death. From there, they could find a way to live off each other peacefully, in a compromise similar to the one in Over a Barrel, where they find a middle ground. What a strong lesson in friendship this could provide. But how could the show reintroduce the changelings? Possibly through another invasion. Or here's a better idea. At the end of the sixth episode of the sixth season of Doctor Who, The Almost People, we find out that Amy Pond, the Doctor's companion, was really just a doppelganger for the past season or so. Who knows how long. The original Amy had kept all the memories the doppelganger made. You see where I'm going with this? If any of Hasbro's story developers happen to see this video, make it happen. I mean, how cool would it be to find out that one of our loved ponies wasn't actually there and an invasion was about to occur? Awesome. So let me know what you think about this story idea in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Although this is the second part to my Analyzing Cutie Marks video, it doesn't matter what order you watch them in. So here's analyzing more cutie marks. Friends. Number 1, Rainbow Dash. Her cutie mark is a rainbow lightning bolt, well, sort of rainbow, coming through a cloud. I think this represents two things. First, it represents her local job of clearing the sky of clouds. And second, the lightning shows her future as a Wonderbolt, since the Wonderbolts do have a similar looking bolt in their insignia. The fact that the bolt is a rainbow portrays her signature move, the Sonic Rain Boom, which was also how she got her cutie mark in the first place. Number 2, Snips and Snails. As I've mentioned in a previous video, snails are notorious for being slow, and this pony isn't exactly the fastest thinker in the group. I'm not sure why his cutie mark would highlight that aspect of his character though. I'm sure there's a whole lot more to snails that's more important than that. Then for snips, we have a pair of scissors. Scissors? Uh, I got nothing. Not much to work with here, unless his talent is using actual scissors. I think their names reveal more of their characters than their cutie marks do. How? There's a nursery rhyme from the 19th century that goes like this. What are little boys made of? Snips and snails and puppy dog tails. That's what little boys are made of. So I guess you could say these two are supposed to portray little boys. Running around, getting into trouble, overall very mischievous. Yeah, I suppose it definitely fits the stereotype. Number 3, Flim and Flam. Notice that their cutie marks complete each other. Even their names go together, which of course reflects how they do everything as a team. In both of their appearances in the show, they've been advertising and selling Apple products, as their cutie marks would imply. No, like literal apples. But nowhere on their cutie marks is false advertising and deceitful marketing even hinted at. I'd say there's hope for the Flam Flam Bros after all. Maybe someday they'll assume a more respectable way to earn money. Then again, if you look up the word Flim Flam in the dictionary, it describes their current job. Dishonest behavior to make a profit. Yeah, maybe that's just what they're good at. My question is, why do they sell apples if they work in pairs? <laughs> no. Number 4. Princess Celestia and Princess Luna. In my previous Analyzing Cutie Marks video, I said their cutie marks are straightforward. Celestia raises the sun, Luna raises the moon. 
But taking a closer look, I'd say their marks have a symbolic meaning as well. The sun is very open and sociable. It covers everyone at once, just like how Celestia's job is to govern all of Equestria. The moon is much more personal and even secretive. In the same way, Luna's main role is with individual ponies in their dreams, helping them through their inner conflicts. This difference is probably part of what fueled the jealousy that corrupted Luna. Speaking of Luna's cutie mark, when it disappeared in the season 4 finale, the dark blotches were still there. I always thought that was part of her cutie mark. I'm sure there's an interesting story behind how that appeared. Number 5, Zakora. I don't think this is even a cutie mark. Here's why. Throughout all of Friendship is Magic, we haven't seen one character with a cutie mark that wasn't a pony. Even close relatives to ponies, the donkeys and mules, are bereft of cutie marks. This would lead me to believe that this mark is more of a tattoo from possibly a tribal tradition. But why only ponies? What is it about ponies that make cutie marks appear on them and not other beings? Doesn't destiny affect them the same way? If you guys have any idea as to why this is, please leave it in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof! Today we're going to find out once and for all, of the main six, who has the best pet? The contestants are Owlicious, Opalescence, Gummy, Winona, Angel, and Tank. May the best pet win! I'll count down the six pets from my least favorite to my favorite. Number six. My least favorite pet happens to be Winona. I know, Applejack fans already hate me enough. It's nothing against Applejack, I just don't find dogs very interesting. Winona's cute and all, but like most dogs, she's pretty predictable. Although, like any good dog, she is a huge help to Applejack, so she's no doubt the most practical of the six pets. Number five, Gummy. No, I don't hate Gummy. I love Gummy, just the aspect of an alligator without teeth is hilarious. Huh, toothless. Could have sworn you had <laughs> teeth. Gummy is definitely the most unique pet. However, when he's not chewing on balloons or breaking the fourth wall, he's sort of boring. He's just kind of there with his empty expression. Number four, Tank. Tank has the best backstory. From his first episode, he's been the most faithful of any of the other pets. He's been shown to be determined, enough to even make the effort of racing against flying birds. Tank helped to teach us that good character trumps physical ability and importance. And his speed isn't even a problem now that he has that helicopter thing. I can't think of anything negative to say about him. The only reason he's number 4 is because I like 3 through 1 even more. Number 3, Owlicious. Owlicious. Ah, uh, never mind. Like Tank, Owlicious wasn't always in the show. He appeared in the season 1 episode, Owl's Well That Ends Well. Being an owl, it's no surprise that he's the wisest of the six pets. Dude, that's creepy. In Inspiration Manifestation, Owlicious seems to know that Rarity's spell would wind up to no good. For an owl, he has some pretty funny expressions. Plus the who jokes never get old for me, even though it's overused. Number two, Opalescence. Ah uh, yes, the most fabulous of the six pets. So much sass. She did make a pretty good Luna in Fluttershy's play. What I love about Opal the most is how cat-like she is, since she is, of course, a cat, I guess. All of her cute mannerisms line up perfectly with real-life cats, and somehow she still has as much of a fashion sense as Rarity. She's elegant-ish, graceful-ish, and adorable. Number one, Boulder from Mod Pie. It's a rock. His name is Boulder. Just kidding. Number one, for real this time, Angel Bunny. Oh, the irony of his name. Fluttershy might as well own a perfectly well-behaved rabbit named Satan. How could you not love Angel, though? He may be a bratty jerk and spoiled beyond hope, but when Fluttershy's ever offended, he's always there. I think Angel has so much more character than the other five pets, maybe even combined. Yeah, I'm glad that scene was a dream. What do you guys think about my list? This is all just my opinion. I want to hear yours. Go ahead and leave it in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof. Two weeks ago, I pointed out that ponies are the only beings in Equestria that have cutie marks. I was a little confused as to why this was, but I think I got it now. The fact that ponies have cutie marks isn't the only thing that sets them apart. I mean, all other beings in Equestria are somewhat realistically colored. Then we have ponies, which are anything but. The reason why? Magic. 
It's magic! Well, we already know that magic and cutie marks are connected. When T-Rex stole magic from ponies, they lost their cutie marks. So somehow, it requires magic for cutie marks to appear. As I recently noted, all three tribes of ponies have magic, displayed by the fact that T-Rex stole magic from all three types. In conclusion, all beings with magic can have cutie marks. Wait, we already have an exception. Discord. Discord is chock full of magic, yet he has no cutie mark. This could mean one of two things. Number one, Discord used to be a pony. <coughs> Stars were all the bearded. Or two, he didn't obtain his magic through natural means. After all, T-Rex never got a cutie mark, even after stealing all that magic. This would imply that all ponies are naturally born with magic, the cutie mark just appears later, when a pony realizes their destiny. Although Discord is always the wild card, the same rules never apply to him. He just doesn't make sense. Make sense? Oh, what fun is there in making sense? Discord! Let's look at another exception. Zakora. Two weeks ago, I assumed Zakora's mark wasn't a true cutie mark, probably a tribal tattoo of sort. But the argument has been made that Zakora is magical along with the rest. She does seem to know a lot about magic, even to the extent of training Twilight in Magic Duel. But she's probably just limited to knowledge about magic, but not actually having magic herself. What do you guys think? Does this explain why only ponies have cutie marks? And if so, how do you explain Discord or Zakora? Please leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof! Of all the mythological beasts in Friendship is Magic, I find the creature in the Fire Geyser Swamp the most interesting. Why? I think it was created by Discord. Friends. A chimera in Greek mythology is a fire-breathing monster with the head of a lion, a snake for a tail, and a goat's head rising out of its back. In My Little Pony, it doesn't breathe fire, and the goat's head is right next to the lion's head. In mythology, this monster is a sibling to Severus, both born of the mother of all monsters, Echidna. But in Friendship is Magic, I don't think these creatures were born, but rather created by Discord. He is the king of genetic chaos. It would be no surprise if he created these beings at some point in Equestria's history. Of course, Greek mythology is alluded to frequently in the show. I mean, even dragons, unicorns, and pegasi are from Greek mythology. Besides those, there's also griffins, a manticore, a hydra, a cockatrice, a minotaur, an orthrus, and a centaur, all from Greek mythology. Possibly discords behind some of it. What originally gave me the idea was this part. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, you don't have to worry about anything anymore. Because we're going to have our apple pie with a side of Billy Filet. <laughs> Don't Look at the animation used for the snake's eyes. It's the same animation used in The Return of Harmony, when Discord hypnotizes the ponies. If Discord didn't create them, he most likely hypnotized them at some point. Or the animators just got lazy and used the same animation. Another thing I found strange was the Chimera's environment. The Flame Geyser Swamp showed us a more hostile side of the fair land of Equestria. Until then, the most dangerous place was the Everfree Forest. This place was pretty downright dangerous. We got the quicksand, the flame spurts, now all we need are the R.O.U.S.'s. What about the R.O.U.S.'s? Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. <laughs> anyway, back to mythology. Some themes in My Little Pony resemble Greek themes as well. Sending people to Tataris is one thing common in both worlds. Also, one part in the episode, Sonic Rainboom, closely resembles the story of Icarus, where Icarus flies too close to the sun and melts his wax wings. Plus, there's the phoenix, the constellations, and the messenger pony with winged shoes, a reference to Hermes. And finally, the first time we see Iron Will, he's in a labyrinth, another direct reference to Greek mythology. But why all these references? Is it possible that alicorns are Greek gods and ponies are demigods? Hmm, Celestia would be Apollo, Luna would be Artemis, Cadence would be Aphrodite, Discord would be Eris. I think I'm onto something here. Maybe this is why only ponies have magic, because they're the demigods. All the other animals are just mortals. This also explains why Discord is the only non-pony that has magic, because he's also one of the gods. If this connection is true, it definitely answers some of the questions I've been asking recently. What do you guys think? Because this has some pretty interesting implications. Also, please leave any references I left out in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof! Snips, we have a pair of scissors. Scissors? Uh.
I got nothing. Not much to work with here, unless his talent is using actual scissors. I figured it out, guys, and it comes with a pretty neat backstory. <laughs> Alright, so for a while, I just assumed that Snip's cutie mark was only a pair of scissors so it would match his name. But, it all makes sense now. And no, using scissors is not his special talent. First, let's start off with his body type. Snip's is pretty stout, with a pudgy face. And in all of Milpfim, we've only seen one other pony who has a similar shape. And that's Claude the Puppeteer from Inspiration Manifestation. Plenty of room for my puppets! I, along with some others, think Claude is Snip's father. Besides the fact that they have similar appearances, let's look at their cutie marks. We already seem to have a story going on here. Possibly at some point, Snip sabotaged one of Claude's shows by cutting the strings. Like how Sweetie Belle sabotaged Rarity's costume in For Whom the Sweetie Belle Tolls. Maybe Snips was mad about something. This may very well be why Claude doesn't even use strings in his current shows. If this is the case, then why would Snips' cutie mark highlight this story? Why would a mistake like this be significant? Well, let's look at this metaphorically. Marionette strings have always been symbols of control, because the puppet only follows the will of the puppeteer. Under this lens, scissors are a strong symbol of breaking free from control. Possibly someday he'll put a stop to some sort of corruption. It's all very vague, but interesting to think about at the same time. Or maybe I'm thinking too deeply about a show for little girls. Whoa, I think I just summed up my channel in 10 words. Speaking of my channel, a lot of cool stuff has been happening lately. Last week's remix got featured on Equestria Daily. Twice. Twice? My channel hit 3,000 subscribers. Just let that sink in. That's pretty awesome, but that means I have to sing Winter Wrap Up. It's tradition. 3,000 is a special number. DJ Brony was the first by literally doing a Winter Wrap Up for his first 3,000 subscribers. Brony Curious caught on to the spirit by singing Winter Wrap Up when he reached 3,000 subs. Now it is up to me to turn this into an official tradition. Let's get this over with. Winter wrap up, winter wrap up. Let's finish our holiday cheer. Winter wrap up, winter wrap up. Cause tomorrow spring is here. Cause tomorrow spring is here. Whew. Anyway, thank you guys so much for 3,000 subscribers. And also thanks to this awesome commenter for giving me the idea of Snip sabotaging one of Claude's shows. Tell me what you think about this theory in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoo. It's been made clear that magic in Equestria doesn't work the same way as magic in the human world. For example, in Equestria, this crown does nothing unless it's being worn by Twilight and activated along with the other elements of Harmony. In the human world, put it on and you turn into a demon. A demon. I turned into a raging she-demon. But what is it that makes the worlds different? <laughs> Who raises the sun and the moon in the human world? Probably not Principal Celestia and Vice Principal Luna. Those things happen on their own in the human world. But that doesn't mean magic isn't possible, as we've seen. It's just more rare. But it is weird how simply putting on the crown with negative intentions can be so powerful. Plus, the main six didn't even need the other five elements of harmony to shoot their rainbow death beam of friendship. They only needed the element of magic. This is probably because, while human Pinky can still have laughter and human Fluttershy can still have kindness, Humans can't have magic in the same way an alicorn like Twilight can. My magic? It isn't working! Makes sense. You don't exactly have your horn. What?! I think that the main reason magic is so different in the human world is because it's not necessary. That world works fine without it. And with magic, it's just overkill. So overkill, it turns humans into anthro ponies. Magically speaking, the one thing in common in both worlds is the magic of friendship. Another mystery from Equestria Girls is the original human Twilight. Do you have a twin sister who lives in the city? Has a pet dog named Spike that looks just like that one? Uh, maybe? Thought so. If any of the other main six went through the mirror, they would have encountered their clones almost immediately. But not Twilight. Why aren't the human five already friends with the original Twilight? Well, let's review why they're so close in the pony world. Twilight was assigned to be the official organizer of the Summer Sun Celebration. In preparation, she meets five friends whose personalities align perfectly with the elements of harmony. Together they go on an adventure to unlock the Elements of Harmony so that they could prevent Eternal Night. Obviously, Destiny brought them to that moment, and since the Elements of Harmony probably don't exist in the human world, there is no reason for Destiny to bring the human main six together, which is probably why the five didn't even recognize Twilight. And as for the original Sunset Shimmer, well, we don't really know enough about her life before the mirror to make judgments on where she would be in the human world. 
And the final mystery from Equestria Girls. Why do dragons become dogs of all creatures? Spike was about the same size as a dog, but what if the dragon from Dragonshy went through the mirror? There aren't dogs that big. Oh. So that's where he went after he moved. What do you guys think about these theories? Except for maybe the last one. Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro who? Hello and welcome to episode 1 of Dear Princess Celestia, the series where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, Super Speedy Cider Squeezy 6000. <laughs> Dear Princess Celestia, Let's recap the events of this story. The Apple family is selling cider. Everyone becomes angry when the cider supplies run out. The Flim and Flam brothers arrive with a promising solution to the cider shortage. And that's the super speedy cider squeezy 6000. However, when the family decides not to team up with the twins, the brothers threaten to run the apples out of business. They make a deal that whoever produces the most cider in one hour wins the exclusive right to sell cider in Ponyville. In the competition, the Flim Flam brothers are in the lead until the main six start helping. In a desperate attempt to regain first place, the Flim Flam brothers double their power and turn off quality control. Although they win, their cider tastes too awful to buy. Because of this, Flim and Flam leave, and Sweet Apple Acres is safe. The moral of the story? Always choose quality over quantity. Even if it takes time, it's worth it. What's really cool about this episode is that it doesn't put down machine-made products. At first, Granny Smith was skeptical, but once she actually tried the cider made by the Super Speedy Cider Squeezy 6000, it was just as good as the homemade cider, although she didn't want to admit it. In real life, companies like to promote their products that are handmade, because it's more impressive, but sometimes machine-made products are even better, or at least more precise. We can look at this through the lens of the project management triangle. There's three types of service, good quality service, fast service, and cheap service, but you can only have two. 99% of the time, if you have good quality, fast service, it won't be cheap. If you have cheap and fast service, it won't be good quality. If you have good quality and cheap service, then it's not going to be fast. Now remember that both sides in the competition had good quality cider. Here's the difference. Flim and Flam were faster cider providers. And the diagram matches up, because we know they would have charged a ton. On the other hand, the Apple family was the other way around. We all know that their prices are always going to be honest, but just ask Rainbow Dash. They were pretty slow. Here's the real life application. If you have to choose two of the three types of services, make sure one of them is good quality. Here's also some other possible morals we can take from the episode. Know how to deal with insults and challenges. A lot was at stake during this competition, and the competition could have been avoided if Granny Smith had kept her cool and not overreacted when she was called a chicken. Oh, easy! What's the matter, Granny Smith? Chicken? What did you call me, Sonny? Although without the competition, they still would have been in trouble, just not as extremely. Then of course there's friendship. Without the friends helping, they never would have had a chance in the competition. And the most important moral of all, don't get between ponies and their cider. Really, they take that stuff way too seriously. Alright guys, heads up, I'm going on vacation for the next week, so there won't be a video on Wednesday the 20th. But don't worry, I'll pick back up Wednesday the 27th. What do you think about the Dear Princess Celestia series, or this episode's moral? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Brohoof. Stars will aid in her escape. Now what's that supposed to mean? Friends. Some have speculated that the stars were actually a third sister who felt sorry for Luna and bailed her out. You would have the Princess of the Sun, the Princess of the Moon, and the Princess of the Stars. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence to support a third. It's always just two. The Castle of the Two Sisters, the Journal of the Two Sisters, so on and so forth. Maybe the sisters had a long-lost father who went to play his role in the stars, but there's a more likely explanation. To find out what happened, let's look at the history of the Elements of Harmony, which is what banished Nightmare Moon in the first place. So the first recorded use of the Elements of Harmony was on Discord. Next, it was Nightmare Moon. We know Nightmare Moon came after because Luna was there to banish Discord. A thousand years later, they're used on Nightmare Moon again, but this time by the main six. Next was Discord getting turned back into stone. And finally, the Elements of Harmony were used to release him from stone. <laughs> In both of the times they used it before the main six, the magic only lasted a thousand years. I think that when Discord started awaking in the Return of Harmony, it wasn't because of the chaos from the field trip. 
he was going to awake from his prison any day. The chaos from the Cutie Mark Crusaders was just the final straw. Why would I think that? I think that the spells cast by the Elements of Harmony wear off after around a thousand years. This would explain why both Discord and Nightmare Moon returned after relatively the same amount of time, a thousand years. The stars that we saw were probably just the magic necessary to undo the spell that had imprisoned her for millennia. Now let's talk about the specifics of the prophecy. It would be on the longest day of the thousandth year, the summer solstice. In our world, the long day is due to the tilt of the Earth, but our planet rotates around the sun, while in that world, the sun rotates around their planet. Do you see? But it's the solar system! Oh. So who knows why Celestia decided to make that day longer. But astronomy aside, there's plenty of lore and legend about the longest day of the year. Shakespeare wrote about mysterious fairies that would appear, and there's stories of strange magical events that occur. So maybe it's just a magical day in general, and it took that extra magic boost to get her off the moon, in the same way the chaos activated Discord's release. Wait a second, who even wrote this prophecy? They were pretty accurate, they even got the number of stars right. Were they from the future? Perhaps it was Twilight herself, possibly after some time traveling adventure. What do you guys think? And what about my theory about the elements of harmony? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Guys, I finally ditched the pony generator. Finally done with the dislocated joints and the weird stairs. A huge thanks to Rebecca Doodles for drawing my OC. Links to her deviant art and YouTube are right here. She's an amazing artist. Everyone should go check her out. This is the Brony Notion signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Hello and welcome to episode 2 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, Over a Barrel. Dear Princess Celestia, It's made clear that the buffalo in this episode are modeled after the Native American culture, and the center conflict between the buffalo and the Appalachian settlers is paralleled with the conflict between the Native American tribes and European settlers. Similar to the episode, European settlers claimed lands, resources, and even people from the natives. When the natives fought back, they were seen as unsophisticated savages. savages, savages barely even, humans. even though they had plenty of reasons to be upset. Even in their more peaceful relations, language and cultural barriers made both sides very uneasy. Racism towards natives built up, and they fought a lot, the Europeans taking more and more from them. But enough with the history lesson. Back to ponies. In this story, the Appalachians planted trees over the roaming grounds of the buffalo. Roaming that territory was a very important tradition to them. But keep in mind that apple trees are one of the ponies' only sources of food. Because of this, there was conflict. Both groups had totally valid reasons for owning the land. Rainbow Dash was exposed to Little Strongheart's side, while Applejack was exposed to Brayburn's side, and they of course argued and didn't listen to the other's reason. Even though Brayburn himself and Little Strongheart were willing to discuss the dilemma in peace. That information would be quite helpful. That's weird, because my cousin Brayburn here wants to explain to the buffalo why they should let the apple trees stay. That would be a useful thing to- The land is theirs! And there's the first moral. Be sure to listen to the other's problem and be willing to hear possible solutions. When Twilight tried to talk sense into any Appolution, she was rejected pretty much every time. The entire battle could have been avoided if they had simply talked it through. The second point is to be understanding. You can never judge a pony until you trotted a mile on their hoofs. Once Rainbow had heard the buffalo's side, she didn't even consider the fact that the Appalachians live off the orchard, and without it, ponies would have to move. In the same way, Applejack didn't honor their tradition that goes back generations. Both counted the other side's reasoning as irrelevant. Now, in the real world, understanding the other side was a huge problem. The two cultures were so different, even their ideas of ownership and property had little in common. The ponies, however, really had no excuse. In fact, the peaceful solution was painfully obvious. I think bits like Pinky's song angering everyone were just there to speed up the plot. Speaking of Pinky's song, our third moral is, you guessed it, gotta share, gotta care. If two groups can't agree, find a middle ground so that no one loses. Even though this was the main moral of the story, I find the first two much more relevant to the situation. Number four, you can't forget the go-to moral for every episode. Friendship is magic. The compromise encouraged peace, but friendship is what ensured it. And what else am I missing? Of course, never sing bad musical numbers. Those have been known to start wars. What do you guys think about this episode's moral? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Bernie Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoo. Discord doesn't have a cutie mark. As I pointed out in a previous video, only ponies and arguably Zakora have cutie marks.
But if Discord had a cutie mark, what would it look like? Let's briefly define what a cutie mark is. A cutie mark is an image that appears on a pony when he or she discovers his or her special talent. It can also be symbolic or even prophetic of a time yet to come for that pony. In Season 4, Episode 25, this happened. The centaur of attention himself, Lord Tyrek, was sneaking up on a pony in some dark, ominous alley. This pony turned his head, and lo and behold, it was actually Discord performing another one of his unexpected hijinks. Many speculate that this is the pony form of Discord, and if he had a cutie mark, it would be that tornado. Tornadoes, of course, are known for chaos, destructive chaos, which would have been a great representation of his character. However, a lot has happened since the episode Keep Calm and Flutter On. Ever since his reformation, Discord has become so much more than the destructive spirit of chaos. He's embraced friendship now. And besides, that pony in the alley looks a little too bland to be a pony version of Discord. I'd like to believe that the pony form of Discord wears a blue cape, has a long gray beard, and has a wizard hat lined with bells. No reason, just a hunch. Just a hunch! Anyway, back to cutie marks. Maybe his mark could be something chaotic, but not necessarily destructive, such as a cotton candy cloud. Or wait, maybe the question mark could be good itself. With Discord, you never really know what to expect. Now here's where you guys come in. For you graphic designers and artists, throw around some ideas and see what you can put together. Once you've designed Discord's fan-made cutie mark, post links in the comments and I'll shout out the best ones in a future video. I guess sort of like a competition. Feel free to use any of the ideas in this video. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Alright guys, heads up. Now that I'm into my busy school schedule, I'll be doing more of these types of videos. Where I ask a question, you guys respond, and I bring up your responses in a later video. I'll still be doing the every Wednesday gig with a question video like this every two weeks, and a Dear Princess Celestia every other week. Oh yeah, and my subscriber level. It's over 9,000! What 9,000?! I've waited so long to use that clip, you guys don't even know. In fact, it's been a year and seven days since I posted my first video on this channel. I definitely couldn't have made it this far without you guys. Thanks for almost 10,000 subscribers. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. bro -hoo. Hello and welcome to episode 3 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, or episodes in this case, Twilight's Kingdom Parts 1 and 2. Dear Princess Celestia Now this episode is really the grand finale of quite a few things building up, one of which being Twilight's insecurities as a princess. Ever since Magical Mystery Cure, Twilight didn't really understand why she was a princess, or if she was meant to play that role. It was at the end of this two-parter when she finally figured out her worth. But the moral of this story isn't Twilight is special. I think we can learn the most from a certain Draconicus. Discord! As the spirit of chaos, it's only natural that Discord wouldn't want his craziness to be held back. But since he's embraced friendship, he can't let it loose like he used to. In fact, friendship is the only thing stopping this from happening again. When Tyrek offered Discord to join him in taking over Equestria, it was so tempting because Discord needed freedom. He had a big choice to make. He valued friendship, but he needed to be free. I've talked about this before, but now I'm talking about how this conflict could have been avoided. With all that said, Discord was about to blow any day, and sending him to stop someone as manipulative as Tyrek was basically sending a powder keg into a flame. Discord was nowhere near prepared for Tyrek's alluring temptations. Although it would have been dangerous, imagine if Fluttershy had been there. She would have knocked some sense into his head, and the problem would have been solved. So our moral would be, stay accountable. Make sure you have a friend, keeping you from doing something stupid. Unfortunately, Discord did go by himself, and when he let go of friendship and grasped onto freedom, he ended up losing both. So never give up on friendship, it's always gonna be more important. Now here's something that baffles me. All of Equestria was being threatened by this dastardly duo, and when they finally came to the main six, no one even knew Discord had joined T-Rex. The ponies might have been able to escape them if they knew not to trust Discord. Even worse, Twilight, who had been there and knew about this, didn't even give them the slightest warning. Yep, everything's fine. Of course she was full of magic from three other princesses, but why didn't Twilight tell the others her plan? Oh yeah. Taking on this task will be one of the most difficult things I will ever do. But with the help of my friends... I'm sorry, Princess Twilight. But you must keep your new abilities a secret. 
I fear that your friends being aware of your new power could put them at great risk. I'm pretty sure the ponies would have been at risk anyway. And since when has it been a good idea to keep secrets from friends? If the other five did know Twilight's plan, they would have been better prepared for Discord and T-Rex, preventing this from even happening at all. Plus, Twilight's the only one who's been known to struggle with keeping secrets. There's no need to be secretive if you have a problem. Lots of trouble came from this command from Celestia, but they got extremely lucky and it all worked out in the end. Then of course, friendship is magic. Twilight couldn't take T-Rex down by herself. Even with all that Alicorn magic, it still wasn't as strong as the magic of friendship. Of course, you're gonna find this moral in pretty much any episode. What else can you take away from this episode? Let me know any morals that I might have missed. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. I've already talked about best pony, best villain, and best pet, but here's a good one. Who is best princess? This question used to be a lot simpler. We only had two to choose from, Celestia and Luna. It had to be one or the other. But that was before we met Cadence in a Canterlot wedding. The addition of a third at first seemed awkward. You have the sun, the moon, and love? Okay. If three wasn't enough, the finale of season three introduced a fourth alicorn princess, Twilight Sparkle. Now we know that not all princesses are born alicorns. This made the fact that Cadence is an alicorn a lot less awkward. This does bring up the question of whether or not Celestia and Luna were born alicorns, but that's a topic for another video. We're talking about which princess is the best. Now when I say best, I mean personal favorite. For example, my personal favorite pony is Fluttershy, my personal favorite villain is Discord, and my personal favorite ship is Fluttercord. I mean, anyway, instead of telling you guys my favorite princess of the four, you can tell me yours. I'll make it a poll and show the results in my next question video. Leave your favorite princess in the comments and I'll count up the total in around two weeks. In my last question video, I asked you guys, if Discord had a cutie mark, what would it look like? Let's see what you had to say. Tane Lewis and Nanny Stewart both had the idea of his cutie mark being a troll face. Good suggestion. Trolling is what Discord spends the majority of his time doing, but let's see what else we have. Lots of you guys suggested a golden apple, after the golden apple of Discord in Greek mythology. The name definitely fits perfectly. I'd say that would make for a pretty good cutie mark. Also along the lines of symbolism, Cameron Clement and Countless Mary Rose both designed cutie marks with the eight-pointed symbol of chaos. I think these cutie marks demonstrate Discord's all-over-the-place thought process and randomness. The multicolored chaos symbol does a great job at reflecting Discord's sheer unpredictability, and so does Cam's cool cotton candy cloud cutie mark. Try to say that five times fast. Cam's cool cotton candy cloud cutie mark, Shady Cast Kitty Kai also used the chaos symbol but with a twist, showing both sides to Discord's character with friendship and without. Derpy is adorable suggested the four suits of playing cards. That would match lots of his decor both times he took over Equestria. I think it suits him very well. <laughs> now if Discord was at one point Star Swirl the Bearded, his cutie mark would be similar if not the same as Star Swirl's. That's what Lively Liv suggested in her photo, his cutie mark before and after the transformation. I personally love it, although that transformation is theoretical. Rocky Ocean thought a mix hat would be a good cutie mark for him. I agree, you never really know what to expect from Discord. On a similar note, Katie Padilla suggested it would be the Mad Hatter's hat. Also a good idea. Bionicle Sore King 4T2 suggested the letter Q. Q. Ah uh, yes, Q, of course. It took me a while. And finally, perhaps my favorite suggestion, Roar Unit said it would probably be some kind of inconceivable four-dimensional shape that would shatter your mind. If I entered the competition, I would have said his cutie mark would be a picture of himself, with a cutie mark of himself, with a cutie mark of himself, so on and so forth. Thanks for all the great ideas, and don't forget to leave your favorite princess in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Hello and welcome to episode 4 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, The Mysterious Mare Duel. Dear Princess Celestia, This episode is notorious for being the most agreed on least favorite episode of the entire series. I wouldn't go as far as to say that. The moral of the episode was actually really great, but I don't think it was communicated in the most effective way. Well, first of all, the obvious moral from this episode is don't rub it in. 
like Twilight said. Celebrating your accomplishments is natural, but rubbing them in every pony's face is not. Let's face it, watching Rainbow Dash ask for attention was nothing short of painful. She should have remembered from the Trixie incident that being boastful makes everyone like you a lot less. Moral 2 ties right into that. Don't let your accomplishments get to your head. At first, Rainbow Dash was almost humble about her heroic deeds, but as the crowd cheered her on more and more, her ego became more and more important. Most would agree that Rainbow Dash's big ego was way over exaggerated, but just as surprising was the behavior of the other five ponies. I'll explain. Throughout the first part of the episode, the other five ponies talked amongst themselves about how prideful Dash had become. Then they decided it would be a good idea to teach her a lesson by outshining her as a hero. Notice that not once did they actually talk to Rainbow Dash about how they felt. Say what? Maybe if they had discussed it, Rainbow might have seen how ridiculous she was being. And if somehow she kept it up after that, then they could take action. Yes, sometimes learning the hard way is a lot more effective, and in this case, it did work. But Rainbow Dash might have stopped if she was simply told that rubbing in her talents makes her look lame. Here's the moral. Communication. Always start by frankly telling the person their fault. That brings us to moral four. Friendship is magic. Every episode, every episode. There were several disasters that Rainbow Dash just couldn't prevent, but Meriduel, since she was actually five ponies, fixed a myriad of problems, another great representation of friendship. You know, it's funny how all of those disasters happen in such a short amount of time. Some would think that the other five set up the disasters just so that Meriduel could save the day instead of Rainbow Dash. Sounds pretty extreme, but it wouldn't be the first time Twilight's made a problem just for the sake of solving it. What else can you learn from this episode? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Alright, last Saturday I had the opportunity to see Rainbow Rocks in theaters, and there was so much about it that I loved, but I'll save it for another video. Well, most of it. Spoiler alert! A lot of neat stuff happened in this awesome sequel, but one thing that stood out to me was Twilight Sparkle. No, not Pony Twilight, not Human Twilight from Equestria, but the original Human Twilight. Here's the clip at the end of the credits. No doubt about it, Spike. There's definitely something strange going on at that school. <laughs> Now there's two ways this could go down. Either next time Pony Twilight visits Canterlot High, she meets a second human Twilight, or even better, original human Twilight finds her way through the portal. Now if original human Twilight did go through the portal, her pony form would be a unicorn. Not an alicorn, since in the human world, Twilight could never master the magic of friendship. She would basically be Twilight before the pilot episode, all hidden away and studying like the egghead she is. I don't know about you guys, but I'm psyched for the future of Equestria Girls. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Two weeks ago, I asked you guys who is the best or your favorite princess. The totals have been counted up, and we have a winner. Let's see what you guys had to say. In fourth place with a total of 48 votes is Princess Celestia. And that's out of 967 votes, which makes a meager 4.96%. Third place with 139 votes is Twilight Sparkle, making up for 14.37% of the total votes. This leaves us with two left, Luna and Cadence. Who will it be? I can feel the tension in the air. Second place goes to... Princess Cadence with 145 votes, making Luna first place. Look at how much she won by two. With 635 votes, Luna had more than four times second place, 65.67% of the vote. For those of you who like pie charts, let's look at the poll results from that perspective. Twilight and Cadence were pretty close together, separated by a mere six votes. But why does Luna get all the love? Breakable Pottery made the point that Luna was at one point the enemy, and wasn't always the goody two-shoes perfect princess. Lots of people had similar comments about how her history as Nightmare Moon makes her pretty interesting. She also gets lots of support from the more rebel-minded group, since she was the closest to ever overthrowing Celestia. Josh Shergirl pointed out that my favorite villain and my favorite pet both had to do with Fluttershy. And based off this pattern, guessed my favorite princess would be Twilight, the princess closest to Fluttershy. Well, he was right, but not for that reason. That is a funny coincidence, but the reason I voted for Twilight is because I think she has the most developed character of the four. 
Besides, we were with her all the way through her journey into princesshood. We know all her faults and flaws firsthand. Or should I say, first hoof. No? Nobody? While Luna does have a pretty neat backstory, I just think Twilight has a more familiar set of traits. Another thing people tended to like about Luna is how she's the most personal of the four. She works in the consciences and dreams of individual ponies. She may not solve the larger problems, but the influence her dreamwalking has is enormous. Most people who claimed not to like Celestia said it was because she's basically a god and not very relatable. This is a good point, but in Celestia's defense, I really respect the loyalty she has towards her kingdom, even when the safety of the people meant banishing her sister. And although she isn't the most relatable, Celestia is extremely responsible and deals with a whole lot of problems as a princess. Props to you, Celestia. Another common answer for best princess was Discord. Maybe they should make me an Alcorn princess. <laughs> Thank you for all of your awesome answers, and congratulations to Princess Luna. This is the Bernie Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Hear me, villagers! All you call me Luna! Hello and welcome to episode 5 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, The Ticketmaster. <laughs> Dear Princess Celestia, Being the third episode in the entire series, the main six were young in their knowledge of friendship. Honestly, all of these ponies have developed so much since then, I doubt that now they would act the same way, given a similar scenario. In this episode, when Twilight couldn't make up her mind on who to choose to go with her to the Grand Galloping Gala, she sends both tickets back, saying, if all my friends can't go, I don't want to go either. I don't necessarily agree with this mindset though. Twilight gave up two opportunities of a lifetime because she couldn't make up her mind. The six could have cooled down and talked it through, and with that, they would have learned a lesson of sacrifice and cooperation, but I feel like Twilight gave up too early. However, like any other episode, it all worked out in the end. Basically what I'm saying is, there's always a solution to any problem, and throwing away tickets because you can't figure out who to give them to wasn't the best way out. Two people going to the gala is better than none at all. Throughout the episode, each of the five ponies really buttered up Twilight, trying to convince her to give them the ticket, so I'm not even trying to hide their true motives. I call it the opening a pack of gum effect. Once you take out that pack of gum, suddenly everybody's your friend. Twilight could see straight through their lies and saw all the favors as what they were. Lame attempts to win her over. You're not doing this for the ticket, are you? Oh no, I'm doing this because you're my very best friend, right Angel? Oh, yes. We are just doing this for the ticket. Doing that just made them look bad, which gives us moral too. Don't resort to flattery. If you want something from someone, go no further than asking them. Eventually, even total strangers started chasing Twilight around for her ticket. Twilight never got a spare moment to properly think her dilemma through. The one time she did was on an empty stomach, which doesn't work that well. If she wasn't constantly under pressure, she might have had a clearer mind. Never pressure decision making. The other five were pretty insensitive to how on edge Twilight was and should have noticed that she needed more space. And finally, communication. Here's how the problem could have been avoided altogether. Hey, Princess Celestia. What is it, Twilight? Could I have four more tickets so all my friends could go? Sure thing, Twilight. How hard would that have been? Communication can solve a lot of unnecessary problems, as I've already pointed out in different Dear Princess Celestias. Believe it or not, for the first time I couldn't find a way to incorporate friendship as magic into the moral. While Twilight could have worked it out without sending the tickets back, she was so dedicated to her friends staying together, it was all or nothing. But I wouldn't really count that as a moral. Don't worry, it'll be back next time for sure. What episode should the next Dear Princess Lustia be about? Let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. The Everfree Forest, home of the Mirror Pond, the Castle of the Two Sisters, the Timberwolf, the Tree of Harmony, and a lot of other weird stuff. But what is it that makes the Everfree Forest so strange? <laughs> In Season 1, Episode 9, Bridal Gossip, we got an interesting look into what sets the Everfree Forest apart. The Everfree Forest just ain't natural. The plants grow, animals care for themselves, and the clouds move all on their own. What I find odd is the cloud part. That line would imply that without intervention, clouds would sit in the same spot forever, and Pegasi are responsible for moving them. This would mean in the Everfree Forest, clouds move on their own, like they do in our world. 
Speaking of the human world, the main difference we've seen between Equestria and the human world is Equestria runs on magic, while everything in the other world occurs naturally, except for the magic of friendship. But is it possible that the laws of physics from the natural world leaked through the mirror into the magical world of Equestria? Perhaps the mirror to Canterlot High used to be in the castle of the two sisters, and the surrounding forest is a result of this combination of natural occurrences and magic. This would explain why the Everfree Forest doesn't obey the same laws of nature as the rest of Equestria. In the season 4 premiere, the Everfree Forest started invading Equestria. We found out that this was because the Tree of Harmony had run out of magic, so Discord seeds could finally begin to grow. The Tree of Harmony is a source of magic in Equestria, so maybe when the magic ran out, the natural world, previously confined by the magic, could finally spread. This would also explain why unicorn magic became so uncontrollable, the laws of physics conflicting with natural law. Now, there are many problems with this theory. First of all, if the Everfree Forest obeyed the laws of nature like the human world, independent of magic, then why would there be magic at all? The Everfree Forest is full of magic, maybe even more so than the rest of Equestria, although the type of magic is a very different chaotic magic. But that still leaves the question wide open. Why is the Everfree Forest so different? In order to explain the Everfree Forest, it'd be helpful to find out how it came to be. So let's try to find its origin. It's noteworthy how the most magical tree is in the most mysteriously magical place in Equestria. Plus, the most magical ponies just happen to choose that area for a castle. From what it seems, these events have to be related. But what caused what? Did the Tree of Harmony grow from the magic in the Everfree Forest, or the other way around? The Everfree Forest growing from the magic in the tree? Did Celestia and Luna choose a castle in the middle of a forest, or did the forest grow around their castle? Was the Tree of Harmony planted by Celestia and Luna, or has it been around for much longer? Here's what we know. Nothing. Unfortunately, barely anything can be determined from what we've seen in any episode. Assumptions and theories are all we really have. You can assume that the sisters wouldn't build their castle in the middle of a forest, but you can't know for sure. In Twilight's flashback, Celestia knew what role the tree played and how it worked, but that doesn't give us any clues as to which came first. Everything related to the Everfree Forest is shrouded in a deep mystery, but what do you guys think? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Broke. Dear Princess Celestia, Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Instead of doing an episode, today I'll be analyzing the moral of Rainbow Rocks. There were so many things about Rainbow Rocks that were better than the original, but whether I like it as a whole more has yet to be decided. One thing that made the sequel awesome is how the story had a focus on Sunset Shimmer in her redemption. I loved how natural the friendship between the five and Sunset Shimmer was. You would think that after the Fall Formal fiasco, the friendship between them would be sort of awkward. I mean, she did try to kill them and take over Equestria. But since Shimmer's reformation, her friends have regarded her as a whole new person. Quite a contrast from the unforgiving nature of the rest of Canterlot High. It was crucial for Sunset Shimmer to know that she was accepted, despite her past mistakes. Moral 1. Forgive and forget. Give people second chances. In that respect, the main six showed a good example of forgiveness. But in several different parts of the movie, they argued over petty mistakes made before, and forgiveness had no part in their conversation. So they showed a bad example of forgiveness too. Playing the blame game just stirred more chaos among them. However, this doesn't always mean you shouldn't tell someone their mistakes. To an extent, showing someone the error of their ways is actually important. Sunset Shimmer knew something was up with all the arguing, but it took her a while to say anything about it, being new to the whole friendship thing. If she had told them that the arguing was just hurting their friendship, they might not have come so close to losing their magic. Now, telling a friend that what they're doing is wrong can be tricky. No one likes being rebuked, but many times calling people out on their mistakes can help them and prevent a bigger mess in the future. Although, if you don't do so respectfully and in private, there's pretty much no way that person's gonna listen. Moral 3. Don't be so judgmental. So Rainbow Dash was beginning to sprout her pony ears on the stage, which was a huge problem, considering they didn't want to spoil their plan of using magic to oust the sirens. But when Sunset jumped on Rainbow Dash and kept their secret from being revealed... What was that? You were showing them your magic. I... I didn't know what else to do. Uh, close the curtains, unplug her app, give us a chance to deal with the situation? I'm sorry, I just wanted to help. Yeah, well, you did it. <sighs> it's not like she had enough time to think through other solutions. Plus, being judgmental is actually what spurred all the arguments in the first place. Next up, we have Rainbow Dash. You would think she would have learned her lesson in the Mare Duel episode. 
Bragging doesn't get you very far. Wait, the mirror duel incident happened in the pony world, so I guess human Rainbow Dash can't be held to the same standards. But anyway, throughout the movie, Rainbow Dash was extremely self-centered. She wrote an entire song about how awesome she is and tried to steal the show with her guitar solos. It's a team effort, but Rainbow Dash barely saw it as such. Now Pony Rainbow Dash knows better than this, and hopefully her human counterpart will not have to learn the hard way by embarrassing herself in front of everybody, like the Pony Rainbow Dash. Moral 5. Friendship is magic! Friendship is magic. The six elements of harmony have been enough to stop every villain in the past, but this time they didn't have the elements and depended solely on the magic of friendship through their music. As we saw, six didn't cut it, but when Sunset Shimmer joined, she was like a seventh element of harmony, and their magic of friendship was enough. On a side note, if Sunset Shimmer had an element to herself, I think it would be the element of forgiveness, for obvious reasons. One amazing thing about this movie was how they were able to take two characters with the opposite problem and relate them together. Both had expectations of them. One had overly negative expectations, and the other had really high expectations. But let's look at Twilight. As a leader, much was expected of her, and the confidence other people had in Twilight added to the pressure. Even Sunset Shimmer, the one who related the most to Twilight, belittled Twilight's problem, trusting that she was fully capable, when in the truth, Twilight had no idea what she was doing. Don't put too much pressure on leaders, whether it's a teacher, or a parent, or whoever. People with more responsibilities can get pretty stressed, as we've seen. Twilight wrecked her brain, trying to find a specific counterspell, while the real problem was going on right under her nose. The magic of friendship was slowly being replaced with something else, and while everyone was arguing, Twilight was obsessing over something that they couldn't do without their magic in the first place. Don't miss the big picture. Of course, Twilight's come a long way since pre-season 4. She used to be a lot worse when it came to this. Twilight's been known to become too focused on small details while missing the big picture, specifically in It's About Time, and lesson zero. Over the past five weeks, I've been flashing numbers on the screen for a thirtieth of a second each. Five weeks ago a five, four weeks ago a four, three weeks ago a three, so on and so forth. Lots of you guys have caught on, but why exactly have I been counting down? Because I have a big announcement. For the first time on my channel, I will be- video has tons of dislikes, this is why. Yes, proceed with the comments on how this joke is 7 years old and isn't funny anymore. Whatever. Anyway, what are some other morals you can take from this movie? And what episode should I analyze the moral of next? Let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoo. Sunset Shimmer has officially joined the list of reformed villains, but will she become the seventh element of harmony? <laughs>
The element of friendship and the element of magic are like two sides of the same coin, just with different bearers in each world. This also makes sense when we take into account the difference between the two worlds. While Equestria is full of magic, the human world works naturally. The one thing that's the same in both is the magic of friendship. The magic of friendship doesn't just exist in Equestria. It's everywhere. Now here's the curveball. The original Human Twilight and the original Sunset Shimmer. The way it's been, Pony Sunset Shimmer, Human Sunset Shimmer, and Human Twilight have been in the human world, while the original Pony Twilight is the only one of the four who still lives in Equestria. And since original Pony Sunset is staying at Canterlot High, I think that either Human Twilight or Human Sunset Shimmer will end up living in Equestria. But which one will it be? Because they seem to be going somewhere with the original Human Twilight story, I think Human Twilight will restore balance by living in Equestria, both Twilights in Equestria and both Sunsets in the human world. Now this doesn't seem very balanced, but magically, it really is. In each world, we would have one person experienced with the magic of friendship, and one person who isn't. It'll be like the Disney movie Enchanted, where Giselle ended up staying in New York, while Nancy went back to the fairy tale world, one foreigner for each world. What do you guys think about my theory? Let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoop. Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, it's about time. Dear Princess Celestia, I've been wanting to analyze a Twilight episode for quite a while, so it's about time I did this one. <laughs> anyway, instead of having several morals like the other episodes I've talked about, this episode had one central theme. The future. In It's About Time, we were given two examples on how not to deal with the future. Twilight worried way too much, being overly concerned with the things she had no power over. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have Spike, who didn't care enough about the future and made rather short-sighted decisions. These two serve as two extremes of the same problem. First, let's talk about Spike. When Twilight became obsessed with preventing disaster, Spike took advantage of the anarchy and ate all the ice cream he could without getting in trouble. When he was warned about the impending stomachache, his reply was, well that's future Spike's problem. This is what I like to call the YOLO complex. You only live once, so why not do what you want when you want to do it? Well, Spike learned the hard way that this mindset isn't the best way to go. In this respect, it's important to plan ahead your future and not to do anything rash or that will later bring negative consequences. However, you can only plan ahead so much. No matter how much Twilight would hate to admit it, you can't control the future. Now don't get me wrong, safety precautions are a great way of keeping on the safe side, but Twilight took it way too far. She was so obsessive, she went even as far as trying to monitor everything, which actually made things worse for her. I believe the perfect balance can be found somewhere between Spike and Twilight, not overreacting, but taking precautions and solving problems as they come along. Now that we're talking about this episode, I might as well ask you guys a question I've been thinking about. This episode is like a loop. Near the end of the episode, Twilight goes back in time to warn her past self not to worry, which curiously is what caused past Twilight to worry in the first place. After a week of freaking out, Twilight decides that there was nothing to worry about, and goes back in time to warn her past self not to worry. And the cycle continues. But what is it that started the cycle? There has to be something that initiated the cycle to begin with. If it was a loop independent of anything else, we have several problems, one of which being this. How did Twilight know where the time spells were? Oh yeah, future Twilight told her. The time spells are in the Canterlot archives, but that's not really- But how did future Twilight know? Well, when she was past Twilight, the future Twilight told her. So where did the original knowledge come from? This is why the loop idea on its own doesn't really work. If you guys have any theories to explain this quantum confusion, let me know in the comments. Since my last remix was What My Cutie Mark Is Telling Me, I thought it would be appropriate to remix A True True Friend. And of all the songs I've remixed so far, A True True Friend is my personal favorite. So be expecting that anytime between Thursday and Saturday. Once I get that uploaded, I'll put a link here and in the description. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. What if Clover the Clever from Equestrian History was actually Twilight Sparkle from the future? <laughs> The theory of Clover the Clever actually being Twilight was originally thought of by Dr. Wolf 001. I would highly recommend his video on it, he talks about some really interesting ideas. In short, the theory goes like this. 
At some point in the future, Twilight will go back in time to meet her idol, Star Swirl the Bearded. She arrives in the era described by the play in A Hearthwarming's Eve, back when the three tribes were separated. There she becomes an apprentice to Star Swirl the Bearded. Now at the time, being an alicorn in public would be too risky, so she wears a brown hood to cover her wings. One purpose this theory serves is to explain why the characters in the flashbacks look exactly like the modern main six. Of course, the simpler explanation is that the flashbacks weren't really exact, and were modified to include the character designs of the main six. This would prevent confusion, however, I strongly believe there is something to this theory. First of all, let's talk about friendship. If Clover the Clever was actually Twilight, that means the Fire of Friendship was created by the Princess of Friendship. Makes sense. Plus, looking at the creation of the Friendship Fire, we see a striking resemblance to any of the times Twilight used a strong magic. I believe the igniting of the Friendship Fire was actually the birth of the Elements of Harmony. Maybe the fire was an intense soup of the unorganized magic of friendship that eventually separated itself into six elements. Here's what I think happened. Right before the Three Ponies froze to death, Clover the Clever, aka Twilight Sparkle, released a massive burst of the magic of friendship contained inside of her. Private Pansy and Smart Cookie established the elements of kindness and honesty. Even though they weren't actually Fluttershy and Applejack, they seemed to have the same qualities. This is just like in Equestria Girls, where the elements still connected even though the human main six weren't actually the original bearers. After this, the fire either created or became the elements of harmony that would be used by Celestia, Luna, and the main six. What's really neat is that this theory ties in with last week's video about It's About Time. If it weren't for the element of magic, the elements of harmony would never have existed. It's because the element of magic went back and established the other five in the friendship fire. Just like in It's About Time, Twilight worried because after a week of worrying, she would go back in time and cause herself to worry in the first place. Both instances are independent loops. There's no discernible origin of the element of magic in this theory. Just like there is no origin of Twilight's conflict in It's About Time. As several commenters pointed out in my last video, this is what's called the Bootstrap Paradox. Also in the comments, Sky Silverwing offered a brilliant solution to this problem. Most people see time as linear, strictly cause and effect, but if you look at it in a non-linear, non-subjective way... Wait a second. This is the Doctor. Let's try this again. Well, most people see time as linear, strictly cause and effect, but if you look at it in a non-linear, non-subjective way, it's more like a big bowl of wibbly wobbly be whiny stuff. In other words, future Twilight always came back, because the cause and the effect were always paired together. There was never an iteration of the time loop where both events did not occur. Basically, the problem with my last video is you can't assume time is a straight line. It's very well possible that there was no origin to the time loop in both scenarios. The cause and effect were always linked. Now this would mean the elements of harmony were destined to form in the same loop, but that doesn't necessarily break any of the laws, because wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Wibbly wobbly timey wimey! <laughs> Back on the topic of Clover the Clever, a question some would ask is why wouldn't Twilight be afraid of changing history by becoming the student of someone in the past? Well, her previous experience with time travel probably convinced Twilight that history can't be rewritten. When she went back in time to warn herself not to worry, no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't prevent her past self from worrying. The reason why is the event of Twilight worrying was established by her future self going back in time. They were linked. Because her past experience with time travel, Twilight would have no knowledge on the negative effects of time travel shown in other movies and TV shows, like slowly fading away until you stop existing, or ripping holes in the space-time continuum, or anything like that. Now at that moment, when Twilight realized she had literally become Clover the Clever, she would probably just accept her role and roll with it, knowing that she couldn't do her part wrong, since she had already done it right. The best part about this theory is it explains something that I've never fully understood. Why was Twilight's element of harmony shaped like your cutie mark long before Twilight even existed? In the pilot, the other five elements molded to match the other five's cutie marks, but the element of magic matched Twilight's cutie mark even before. This is because she did exist before her birth, but as Clover the Clever. The only loose end in this theory is the Tree of Harmony. In this model, the elements aren't actually from the tree like we previously assumed, but that doesn't necessarily render the overall theory as irrelevant. What do you guys think? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And for those of you who are totally lost, I'll try not to do another time traveling video for next week. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, Bats. <laughs> Dear Princess Celestia,
I've talked about the bats episode before, but instead of just talking about that one moral, I'm gonna hash this out DPC style. As we learned, it's important not to let peer pressure influence your decisions negatively. But before you go judging Fluttershy, put yourself in her hoofs. Taking away what made the vampire bats vampire bats was against what she knew was right. However, a lot was at stake if she didn't. These bats threatened to put Applejack out of business, and who knows how much the economy of Ponyville depends on that orchard. And it's not like there are many other solutions. Fluttershy even tried negotiating with the bats, only to come to the conclusion that the bats were too stubborn. She really had a huge decision to make. The sad thing is Fluttershy would have stuck to her guns if it weren't for how the other five pressured her into siding with them. The disaster that ensued Twilight Spell wasn't all Fluttershy's fault, not in the slightest. I'd say the guilt falls on the other five. In the same way that you shouldn't give in to negative peer pressure, you shouldn't be the negative peer pressure either. Twilight and the others should have noticed how uncomfortable Fluttershy was, and not have manipulated her to do what she considered to be wrong. This was a hard decision, and circling around her chanting, Stop the Bats, wasn't helping anything. Now let's focus on this from the Bats' perspective. Was changing the way the Bats function ethically right? This brings up the controversial topic of genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Science has found a way to change the genes of produce to better fit our needs. For example, lots of corn grown in the United States has been modified to resist weed-killing chemicals. While this makes farming easier and cheaper, many claim that genetically modified corn has a lower nutritional value and higher levels of toxins. Many people think that GMOs are responsible for our increasing allergy rates, obesity, and even cancer. Now these changes definitely help us in our current problems, but the long-term consequences might not be in our favor. This is just like how modifying the bats solved the short-term problem of infestation, but in return caused a bigger problem that was just harder to deal with. To me, it seems like maybe the writers of this episode were warning us against the negative effects of GMOs, but whether this is intentional or not is up for you to decide. Some would say, don't mess with nature or nature will mess with you, but I wouldn't take that approach. I believe that the technology of genetic modification can be improved through research and lab experimentation. I would just say, be careful changing nature. This moral doesn't really apply to everyday life, but we can pull another good moral out of the whole GMO rant. Don't use short-sighted solutions. Be sure to put in there that I came to see that my short-term solution was a little short-sighted. Sound familiar? Myopic solutions that end up causing more problems in the future aren't really worth it. What do you guys think about these morals, and which episode should I analyze next? Leave your thoughts in the comments. The most common episode request for Dear Princess Celestia is Testing Testing 1, 2, 3, but I've actually already done that. Well, sort of. The video was about the moral of that episode, but it was posted before I started Dear Princess Celestia. And of all the morals in MLP, testing 1, 2, 3 is probably one of the best. So check out the video via the link on the screen or in the description. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoof. We know how Flutterbat came to be. Fluttershy stares somehow mixed with Twilight Spell for the bats, and the spell backfired onto Fluttershy. But how does that explain why her cutie mark changed? <laughs> As we saw, Twilight's magic was interfered by Fluttershy's stare, which tells us that the stare has magical properties, and her stern look isn't the only thing that encourages behavior. All that is cool, but what really fascinated me was the fact that Fluttershy's cutie mark changed upon her transformation into Flutterbat. The last time Fluttershy's cutie mark changed, her entire destiny changed with it. To understand what happened here, let's take a closer look at the events of Magical Mystery Cure. When Twilight cast Star Swirl's unfinished spell, the elements of harmony switched around. Next time we saw the rest of the main six, their cutie marks had done likewise. However, I don't think that means the elements of harmony are directly connected to the main six's cutie marks, even though each pony's element and their cutie mark always match. Like I've said in a previous video, the cutie mark is a reflection of one's destiny, and in itself has no power. So I think the unfinished spell swapped the destinies of the ponies, and as a result their cutie marks changed too. That being said, their desire to eat apples is what made the vampire fruit bats vampire fruit bats. Their destiny, if you will. When this was transferred into Fluttershy, she received the bat's destiny. At that point, her destiny was to be a vampire fruit bat, so her cutie mark changed accordingly. But in Magical Mystery Cure, Fluttershy's destiny didn't just disappear. It was transferred to Rainbow Dash. So what happened to the real Fluttershy? Was her destiny swapped with the bats? I don't think so. The bats gave no signs of being anything like Fluttershy. Plus in Twilight's diagram, the change seemed to only transfer the bats' qualities to Fluttershy, not vice versa. Now let's look at what happened when Twilight cast the counterspell. Notice she never cast the spell on the actual bats, just on Flutterbat. When the spell was complete, we saw a white bat's fly 
fly away from Fluttershy. It's obvious that those bats were both what made Fluttershy look like this, and what made her want to be a vampire bat, craving apples and such. We can assume that they flew back to rejoin with the bats, restoring their original qualities. So no, there was no swap. I find it more likely that the real Fluttershy was somewhere in there the whole time, just suppressed by Flutterbat. Spooky, I know. And not all of it actually left her either. Afterwards, she still had that one snaggletooth. I have some good news and some bad news. I'm guessing you'll want to hear the bad news first. Due to Christmas break, I won't be posting a video Wednesday the 24th or Wednesday the 31st, but I'll be back up and running for the new year. Just letting you guys know two weeks ahead of time. Alright, now for the good news. Tonight at 6, I'll be releasing my newest remix, Stop the Bats. With all these videos, I must be driving you all batty. <laughs> anyway, I'm really excited about this one. It's slower than my other remixes and has a fun groove to it, so stay tuned for that. Let me know what you think about my theory on Flutterbat in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoof. Twilight is by far the most tidy and organized of the main six, and even of the princesses. But is it possible that Twilight has OCD? <laughs> It's a common misconception that OCD is just the need to organize everything, whether alphabetically or by color or by shape. However, that's only a small part of this disorder. First of all, OCD stands for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, and like the name would suggest, it's an anxiety disorder that causes people to have obsessions and compulsions. There's no single symptom of OCD, it takes many different forms. Most people with OCD fall into one of five categories. Let's see which category, if any, Twilight falls into. First we have checkers, and I'm not talking about the board game. These people will repeatedly check things, like whether the oven was turned off or if a door was locked. While writing emails, letters, or texts, some people check over and over again for grammatical or spelling errors. I have a friend who feels the need to make sure doors are locked. Even if he had just checked the same door three times before, there's still this compulsion to check it again and again. Twilight has been known to double and triple check her checklists, but this isn't OCD. It's only Twilight taking caution. The difference is checkers take so much caution, it interferes with their daily life, takes up time, and causes distress. So I would say Twilight does not fall into this category. Next we have washers, pretty self-explanatory. People who fall into this category are afraid of contamination. Some wash their hands more than 50 times a day, which is actually worse for them. Even if they know they're overreacting, the urge is often too strong to resist. Washers can be found decontaminating surfaces frequently, and are usually paranoid of things like dirt, crowds, or other potentially germy substances. Twilight doesn't really show any of these symptoms, so this one doesn't seem to fit her either. Third, we have the hoarders, people that fear something bad will happen if they throw anything away. These people often hold on to random objects, even trash, even though they have no use. Needless to say, this isn't a very healthy lifestyle. Although some would argue that the end of Trajia might be an example of Twilight hoarding, I don't think this is anything she'll struggle with in the future. The fourth category, counters and arrangers. This is the group most people are familiar with. Counters and arrangers are obsessed with order and symmetry. Sorry, that was mean of me. Anyways, some people have superstitions about different arrangements, numbers, or colors. There's only two clips that would hint towards Twilight being an arranger. Let's look at Lesson Zero, where Twilight wasted a significantly long amount of time rearranging the frosting on cupcakes. She basically stated that they all had to be the same, where it wouldn't be fair for everybody. For the second clip, well, I'll just show it to you. Twilight! Ah! Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. <sighs> no, it's okay. I need to take a break anyway. What's going on? Now, if things like this happen more often, I might be convinced, but it only happened twice. I mean, it's a possibility, but let's move on to the most convincing candidate. Fifth and foremost, we have doubters and sinners. If everything isn't done perfectly or just right, doubters and sinners are afraid that terrible things will happen and they'll get punished. This has Twilight's name written all over it. Just look at a bird in the hoof. Twilight totally overreacted when Fluttershy took Philomena. She thought Celestia would put her and Fluttershy in some jail cell in the Everfree Forest. And then we have Lesson Zero. Twilight thought missing one assignment would get her sent back to Magic Kindergarten. She can't even take a test without thinking everything's going down. Her schedule has to be perfect too. And it's about time, before future Twilight arrived, she was up at 3am worrying about a scheduling problem. Before Season 4, any time something didn't go just right, she pretty much had a breakdown. Yes, I'd say with certainty that Twilight has OCD, falling into the Doubters and Sinners category. But wait, there's more. Notice that I said, before Season 4. 
Twilight hasn't had a major freakout at all as a princess, but it's not like becoming a princess took away her OCD. There's no known cure for OCD, but it is possible to get this disorder under control, even though it will always be in the background. So if her OCD didn't disappear upon her transformation into princesshood, when did Twilight stop showing symptoms? In Games Pony's play, the main six were with Cadence, getting ready to welcome the Equestria Games Inspector. And long story short, everything went wrong. The first time there was something to lose her head over, this happened. And every time after that, Twilight stayed a lot more calm and collected. Well, at least more than she would usually. I'm sure that wasn't the first time Cadence shared that trick with Twilight. It's no secret that all the princesses were preparing Twilight for being a princess. Now, getting OCD under control is a lot harder and takes more time and encouragement. But I think Twilight can be a symbol of hope for those who have obsessive compulsive disorder. Her improvement might be inspiration to some people, which is pretty cool. Stay tuned for next week. Does Pinkie Pie have ADHD? Just kidding, I'm not posting a video next week or the week after for the holidays. Even when I get back, I probably won't explore that topic. Let me know what you think about this video in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until 2015. Bro hoop. According to Granny Smith, the Apple family has family reunions every 100 moons. But how long is a moon? Friends. Happy New Year! This is my first upload of 2015, and all this celebrating got me thinking about dates. No, not that kind of dates, like calendar dates. The way that ponies measure time. One measurement I found interesting was the moon. The moon has been referenced several times in the show, but we'll be looking at the instances in Equestria Girls and Apple Family Reunion. In Equestria Girls, the portal was going to close on the third day of Twilight's visit, and if she missed her exit, she would have to wait 30 moons before the portal opened again. How long would 30 moons actually be? 30 days? 30 months? For many older cultures, the lunar cycle was used to keep time. This is where the idea of the month originated. Each revolution around the Earth would be a new moon. A lunar cycle lasts for 29 and a half days. If an equestrian moon was 29 and a half days long, 30 moons would be just under two and a half years. That's a long time to be stuck in a different world. However, 29 and a half days couldn't be an equestrian moon. Here's where Apple Family Reunion comes in. In that episode, Granny Smith explains how they've had a family reunion every 100 moons, and that for each reunion, they've had their picture taken in front of the barn. If you do the math, 129 and a half day periods adds up to around 8 years. So is 8 years how often the Apple family throws reunions? Mm, no. Just look at the ponies we recognize. There doesn't seem to be a difference in age. I mean, it's plausible that the adult ponies looked the same 8 years before, but there's no way Apple Bloom wouldn't look younger. For 8 years, she should at least look like little Applejack. I'm Applejack. Small Apple Fritto. <laughs> so 29 and a half days is way too long. However, I can sum up the solution in 4 words. Equestria is not Earth. Our moon takes 29 and a half days to complete one revolution around our planet, but Princess Luna revolves the moon around their planet every single day. So the whole 29 and a half day thing is really insignificant. This leaves the question wide open again. Even though an Equestrian Lunar Revolution is only one day, that doesn't mean there can't be phases. Depending on where Celestia positions the sun on the opposite side of Equestria, the shadow cast on the moon will change. I find it likely that Celestia and Luna set up a system for citizens in Equestria to keep time with. In my theory, they do this by creating phases that would cycle, and those cycles, of course, would be called moons. There's no solid answer to how long this period of time is, but we can make guesstimates based on what we know about the reunion. Judging on Apple Bloom, I think the previous reunion was two years beforehand. My opinion is that the 100 moons between reunions is the equivalent of two of our years. Wait, if the reunion happens every two years, then shouldn't there have been way more barn pictures? There are only three, so some had to have been missing. This would explain why between these two reunions, Granny Smith aged a lot, but between these two reunions, Apple Bloom didn't change at all. Besides, every two years is pretty reasonable for family reunions. With this model, doing the math brings us 50 moons a year. This would mean in Equestria Girls, the portal wouldn't open again for three-fifths of one of our years, still long enough to endanger Equestria. We've talked about moons, but how do years work? One year for us is a revolution of Earth around the sun. But in the pony world, the sun revolves around Equestria, and we know a year couldn't possibly be one day. I think in the same way Celestia and Luna created the phases to measure time, they determined that a number of their phases would make up a larger measure of time. In my theory, they called 100 moons a year. Why 100? 
It's a pretty easy number, like how there's 100 centimeters in a meter. This would of course mean that an equestrian year is twice as long as one of ours, but that's okay since the worlds are totally different. All of this speculation is just guesses and rough estimates, so if any of you guys have a better idea, leave it in the comments. I'd love to hear some other takes on it. You may think I'm wearing this party hat to celebrate New Year's, but you're wrong. Well, you're kind of right, but I'm mainly celebrating 20,000 subscribers. That number is big. You guys are so awesome. I'm lucky to have so many followers that contribute to my theories and videos. So here's to an awesome 2015. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Hello and welcome to episode 9 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, Leap of Faith. Dear Princess Celestia Throughout the series, the writers have found different ways of presenting the elements of harmony through different angles, especially in the key episodes of Season 4. In her key episode, Rarity learned that generosity can be abused. In Fluttershy, she learned that being too kind can keep people from doing what they need to do, and sometimes you have to be stern for the good of others. In the same way, the episode Leap of Faith put Applejack's element of honesty to the test in a new way. Applejack had to decide if being honest was best, even if the alternative lies helped people. Flim and Flam's tonic really did cause a huge improvement in Granny Smith, even though it was nothing but apple juice and beet leaves. It served as a confidence booster. If Granny Smith knew the tonic didn't physically do anything, she may have never had that self-confidence that helped her so much. But does that put Flim and Flam in the right? No. Granny Smith's problem was not a physical problem. It's implied that she could have swam just as well without the tonic, but it took that extra confidence to convince her to start swimming again. All that happened there was mental, but people who were legitimately ill would have seen no change. As Applejack discovered, honesty is always the best policy. Even though the lies seemed to help, they could have hurt Granny Smith a lot. Similar to the first moral, I would say it's not right to do wrong to do right. Basically, lying to boost the confidence of others is still lying. Even if there was a placebo effect that did heal physical sickness, the means of the healing would have been through lies, so that's what Applejack learned. But what moral did Granny Smith take away? Granny had way too much trust in the tonic. She somehow believed that she could survive a six-story jump into a little dish. How did she find that possible? Also, before the tonic, Granny discouraged Apple Bloom from ever becoming a high diver. But after the tonic, she totally approved of it. With the way Granny acted, I'm beginning to wonder if those were really beet leaves in the tonic. This is, after all, Season 4, Episode 20. So, lesson learned. Don't do drugs, kids. No, that's obviously not the moral of this story. I'd say the biggest lesson Granny learned in this episode is to not be naive. The fact that she believed Flim and Flam when they said the tonic would bring back her youth shows that she's a little too trusting. It also shows that she has a pretty bad memory. I mean, the last time these two were around, the apples almost lost their farm, which makes me wonder why they came back at all. Don't they kind of have a bad reputation in Ponyville? But that's off topic. I think Applejack said it best. When some pony says something is too good to be true, it usually is. If the internet existed in Equestria, I feel like Granny Smith would be the one who falls for all that deceptive clickbait. Similarly, I feel that Flim and Flam would be the ones putting it out there. And finally, for the fourth moral, don't underestimate what you can do. I know Granny Smith overestimated her abilities, but take a look at her story. After that one dive from who knows how long ago, Granny's been afraid of swimming ever since. When she finally got back in the water and did perfectly well, she of course credited the tonic, while she was fully able to do that the whole time. So how many years of her life did she spend not knowing she could do this? What you call this? <laughs> Let me know what you think about this episode and its morals. Also, which episode should I analyze next? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Bernie Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. So you're telling me that the future bearer of the element of magic was just by chance chosen to be the overseer of the Summer Sun celebration, and each area of preparation just happened to be headed by the other five future elements of harmony? Don't tell me that's a coincidence. <laughs> It's obvious that Princess Celestia played a role in introducing Twilight to the other five elements of harmony. When Twilight sent that one letter to Celestia in the first episode, she responded to the valid threat with, you've got to stop reading those dusty old books, and encouraged her to make friends instead. I think it's safe to say Celestia knew all along of the danger yet to come. 
Most people would agree that Celestia set up the Summer Sun celebration so Twilight would meet her fellow Elements of Harmony and stop Nightmare Moon. There's no way Celestia was actually serious about those books being old and dusty. Plus, this would explain why she listed the task of friend making to be the most important. And I have an even more essential task for you to complete. Make some friends! Although Twilight didn't think so, the fate of Equestria actually did rest on her making friends. I'm not inclined to believe that those occurrences were sheer luck anyway. But how far ahead did Celestia have to plan? Think about it. Without her interfering, five out of six of the future bearers already lived in Ponyville. What are the odds of that? Was Celestia behind that too? No, she couldn't have that much foresight. There is a solution though. Long before the events of the pilot, an even crazier coincidence took place. Get ready for this one. One single event led to each of these ponies getting their cutie marks at the same time. These six were connected before they met and before Celestia set them up. While Celestia was responsible for the final piece of the puzzle, it was Destiny that decided Fluttershy would end up living in Ponyville. It was Destiny that decided Applejack shouldn't stay in Manhattan. And basically, without the rain boom, the main six may have never met each other. And if that didn't happen, things wouldn't have gone so well. Long before Celestia even knew of Twilight's incredible power, a stronger force behind the scenes was pushing the elements together. But why these ponies? Twilight was obviously destined to be the element of magic. Her cutie mark is the element of magic for goodness sake. But the other five seem to be, dare I say, expendable. Can't any loyal person bear the element of loyalty? Or does it have to be Rainbow Dash? Same with the other four. What's so special about the main six? The answer to that question is in the question itself. The main six. Let me explain. When Luna transformed into Nightmare Moon, Celestia used the elements of harmony all by herself. And they seemed to work just fine. But as you know, the spell only lasted a thousand years. Each of the six elements describes Celestia perfectly, so it makes sense that she'd be able to use them without assistance. But what makes the difference is friendship. You can't have harmony between one person, even if that person meets all the requirements. The friendship between the main six is exactly what the elements of harmony needed to meet their full potential. When Celestia used the elements on Nightmare Moon, nothing was done with the evil within her. The problem was just delayed. A thousand years later, she was just as evil. But when the main six used the elements of harmony on her, the darkness left her. In theory, anyone with the right qualities could bear any element, as long as they have the magic of friendship on their side. It may be hard to imagine someone random, like the Sofa and Quills guide, bearing an element of harmony, but I think it's possible. If this is true, then why were these six ponies chosen to be put together? There's no real answer. The ways of destiny are very mysterious, but I think it has to do with the amount of friendship six ponies can have. If the age group varied more, or if there were more stallions in the group, they wouldn't be able to relate as well, thus weakening the power of friendship. Well, at least that's my own take. Wow, this video was all over the place. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this one, so leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof. Hello and welcome to episode 10 of Dear Princess Celestia, the show where I take an episode and analyze its moral. Today's episode, or episodes, a Canterlot wedding. Dear Princess Celestia, When Twilight first heard that her brother was getting married, she was very upset because she wasn't told this in person. She got the idea that Shining Armor didn't view her as important anymore. Twilight felt distanced and angry, when really her assumptions weren't true at all. Shining put her concerns to rest by explaining how busy he was protecting Carolot and such. Moral number one, don't assume the worst about people. Twilight found out that Shining had a valid reason for not directly telling her the news, and shouldn't have jumped to the conclusion that something had happened to their relationship. Now there is a balance to this. While you shouldn't necessarily assume the worst, don't assume the best either. Here's what I mean. Twilight knew something was up about Cadence. She was acting super fishy and didn't even recognize Twilight. This was a pretty big red flag, but literally every other person bought into the lies. Chrysalis even had Celestia convinced. I'm not saying Twilight assuming the worst about Cadence was good, but she's the only one who thought critically about the scenario. So don't assume the worst, but don't be blind to what's going on. Next, let's look at the accusation scene. This scene was, in my opinion, the most emotional scene in the entire show. Viewing this for the first time, the audience didn't know if Twilight's claims were right or wrong. But both ways, we all felt pretty horrible when Shining Armor was explaining all of Cadence's suspicious behavior. Watching Twilight get rejected by her closest brother, her friends, and her biggest idol was gut-wrenching. But directly afterwards, Twilight's suspicions were confirmed, showing her that Cadence was, after all, evil. 
But what if Chrysalis, in the form of Cadence, never banished Twilight? Would she have believed Shining Armor and given up? Or would she have been stubborn and stuck to the worst assumption? Unfortunately, we can never know. Twilight didn't have to choose, since Chrysalis made the truth quite obvious. And despite what Celestia said, Twilight never had the chance to persist in the face of doubt. It's all up for speculation, but I think she would have given up in fear of losing more friends. Speaking of losing friends, why were the other five so unsupportive in this two-parter? Twilight was so fixed on Cadence being evil and was full of concern for her brothers, but the others brushed these off as Twilight being overpossessive. While Twilight was certainly being overpossessive, her friends should have at least listened. They weren't taking Twilight's problems seriously. Whether they agreed with her or not doesn't matter, but they should have helped her out more supportively. Wait a second, this is sounding awfully familiar. Oh yeah, lesson zero. Similar to A Kennerlot Wedding Part 1, in Lesson Zero, Twilight was extremely concerned. The other five disregarded Twilight's problem. I mean, it was just a silly due date. It's true that there was nothing to be concerned about, but the other five noticed they should have taken her distress more seriously. After all, Twilight has been known to be mentally fragile at times. By the end, they even took responsibility for the disaster Twilight had caused. But we thought that the thing that she was worrying about wasn't worth worrying about. So when she ran off all worked up, not a single one of us tried to stop her. As Twilight's good friends, we should have taken her feelings seriously and been there for her. Now fast forward to the season finale. Twilight made a similar disaster, but this time, her friends were out. No support whatsoever. Um, friendship is magic? Yeah, this was a lesson they should have known by now. Always be there for your friends. While these guys didn't show a good example of the magic of friendship, Shining and Cadence did. Their friendship was the power that ultimately saved Equestria, even when Celestia's power didn't compare. So yeah, friendship is magic. What did you guys think about this two-parter and its morals? Also, which episode should I analyze next? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof. It's that time of year again, and I was just thinking about love. More specifically, the love between Shining Armor and Princess Cadence. That love explosion that got rid of the changelings was pretty powerful. But is the magic of love the same thing as the magic of friendship? In my last video, I stated that love is basically friendship on steroids. That is to say, love and friendship are the same, except love is stronger. After all, Cadence and Shining do share a strong friendship. In the comments, Aiden Ratnage begged to differ. He made the point that Twilight is the princess of friendship, and Cadence is the princess of love. And if love really was friendship, then you would have two princesses of friendship, and that would be pointless. So this magic and this magic are very different. Love is not friendship on steroids. Okay, so I was wrong, but surely I'm not making this video just to correct that mistake. Aiden helped me to realize something else. Instead of both Cadence and Twilight being the Princess of Friendship, what if both of them were the Princesses of Love? But wouldn't that just cause the same problem? No, because they would be Princesses of two different types of love. In the English language, we only have one word for love, and that word is, well, love. However, in Greek, there are many words that specify different kinds of love. Twilight would be philia, or philia. And get it, because philly, like a, like a small pony, <sighs> Never mind. Anyway, philia is love between friends or equals, a totally platonic affection. The main six love each other, but not in a romantic way. Speaking of romance, Cadence of course represents passionate love. She's the princess of the second type, Eros, which is more intimate. The explosion that got rid of the changelings was fueled by the romantic love between Cadence and Shining. But we also have an example from long before, back when Cadence used to babysit Twilight. The love Cadence is known for is obviously a romantic love. Now what about the other two princesses? Celestia and Luna have always been known to be the princess of the day and the princess of the night. But here's what I figured out after reading Aiden's comment. Each of the four princesses represents a different type of love. The Greek language has four main words for love, and Equestria has four princesses. Since we've already discussed Philia and Eros, let's talk about the third kind of love, Agape. Agape most frequently describes the love God has for man. I'm not saying Celestia is a deity, but the position of authority she has and her affection of those she rules make Celestia a good representation of Agape. Plus, Agape is known to be unconditional, loving even when you get nothing in return. I'm sure Celestia has put countless hours into the well-being of Equestria, even when no one will recognize it. 
That leaves us with one princess and one type of love left. Storge. Yeah, that's definitely not how you pronounce that. Um, Storge? Storge? I'll just go with Storge. Storge is love, especially between parents and children. But Luna doesn't have any children as far as we know. While this may be true, look at the role she plays in the dreams of others. She serves as a mentor to those going through a difficult time or facing a hard decision. Because the guidance she gives is so one-on-one, -on -one, I might even call this a motherly relationship, where Luna shows her love for ponies by helping them in their dreams. So yeah, the four princesses represent the four main types of love. For the most part, the parallels are striking, but what do you guys think? Is this just a coincidence, or was this planned? Leave your thoughts in the comments. If this was planned, then friendship is only a small part of the show's focus. Instead of friendship is magic, perhaps love is magic would be a better title. Instead of doing an analysis video next week, I'm planning on posting a new remix. Since Valentine's Day is coming up pretty soon, I thought it'd be appropriate to remix this day aria. And this one is by far the heaviest remix I've ever written, so stay tuned for that. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. We've all heard of the elements of harmony, but is it possible that the elements of disharmony exist as well? Friends. Joining me today is Canned Cream. Or CC for short. Now, you've talked about the elements of disharmony before, haven't you? Um, I remember getting ready to talk about them, then I ended up taking a wrench upside the head and getting locked in a closet by an evil twin I created by drinking distilled water from the mirror pond. Uh, yeah, it's a long story. Okay, I think I remember now. I guess I should bring you up to speed. Basically, your evil twin, what's his name? Loathing. Right, Loathing decided that if the elements of disharmony existed, these would be the bearers. The element of cruelty would be Diamond Tiara, the element of selfishness would be Blue Blood, the element of deceit would be shared by Flame and Flam, the element of betrayal, Spitfire, the element of gloom, Mod Pie, and the element of evil magic would be Sunset Shimmer. But these were all theoretical judgments. If the elements of disharmony existed, those would be the bearers. But here's my proposition. The elements of disharmony do exist in Equestria. They do? That seems a bit far-fetched. Wouldn't we have already seen or heard of them if they had? I, I mean, don't get me wrong, Equestria is a cornucopia of magical whatevers, but what makes you think that something like that could be real? What if I told you we have seen an element of disharmony? Since their first appearance, the elements of harmony have been depicted by crystals. Crystal. In the pilot episode, five out of six of the crystals had transformed into necklaces. What have we seen similar to those necklaces? The Alicorn Amulet. You mean the one that Trixie bought? The one that made her go cuckoo crazy banana bonkers? You think that was one of the supposed anti-elements? Sure. Why? Just look at what the Alicorn Amulet did to Trixie. Before, she was only capable of a few tricks, but after adorning the amulet, she could do things that were beyond even Twilight's level. Her magical ability went through the roof. Plus, it closely matches the description of the actual elements, the necklace with the crystal in the center. I think it would make a good element of evil magic. Well, okay, yeah, it did amplify Trixie's power in the same way that Twilight's amps up her own whenever she needs to bring the hammer of friendship down upon some villain's head, but I question if that by itself really means anything. After all, there was only the one amulet where there are six elements of harmony. Wouldn't Trixie have needed to buy, like, five more of those buggers for her own to work? There is no way that rock farming pays that well. Ah, but that's the beauty of disharmony. Did I really just say that? Anyway, while the elements of harmony depend on the magic of friendship, the elements of disharmony would have no reason to follow the same rules. Harmony has no part in these elements, hence the name, so they can be used individually. Well, in that context, yeah, that could work. And if we are talking about elements that are the exact opposite of the main six, then it's possible that everything about them would be opposite, including being stronger when kept apart than used together. But this is only one example though, that still leaves at least five other gems unaccounted for. If this is really possible, then there's gotta be something else we can point to, right? I mean, think of all the items that have either been enchanted or created with dark and negative magic in this show. There's Trixie's amulet, Rarity's book, the siren's necklaces, even Twilight's own element turned Sunset Shimmer into a raging she-demon. Her words, not mine. If nothing else, we are at least seeing the capacity for something like that to exist. But that begs the question, why would they be a thing in the first place? Are you familiar with the old Jedi Order? Of course! May the Force beam you up, Katniss! Didn't, uh, Gandalf say that? 
Um, something tells me you aren't so familiar with it then. Basically, it goes like this. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, yes, even before the events of The Phantom Menace, a group of people settled on a planet called Tython to discuss and explore a mysterious force, the Force. These people became known as the Jedi Order, not spelled like that, well, at least not yet. This group believed in a balance between the light side and the dark side of the Force, Ashla and Bogan. K2, one of the greatest members of this order, said it like this, In the light, there is a darkness, and in the darkness, a light. It is the way with us all. Be a prisoner of neither Bogan or Ashla. Strive to live in balance. This balance was considered a fundamental truth of the Force. Notice that the Jedi Order never actually wanted to get rid of the evil or the dark side. Nerd. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyway, then how come I remember the Jedi being so very anti-dark side? What changed, and what does this have to do with MLP? I I'll get to that. Tython served as a center of philosophy and study for thousands of years. Anyone who focused too much on one side of the Force was exiled and forced to meditate on the opposite side until there was balance. However, the system didn't last forever. More and more lost their balance, and tensions between supporters of both sides arose. This started a 10-year conflict called the Force Wars. It was a gruesome war between supporters of Ashla and supporters of Bogan, but ultimately, the dark side lost. The members of the Jedi Order that supported the light side totally abandoned the idea of balance, and they became known as the Jedi. Dark side supporters hadn't given up though, oh no, the real battle between good and evil had just begun. Or should I say, Bogan. Get, get it? Because- Yes, I get it. But I still don't see what this has to do with the elements of disharmony. In most movies, the good guys always win. This notion of good always prevailing is especially evident in Friendship is Magic. Even when the villain seems to have the upper hand, in the last second something happens and Pony kind is saved once again. Of course, the princess would want nothing but good. But what if at one point, both sets of elements were seen through equal light? No person favoring one or the other, but believing in a balance similar to the balance between Ashla and Bogan. And what you're saying is that there was a similar war where harmony and disharmony collided and the pony light side won. Exactly. So this could explain why we haven't seen or heard anything about the elements of disharmony directly, but have instead seen several hints at items and relics that are clearly fused with dark magic. They could be thought of as relics from some long ago ultimate good versus ultimate evil war. That very well may be. Also, the Harmony supporting ponies that won the war would try their best to cover up the existence of the elements of disharmony, perhaps even going to the extent of destroying them. Under this lens, the Alicorn Amulet was just the element of disharmony that happened to survive. And who knows how many more element-like relics have yet to show up. Well, with Season 5 looking like it's gonna take the main six all across Equestria, and maybe even beyond, there's certainly the opportunity to uncover all kinds of evil doodads and trinkets. Enough of the stuff has filtered its way into Ponyville that it's hard to believe there's not more of them out there, somewhere. You know, thinking about it, the idea certainly seems possible. After all, we've seen several instances of dark magic infused items that are akin to the elements, but at the same time, I wouldn't say there's enough evidence to call the idea anything more than a theory. A plausible theory for sure, but still only a theory. I guess you're right, but really only time can tell. Well, it's been a pleasure discussing this idea with you, Cece. Thank you for your input. No problem, Bian. And thank you for giving the good ponies of Equestria something new to fear. No problem. This is the Brony Notion signing out until next Wednesday. And this is Can Cream saying, as always, Stay pony, my friends. Bro hoof. They're both Pegasi, both have the same main style with different colors all throughout, they have similar personalities, and even their eyes are identical down to the eyelashes. The resemblance between Rainbow Dash and Daring Do is striking, but my question is, why do they look so similar? <laughs> Daring Dew is basically a recolor of Rainbow Dash. The only big differences between the two are their cutie marks and their color palettes. It's obvious that the character Daring Dew was modeled after Rainbow Dash, but it's pretty uncanny that they would look so similar. I mean, what are the chances? There's gotta be some connection. Perhaps Daring Dew, aka AK Yearling, was inspired by Rainbow Dash and modeled herself accordingly. 
Well, this doesn't work, because if Rainbow Dash was an inspiration to her, Yearling probably wouldn't have avoided her like she did. And we know for a fact that Rainbow Dash didn't get her style from Daring Do. She wouldn't even pick up a Daring Do book before Season 2. Even if the similarities were a matter of inspiration, that still wouldn't account for their personalities, their eyes, and wings. I had this theory that explains this problem very well. Keyword, had. Not long after I had figured out the details, the theory was busted. But I might as well tell you what it was. In this theory, the character of Daring Do doesn't actually look like this. As Rainbow Dash was reading the Sapphire Stone, she simply imagined herself as the protagonist, with slight changes. It's definitely not a stretch for Rainbow Dash to assume the hero is just like herself. So when Twilight read the book, she would imagine a totally different Daring Do. Right off the bat, you're probably thinking about the events of Daring Don't. If Daring Do was just how Rainbow Dash imagined her, then why does she look the same in person? Well, who says the events of Daring Don't actually happened? Bear with me here. In this theory, Daring Don't was just a daydream. Rainbow Dash imagining herself into the world of Daring Do. A fanfiction, if you will. Now, as crazy as this theory sounds, it would explain more than just why the two look alike. First of all, this could be why no other pony drew this connection, even when Daring Do and Rainbow Dash were right next to each other. But mainly this. Look at the Season 4 episode, Tragia. This theory would also explain why Rainbow Dash was so desperate to get her signed first edition copy of the Sapphire Statue. Wait, wasn't it just called the Sapphire Stone? Ah, uh, never mind. Anyway, if Rainbow Dash was friends with the celebrity in question, then why would she be so desperate over a signed item if she could just take a regular first edition of the book and have it signed personally? In Traja, it's as if the events of Daring Do never actually happened, even though chronologically it took place after. You see how this solves the problem? Well, I'm about to drop the bomb that crushes this theory to pieces. The Daring Do book covers. So Daring Do's appearance is canon, even if you ignore Daring Don't. Well, um, what else could explain why they look so similar? Clones, changelings, an alternate universe? Perhaps they were long-lost twins, separated at birth. I don't know. Honestly, I got nothing. Unless the covers of the books are somehow made of psychic paper, which I find hard to believe, it looks like we're back where we started. But that's the great thing about this community. While I have no ideas as to why this could be, someone watching this video might have a sound explanation. So tell me in the comments your ideas, and maybe we can figure something out. I'm looking forward to reading what you guys have to say. Until then, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof. So if a cutie mark shows what makes you special, then what's this? I'm sure this crisscross design isn't what makes Trenderhoof special, and I don't think it could be his destiny or his special talent. So to find out what this and other cutie marks mean, let's analyze some cutie marks. <laughs> This can be considered a part 3 to the Analyzing Cutie Marks videos I did back in June, although the order you watch them in doesn't matter, so if you want to check them out later, links are in the description. Anyway, back to Trenderhoof. This pattern that's shown on his cutie mark can also be found on his jacket, close to where his elbows are. They aren't exactly on his elbows, but elbow patches are especially popular in the hipster community. I think his cutie mark highlights the hipster aspect in his character. After all, Trend is all about that lifestyle, appreciating fine art long before it becomes mainstream or mainstream. <laughs> Bad puns aside, Trenderhoof is a trendsetter, as his name would suggest. Rarity even talked about how he writes about things before they become cool. So basically, his cutie mark is his elbow patch, a symbol representing his inner hipster, and also a reference to that culture. At least that's my way of looking at it. Next up, we got Silver Shill from Leap of Faith. Now, there's two ways of looking at his cutie mark. It could either be a pair of glasses or two silver coins. Which one is it? Both. I think his cutie mark has a double meaning. We've seen Silver Shill acting, and the glasses would represent his disguises, but we've also seen him as a sales pony. Although he did both of these for the wrong reason and then realized his error, I think his talents are acting and selling. His name also confirms this. The word shill is used to describe someone who pretends to be a customer to encourage participation. That describes what he did to the letter. But also, Silver Shill could be a reference to the shilling, an old currency, so it really works both ways. Speaking of key characters, let's analyze Cheese Sandwich's cutie mark. Cheese's cutie mark isn't literal. Even if he was awesome at grilling cheese sandwiches, which I'm sure he might be, there's more meaning to his cutie mark than that. Cheese is, well, funny. 
I don't know how else to say it, but there's always been this comical side to cheese for whatever reason. The cheese sandwich as a symbol could definitely represent lightheartedness and joy, but there's another aspect to his cutie mark. The black lines on the bread are actually part of the keyboard of an accordion. The gooey cheese in between represents the bellows of the accordion. Although they showed his cutie mark moving like an accordion at the beginning of Pinkie Pride, I didn't even notice this until the second time around. Now obviously the accordion represents his musical side. Cheese can be seen playing it during some of his songs, but it's also a reference to Cheese's voice actor, Weird Al Yankovic. Weird Al, along with his parodies, is known for the polka genre. You'll find that almost everything about Cheese Sandwich was modeled after Weird Al. Finally, let's talk about Sunset Shimmer's cutie mark. Now, what we have here seems to be a sun with a yin-yang shape in the center. The fiery yellow and red sun matches with her name. They're the colors of Sunset, Sunset Shimmer. But a yin-yang symbol there just wouldn't make sense. Although she used to be evil and converted to good, there's not the slightest hint of light and darkness or darkness in light. There's a clear line between evil Sunset and reformed Sunset. Is her cutie mark wrong then? No. The center of her kitty mark has the shape of a yin yang symbol, but it's missing something crucial the dots on each side. That's the entire point of the yin yang symbol that there's a balance, some good and evil, and some evil and good, which, despite a certain Star Wars rant, is not a belief of the show. So, no, her kitty mark just displays her transition from evil to good, not a balance. Now, as for why her cutie mark is a sun, well, the best I could come up with is the fact that she wanted to overthrow Celestia, setting the sun. But obviously, that's not part of her character anymore. So, what do you guys think? All of these are up for interpretation, so leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof! What does Trixie's cutie mark represent? Communism. Spike is not like other dragons. I mean, he was after all raised by ponies, but mannerisms aside, Spike is the only dragon we've seen that doesn't have wings. Kinda makes you wonder, what is it that makes Spike so different? Let's start with what we know about dragons. Early on in the series, in the episode Dragon Shy, the dragon we saw was reclusive and slept in a cave with a horde of jewels. And in Owl's World That Ends Well, we have a similar dragon doing the same thing. From the Season 2 episode Dragon Quest, we know that all dragons take part in a great migration, even the two dragons previously mentioned. According to Twilight, this migration only occurs once every generation, presumably a pony generation. So the life of an adult dragon is very simple. Hibernate, migrate, repeat. But what I find interesting is the maturing years. Enter Secret of My Excess. Basically, Spike gets really greedy on his birthday and grows super huge. Sakura revealed to us that this is how dragons grow, through their greed. It's only a natural part of a dragon's life. This makes it crystal clear why Spike didn't grow until that episode and hasn't regrown since. Being the most selfless dragon in Equestria, he was never exposed to enough dragon greed. This episode also showed us how the process of maturing works. Generally speaking, the larger the dragon, the lower the intelligence. The bigger Spike grew, the more animalistic he became. All that was in his character was replaced with dragon instinct. This explains why the teenagers are chatty, but the large dragons never say a word. Well, they do make the occasional dumb remark, but that's probably all they're capable of. It's also worth mentioning how Spike gathered a horde of stuff and stored it all in a cave. Because of this, we can assume that this activity comes as an instinct to dragons. Moving on to his wings, or lack thereof. No one really knows why Spike doesn't have wings. Possibly wings don't appear on dragons until later in development. I mean, we've never actually seen another baby dragon, so what's to say that all other baby dragons don't have wings? Well, this seems unlikely, because even after Spike had fully grown, he still didn't have wings. Some have theorized that Spike is a different type of dragon altogether, but I don't believe this is the case either. I believe Spike is the same type of dragon as the rest, but something happened to him that never happened to the other dragons. Let's look at the first time we ever saw Spike. In Cutie Mark Chronicles, Spike was still in his shell when the egg was presented to Twilight. It was Twilight's task to open the egg with her magic. You guys know the story. She tried and failed, but suddenly, Sonic Rain Boom. Twilight's raw abilities went haywire. Not only did she turn her parents into plants, but she casted some sort of age spell on Spike, causing him to grow into a massive, not so fierce, dragon. Soon after, the spell wore off. I think Spike was on course to develop wings, but was then interrupted by Twilight's spell, and even after shrinking back, he never ended up growing them. No other dragon was ever filled with that much magic. Looking back at the secret of my excess, that magic exposure may also be why Spike grew at such an incredible rate. The other dragons seemed to develop much slower. 
Finally, I want to talk about dragon magic. More specifically, I want to talk about Spike's system of sending and receiving messages. Some people assume that Spike is the only dragon capable of fire mail, but who says that ability is unique to Spike? True, we've never seen any of the other dragons belch out a message, but I can imagine being able to send messages between dragons would definitely come in handy. This may or may not be. It's possible that Spike is the only one capable of fire mail. If he is, then maybe the extra magic he was exposed to is the cause. Or what if Spike's ability was given to him by Celestia, as a way for her to communicate with Twilight? What do you guys think? Is fire mail exclusive to Spike? If so, why only him? Be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof. So last week we talked about some physical aspects of good old Spike the Dragon, but what I find interesting is his character. Seriously, being raised by ponies isn't something every dragon experiences. <laughs> Let me start by saying Spike is a pony. N not like a literal pony, of course, but the way he thinks and acts is very similar to the ways ponies think and act. The only thing that really sets him apart is the fact that he's physically a dragon. Unlike other dragons, Spike is very gentle and kind. In Dragon Quest, he finally realized just how different he was. Spike's entire life was a mystery, even to Twilight, and thus Spike left on a journey of self-discovery. What did he learn? Well, he learned that dragons are jerks, and that his pony friends taught him to be kind and loyal. But that didn't really solve any of his identity problems. Spike still doesn't know who his parents are. Even though Spike came to the conclusion that his physical identity doesn't define his character, that's not the information he was looking for. I think Spike continued to struggle with his identity even after that episode. Looking back, this is probably what inspired him to create his Spike the Dragon Code, which was mentioned for the first time about a season later. The code states that if anyone saves his life, he owes them a life debt and must serve them forever. How Spike views his code is very telling. Please, Applejack, my dragon code is a part of me. I have to be true to myself. If you don't let me do this, I won't be a noble dragon anymore. The actual code looks like a crudely drawn image of Spike with a couple chicken scratches. Why would he do something so drastic as giving up living with Twilight over a silly rule that he probably made up? For my own interpretation, the reason why this code was such a big deal to Spike is that it's the closest answer he can get to the who am I question. Since he doesn't want to be like a normal dragon, but he knows he can't actually be a pony, his dragon code tries to redefine what a dragon is. The truth of the matter is that he's stuck between two identities, having the character of a pony, but the body of a dragon. As a pony in a dragon's body, Spike is required to lay aside his dragonness. The growing he did in The Secret of My Excess was what dragons are supposed to do. By conforming to the norms of pony culture, Spike has to deny his very biology. Think about it, Spike will always be a baby dragon. Unless, of course, he reverts back into greed. But if he doesn't, he'll never physically mature. These are the hardships Spike may never find a cure for. I mean, Twilight could turn him into a pony. We've seen her change six ponies into breezies at the same time. So turning Spike into a pony would be a piece of cake. But then Spike would have to give up his dragonness altogether. I find it fascinating how much Spike's image means to him. Not just in Spike at your service or Dragon Quest. Look at how important Spike's position of number one assistant was to him. I feel like official helper of Twilight was one of those things Spike defined himself by. When Owlicious entered the scene, Spike was so paranoid about getting replaced, he went to the extreme of making a mess and framing Owlicious. Spike makes it more than obvious that his position is important to him. His fear of being useless can also be seen in Power Ponies. The idea of only being good for comic relief puts Spike in a funk. I think his identity to himself and to others is a crutch to help him cope with his predicament. You could parallel Spike's problem with Discord's problem. Discord isn't allowed to be himself. He has to hold back the freedom and the chaos that defines him. A failure to do so results in disaster. If Spike doesn't hold back his greed, which is a huge part of a normal dragon's life, things will also end in disaster. Although the other implications are definitely extreme, perhaps being turned into a pony would be better for Spike. Besides, if he did become a pony, he would actually be on Rarity's level for once. What do you guys think? What's the easiest solution to Spike's problem? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof.
Many of the characters in Canterlot High wear the cutie marks of their pony equivalent somewhere on their clothes. But as far as we know, humans don't have cutie marks. So how do they know what their cutie marks look like? <laughs> Now, I have a couple theories that try to explain why humans and Equestria Girls wear the same symbols that appear on their pony counterparts. Theory one is that humans actually do have kitty marks, but we just haven't seen them because, well, humans don't exactly go around naked like ponies do. Because this magically appearing tattoo holds a special significance to that human, many would wear it on their clothes. It's worth mentioning that the Cutie Mark Crusaders don't wear any specific symbols, while others their age do, like Snips and Snails. This lines up with the alternate world, where those three haven't found their symbols yet. The first library scene adds some more credibility. The three play the exact same song from the Showstoppers. It's really uncanny how the song would be so similar, considering the fact that the original song was written about the three looking for their Cutie Marks. Maybe Cutie Marks are a thing in the human world too. Here's my next theory. What if human cutie marks appeared on their clothes instead of their skin? The only real piece of evidence I could use to back this one is the fact that Twilight's clothes had her cutie mark on them. And it's not like that skirt was picked by Twilight either. Her clothes just magically appeared on her upon her entrance through the portal. The downside to this theory is, well, not every human has their cutie mark on their clothing. At least not notably. Here's my third theory. Perhaps the worlds are more connected than we thought. Other than the obvious connections, the portal and Sunset Shimmer's book, we have Pinkie Pie. In Equestria Girls on both sides of the portal, Pinkie knew exactly what was going on on the other side. I mean, we are talking about Pinkie Pie here. It shouldn't be that surprising, but I think the two Pinkie Pies are connected somehow. Just a hunch. It's possible that ponies see bits and pieces of their human counterpart's life in the other world, and vice versa. I don't think they'd be able to remember their dreams though. Pinky would just be an exception, although isn't she always? In this theory, choosing to wear the symbols they see in their dreams would be more of a subconscious thing. If you were to ask Rainbow Dash why she wore that cloud with a bolt, she might say something along the lines of, I don't know, it just seemed fitting. This would be similar to how dolphins are significant to Sapphire Shores, because she sees them in her dreams, even though Sapphire Shores is a blank flank. Interestingly enough, the different world adds some problems to the idea of every human having the same cutie mark as their pony equivalent. I'll use Rainbow Dash as an example again. I don't think human Rainbow Dash will ever clear the clouds or do a sonic rain boom, so her cutie mark doesn't really match with her character in the same way it does for our Rainbow Dash. An even better example would be Twilight. Human Twilight has never met the human main six, and she certainly isn't a princess of friendship. It would make even less sense for original human Twilight to have the same cutie mark as Pony Twilight. I've mentioned in a previous video that if original human Twilight went through the portal, she would be a unicorn, because she never had the chance to master the magic of friendship and become an alicorn. Perhaps her cutie mark would be different too, maybe like a book or something. The thing is, we haven't seen Twilight's cutie mark on original human Twilight, so maybe Hasbro caught on to this. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Brohoof. Sure would love a scratch behind the old ears. Gah. Rainbow Dash cut a triangle in the grass. Illuminati confirmed. Sapphire Shore's headdress has an eye on it. Illuminati confirmed. There's a triangle on Flynn and Flam's display. Illuminati confirmed. Ugh, I'm sick of these Illuminati jokes. I mean, I'm guilty too, but seriously, these have gotten really old. But what if I told you there was actual Illuminati symbolism in MLP? <laughs>
How could this be intentional? This couldn't have been planned. Well, consider this. Many believe the upside down pentagram has the ability to attract evil forces. And what do we see in the middle? Twilight Sparkle. Sure, she appears innocent. I mean, she is after all a unicorn, but don't let that fool you. Here's where the Illuminati comes in. Ever since the Illuminati was founded in 1776, each member can be traced back to 13 distinct bloodlines. The 13th bloodline is rumored to be where the Antichrist will rise from, and the symbol used to represent this bloodline is the Unicorn. Not just in this instance, but centuries beforehand, the Unicorn was used as a sign of the Antichrist. Don't forget that the spell that made this pentagram in the first place ended up turning said Unicorn into a princess. Afterwards, Twilight wasn't a unicorn at all, but an alicorn is really just a unicorn with wings. So as a symbol, the alicorn is a more powerful antichrist. So this is Twilight's destiny being fulfilled. The rise of the antichrist. Now the question is, who would put this in the show? Surely not Lauren Faust? Think again. Interestingly, everything we've discussed all comes back to Lauren Faust, the one person who's had the most influence on Friendship is Magic. Names are extremely important. In a classic German legend, Faust is the name of the protagonist. Although he was highly successful, he still felt dissatisfied with life. It was on that fateful day that Faust made a pact with the devil, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. This legend inspired many interpretations of the same basic story. The term Faustian came to describe a person who made a deal with the devil. This may explain why Friendship is Magic was met with such success, drawing in not only the intended age group, but also an older demographic. Perhaps a deal was made in the dark. Lauren Faust? More like Lauren Faustian. It's here that we have our final clue. Look at the name itself. Not just her name, but the letters. L is the twelfth letter of the alphabet, and F is the sixth. Because Lauren has two syllables, the twelve can be split into two sixes, creating the number of the beast. Six, six, six. Coincidence? <laughs> Absolutely. Don't tell me you actually believed any of that. My Little Pony being run by the Illuminati? Seriously? Look at the day this video was posted. Yep, happy April Fool's Day everyone, gotcha. But on a more serious note, I have some great news for you guys. In lots of my videos, especially the older ones, I've quickly flashed images of Nicolas Cage for a frame each. Why, you ask? Well, I worship this man. I even have a shrine to Nicolas Cage in my room. Because of this, I'm changing up the style of my channel. Out with the old, in with the new. My new OC was drawn by sketching ponies at DeviantArt. In fact, I'm no longer the Brony Notion at all. I am now the Nick Cage Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro -hoof. As far as two-parters go, Cutie Markless was awesome. Very awesome. Although apparently the official title is The Cutie Map. I don't know, at least they aren't misspelling Pinky again. Well, our long anticipated world building has finally arrived. We've been introduced to lore about Eastern Unicorns, one in particular named Mage Meadowbrook, who seems to be the Eastern equivalent to Starswell the Bearded. But what I found even more intriguing was another certain character. <laughs> Ah yes, Sunset Glimmer, I mean Starlight Shimmer. Glimmer. Starlight Glimmer. Ah, their names are really beginning to confuse me. What's next, Starbright Shiny? Anyway, Glimmer pretended to be on the same level as the others by applying pretty convincing makeup over her cutie mark. Although it should have been obvious that she never intended to be their equal. First of all, look at how colorful she is. While the other ponies had a dimmer hue, Starlight was as colorful as ever. Just look at her mane and tail. While the style is similar to the uniform style, she expresses her hair differently than any pony else. I use my hair to express myself. This very action was discouraged in the propaganda song. Plus her entire cottage was outside the equal sign, as if she held more importance. I mean, she was after all the founder of that town without a name, but all of her differences should have been a little fishy. It should not have been that much of a surprise when her cutie mark was revealed. Just saying. Now, I have another question. Who is Starlight Glimmer? We still don't know anything about her past. Where did she come from? Where did she go? Where did she come from, Cotton Eye Joe? Anyway, let's try to piece together what we know about Starlight. She made the connection between alicorns and princesses, so no doubt she's familiar with the other three. I'd even take it a step further and say she used to be Celestia's student. Why would I say that? We know that Starlight studied magic for years. She said so about her cutie mark spell. I studied that spell for years! Also, her cutie mark spell is pretty impressive. Even the most magical pony was surprised. I think Glimmer has more in common with Sunset Shimmer than just her name. I bet she was also a student of Princess Celestia. Perhaps she became power hungry and abandoned her studies.
abilities like Sunset did, seeking a way to use her talents to gain power. Some have even theorized that Sunset and Starlight are related, although I wouldn't think so. Although their names are strangely similar, lots of names seem to follow the same pattern. Something regarding an event in the sky, plus something shiny. So I don't think that really goes to show that they might be related. Now let's look at the cutie marks of these three ponies. While we can find meaning, all three cutie marks are abstract, not obvious like most others. For each of these ponies, magic is one of their special talents, so there's definitely a connection here. Not to mention at least two out of three were at one point Celestia's student. I believe all three of them, but we don't know for sure. It's funny how Celestia wasn't in this episode at all. If she was, she might have given us some insight. Finally, I want to talk about Starlight's plan, because it was about as ambiguous as her backstory. Did she really want all of Equestria to give up their cutie marks as she said? What would she even do with all those cutie marks? If she didn't believe in the philosophy herself, then what was her goal? Let's look at what happened during the cutie mark removing process. When the main six's cutie marks were taken away, they lost their special talents with them. Although here's something interesting, they still had magic to spare. Well, at least the other ponies in the town did. This is unlike the time T-Rex stole magic and their cutie marks with them. This time, only the part of their magic with their special talent was lost. So Glimmer had the special talents of over 100 ponies. Perhaps you these powers to become unstoppable was her goal. Remember how Glimmer said Twilight's cutie mark in particular was especially important to their cause? This is probably because if she gave herself the magic from Twilight's cutie mark, she would have gained Twilight's magical ability, essentially alicorn magic. Although maybe she was just seeking control, wanting more and more ponies to fall into the trap she set up. In this case, having Twilight's cutie mark is still useful, because she could use Twilight's example as a reason to join. I don't know, what will the future of Starlight Glimmer look like? I'd love to see her make a reappearance. What do you guys think? Be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next. What in the... Come to my channel, P.S. Turtle? Um, I guess I'll explore what this door is. Until then, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. Now what's a good way I can start this video? It's about Sakura, so maybe I can speak in rhymes. Let's see. <clears throat> it's Wednesday again, and I have an idea. Let's talk about a certain zebra. Not happening. How about this? I may not be Jewish, but I have a menorah. So let's talk about that zebra, Sakura. Now that's just stupid. You know what? Forget it. Just play the intro. <laughs>
So in this case, I'm talking about the similarities within the show, not in real life. From some of Twilight's lines, we know zebras aren't just a type of pony. So Zucora is definitely not a pony, but she has something that no other non-pony has, a cutie mark. While I have theorized in the past that this cutie mark isn't authentic, like maybe it's a traditional tattoo, now I'm leaning towards the other side. I bet zebras are so similar to earth ponies, they're also capable of having cutie marks. From my point of view, zebras are basically light gray earth ponies with dark gray stripes. Or would it be dark gray with light gray stripes? I don't know. Of course, those aren't the only differences. Look at her tail, for example, but I think they're close enough. Zakora's cutie mark itself is like a sun with a swirly design in the center. This probably represents her stirred bruise and her special talent for making remedies. My theory is that every zebra has a similar cutie mark made up of a striped design. But what do you guys think? How similar to ponies are zebras? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Now that we're talking about Zakora, I mentioned her in a theory I did last week with the Looney Turtle. So if you want to check that out, links are here and in the description. Until then, this is the Brony Notion signing out until next Wednesday. Bro hoof. So, um, what's the point of the Royal Guard? Do they actually serve a purpose? Other than basic tasks like delivering messages and such, they haven't seemed to help that much, especially in the field of protecting the princesses, which is kind of their main goal. Makes you wonder why there's so many of them in the first place. <laughs>you guys remember when Canned Cream visited my channel, right? Well, a couple weeks back, he posted a video about this very subject. Even though protecting the princesses is their one goal, every time some big danger arrives, they're practically useless. And he makes a good point. We have seen some real incompetence from these guards. CC also came up with the possibility that Celestia is so loyal to her subjects, she'd rather put herself in danger than risk even one of her guards. Yeah, it sounds self-defeating, but that would just go to show how dedicated she is to her people. I encourage you guys to check out his video. It's very insightful, but I want to take it a step further. What if the guards aren't supposed to do anything? Although they look daunting, maybe that's what they're meant to do. Stand there with the weapon and look powerful. Now you're probably asking why. It does look like these guards have little to no training at all, but if this is true, why would they be there in the first place? I mean, paying all those guards alone would cost a fortune, especially if they're paid to just stand there. Well, what if I told you the very fate of Equestria depended on those guards standing there? Maybe that's a little extreme. What I'm saying is, I think the Royal Guard is a form of propaganda. Basically, the guards are meant to make Canterlot look well protected. The condition of any nation's capital says a lot about that nation as a whole, and Equestria is no exception. Outside nations looking in would observe a massive, loyal army, trained and ready to fight to the death. As you can imagine, this would greatly discourage any invasion from taking place. On a domestic level, think about how having a Royal Guard improves the national image and national pride in the minds of Equestrian civilians. They would also feel more safe, knowing that if danger reared its ugly head in Equestria, there would be a force to counter it. In reality, their real source of protection actually comes down to the main six or the princesses, and Shining Armor that one time. Speaking of Shining Armor, the captain of said guards, if all this is true, what's his job? Making sure everyone looks especially fierce? That seems unlikely, given the amount of stress he was under in a Canterlot wedding. If the Royal Guard is just as Mickey Mouse as me and CC have made it out to be, then why would being their captain be such a time-consuming pain? So much that Shining Armor can't even tell his own sister about the wedding. While this definitely puts a damper on my theory, remember that Shining was also in charge of Canterlot's force field, which is actually as strong as it looks. Upon receiving that threat, not only would Celestia request an increase in their Scarecrow army, but she would make sure that there is an actual source of protection, which explains the force field. Now, I'm not saying the guard is totally useless, just look at the guards that are actually guarding, like for entrances and such. They were also put to good use in that search party for Celestia and Luna in the season 4 premiere, but for the most part, I'm pretty sure Celestia recruits more guards than necessary, just to make Equestria look stronger. Now, all that's cool, but the real question is, why do they all look the same? Now, before you go typing the animators got lazy or something along those lines, you're missing the point of overanalyzation. What if there was some sort of magical spell to make every member of the guard look like one of two basic models? Spare the extra wings and horns, of course. By applying this spell to a group of different looking stallions, what you get is a much more threatening, unified army. Uniformity has been used in our world to show unity and power. Part of it is subliminal, but what it all comes down to is mental warfare, using brains over brawn to prevent invasions. This makes Celestia look a lot less foolish and a a lot more genius, but who knows if I'm actually right. What do you guys think? Leave your thoughts in the comments! If you're wondering why this video was posted on a Thursday instead of a Wednesday, I announced earlier this week that my new uploading schedule would be Thursdays instead of Wednesdays. Reason being, Wednesdays weren't really working out in my schedule. Well, now you know. So, until next time, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Wednesday- Thursday. Signing out until next Thursday. Brohoof. 
something's not right about this. Alicorns. Today we're talking about rocks. Well, not really. They're like rocks, but shinier, I guess? Crystals. I'm talking about crystals. Rock crystals. Crystals and gems seem to be everywhere, especially underground. But I discovered something very intriguing about them. And when it comes to theories, this one's a gem. What? That was a good joke. I think it rocked. Oh, come on. Buenos dias, mis pony amigos. I am the Brony Notion, and apparently rock puns aren't funny. That makes me very sentimental. Yes, I know that one was from Mod, but I feel like you guys take me for granted. <laughs> yes, finally. Wait, how did I get on this tangent? I'm not even talking about rocks in the first place, unless crystals are considered rocks. Do I look like a geologist to you? Anyway, the theory goes like this. Crystals and gems are magical. Not just because they're sparkly and pretty. Here's my reasoning. Look at some of the magical objects we've seen in the series. Most obviously we have the Elements of Harmony, which are made up of six jewels. Next, there's the Alicorn Amulet, which has a jewel in the middle. From the Crystal Empire, we have the Crystal Heart. From Rainbow Rocks, we have the three gems owned by the Sirens. These three lived on the opposite side of the Crystal Mirror. You beginning to see a trend? Well, I think all gems are naturally magical. Of course, they don't all have the same level of power. Any random jewel wouldn't be capable of spreading love through an entire empire or giving ponies dark magic. But what can explain this difference? Why are some more powerful than others? In the same way that some materials are better at containing energy and heat, I think gems are good at storing magic. Let's say some ancient unicorn casts some of his magic into a gem. That enchanted gem might have powers similar to the ones we've mentioned previously. They would be like containers you could store types of magic in. This is how the siren's necklaces seem to function, absorbing all the magic from negative energy. It would definitely be interesting to find that the jewels of, say, the Elements of Harmony were just jewels that happened to hold a lot of magic. That's my headcanon regarding powerful gems. But like I said, I think that all gems, jewels, and crystals have some magic by default, even without being enchanted. Here's three reasons why. First off, the Crystal Empire. The Empire is full of a powerful magic. Celestia explained how the magical condition of the Crystal Empire will affect the magical condition of all of Equestria. If there's magic in gems, jewels, and crystals, an entire city made out of crystal would definitely be full of magic. And it is. Second reason is Rarity's ability to find gems. Rarity's gem finding spell can be deliberate or something she just feels. I wouldn't be surprised if her unicorn magic could sense the presence of magical items. Because under this lens gems are magical, Rarity's magic would have no problem finding them. My third reason is, well, dragons. Imagine that. This one is the least compelling, but this theory might explain why dragons love gems. Dragons, being the magical creatures that they are, would be inclined to eat things that increase their magic. I suppose ponies might do the same if they could stomach it. Yeah, how do dragons do it? Sapphire cupcakes may look delicious, but that's practically eating rocks. A baked bat if you ask me. Now there is something else. Oh yeah, the diamond dogs. For whatever reason, the diamond dogs are obsessed with gems. But why? I don't think it's a fashion statement, otherwise they wouldn't need so many jewels. They're already blinged up as they are. Perhaps they benefit magically from jewels, as I theorize dragons do. Maybe they eat them? It's also possible that they're just dumbly searching for anything pretty and shiny. What do you guys think? About the dogs and the gem theory? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Thursday. Bro hoof. I passed! Yes, and with flying colors too. Throughout four seasons of Friendship is Magic, getting your cutie mark has always been seen as good. It's the moment that adults remember fondly and fillies anticipate eagerly. Then comes along season five, where not one, not two, but three times the idea of getting a cutie mark is seen through negative light. And as of the posting of this video, only six episodes have been aired. This may be a coincidence, but maybe the writers are going somewhere with this. So in the cutie map, Starlight Glimmer introduced us to the strangest notion that cutie marks are bad. Later in that episode, it's revealed that the ponies in our town were basically brainwashed to believe Glimmer's propaganda. Those ponies were in fact happier with their cutie marks. Of course, the audience knew all along that having a cutie mark isn't a bad thing, right? Fast forward two episodes to Bloom and Gloom. Although Apple Bloom never actually got her cutie mark in this episode, in her dreams, cutie marks kept appearing on her that she didn't like. Here's the quote I'm going off of. Can you imagine getting stuck with a cutie mark you didn't like? No. Or at least I hadn't. Just like Apple Bloom, it had never occurred to me that a pony can get a cutie mark that they don't like. 
From Applejack's lullaby, we have the line, A cutie mark won't change you, no matter what you get. But is this true? Fast forward another two episodes to Appaloosa's Most Wanted. In this episode, getting his cutie mark was a major turning point in Troubleshoe's life. But unlike the story of other ponies, this affected him in a very negative way. After he got the upside down horseshoe cutie mark, he totally gave up his dream of being in the rodeo and accepted his depressing destiny. However, by the end, the cutie mark crusaders helped him to realize that his talent is entertainment, being a rodeo clown. But really? This conclusion was anything but satisfying. Troubleshoes always wanted a part in the rodeo, and while I suppose the clowns are technically part of the rodeo, the role is totally different from the role of an actual rodeo pony. It's the same as wanting to be a chef all your life and finally getting to work at a five-star restaurant, but as the janitor. I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks this wasn't what Trouble had in mind. It doesn't make that much sense either. You would think his cutie mark would have something to do with being a rodeo clown. The other clowns act clumsy for laughs, but for Trouble, it's genuine, as reflected by his cutie mark. His unluckiness is what makes him special, and apparently being a clutch in front of others is his special talent. What bothers me is that his talent isn't intentional. On that one performance that people found so hilarious, he wasn't even trying to be funny. It really feels like Troubleshoe's destiny as a rodeo clown was just another example of his bad luck. I might even say Trouble would be happier in the cutie markless society. No matter which way you cut it, Trouble Shoes has a rather unfortunate cutie mark. Applebloom's fear of getting a cutie mark she didn't like was set to rest, but now we know how valid her fear was. Getting a cutie mark that you don't like is very possible and even scary to think of. Now where am I going with this? I don't think the writers are going to readdress the question of whether or not a cutie mark is good, but I'm hoping for an episode that reveals Diamond Tiara's cutie mark story. Like I said, they seem to be going somewhere with this whole negative cutie mark thing. Just over a year ago, I posted a video analyzing Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon, sympathizing with them. The way I see it, these two aren't happy with their cutie marks, because their marks basically display how spoiled they are. I think the reason Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon pick on the Cutie Mark Crusaders is because they're jealous. The CMC can still be anything, while they're stuck with the symbols of their wealth. I would love to see especially Diamond Tiara open up to the Cutie Mark Crusaders about this. It may be that all of this is unintentional on the writer's part, but I guess we'll just wait and see. What do you guys think? Leave your thoughts in the comments, and if you haven't checked it out yet, two days ago I posted a remix of Find A Way for Magical Mystery Cure. Links are here and in the description. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Thursday. Bro hoof. Although it was deleted and re-uploaded two days later, on March 31st, Hasbro's YouTube channel posted an exclusive music video called My Past Is Not Today. It's about Sunset Shimmer and how she deals with her past since her reformation. It's a great song that I would love to remix if I could get my hands on the vocals, but one part in particular really got the theorists buzzing. It brought up the question, is it possible that Sunset Shimmer just became an alicorn? <laughs>Now, before I delve into this, I just want to get this issue out of the way. Is this music video canon? When it comes to canon, there are too many gray areas to know what's official and what's not. Heck, some people don't even consider the Equestria Girls movies to be canon. While the animations in My Past Is Not Today had a noticeably lower quality, I myself would consider anything done by Hasbro in this style canon. But again, I don't like getting into these arguments. With that said, in the final part of the song, Sunset was lifted into the air, and some sort of magical glow surrounded her. Then the magic around her formed wings and a tail. Because of the chorus, we know these are the wings and the tail of a phoenix. This of course is symbolic of Sunset Shimmer's rise from the ashes, but I can't help but feel like something else, something magical is going on here. Although the magic took form of a phoenix, what if that magic was the same magic that turned Twilight into an alicorn? Wildheart posted a video, link in the description, drawing these comparisons between Twilight's transformation into an alicorn and Shimmer's transformation into a phoenix. She pointed out the magical auroras that traveled around both of them, and the fact that they were both lifted up into the air, one seemingly by the sun and the other by Celestia, who represents the sun. Since Shimmer isn't a pony, she can't physically become an alicorn, but theoretically she can gain alicorn magic. Now, if Sunset Shimmer gained all of that alicorn magic on the spot, she wouldn't show those traits in the human world, but neither did Twilight when she arrived. I think that if Sunset were to go through the portal at that that point, she would come out the other side as an alicorn. Here's the question lots of you are probably asking. Why would we even need a fifth alicorn? Don't you think four is enough? In Wildheart's video, she came up with an idea on how Shimmer as the fifth alicorn princess could play her part. Sunset Shimmer alongside of Twilight could replace Luna and Celestia as rulers of Equestria. However, this is where our theories diverge. From what it seems, Sunset Shimmer doesn't plan on returning to Equestria anytime soon. Rather, it seems likely that she has a new role in the human world. If you'll recall, a while back I posted a video with a theory I think answers the question of why. My theory is that Sunset Shimmer will 
will replace Twilight in the other world as the sixth element of harmony. I suggested that Shimmer's element would be the element of friendship, which is basically an alternate element of magic, since friendship is magic. Friendship is what changed her from her past anyway. If the leader of the pony group has alicorn magic, it would only make sense that the leader of the human group would have alicorn magic as well, even if she can't show it physically. These two separately complete both sets of elements, which really ties up the magical loose ends and bonds both worlds together. The pony world and the human world both hinge on the magic of friendship. Now the all-important question, is Sunset Shimmer an alicorn? For now, it stands a theory, but the next time the Rainbooms play and Shimmer's rocking on the guitar or singing, she should sprout a pair of wings like Twy, Rainbow Dash, or Fluttershy. But if she doesn't, that's how we'll know if this theory is wrong. What do you guys think? Leave your thoughts in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Thursday. Bro hoof. Thank Lord Smooze. After nearly a 30 year vacation, the Smooze has returned, and thanks to Celestia, they didn't recycle the original design. The old one was downright horrifying, but the Smooze is not your regular blob of radioactive treasure eating goo. Somehow he's resistant to alicorn magic. Alicorn magic? Who knows what dark corner of some crazy dimension Discord pulled this guy out of? Actually, that's a really good question. Where did the Smooze come from? <laughs>
sense of Discord's nonsense. Yeah, I'm treading a skosh into over-analysis, but it's all fun to think about at the same time. What do you guys think? Is there any substance to these theories? Let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Thursday. Brohoof. Pretty much any adult pony with a horn is capable of basic levitation, or simple tasks. We've seen it several times in the show, their horn glows and the object of their manipulation glows as well. Using this magic is a very deliberate process, it's something that requires focus and attention. However, there's one aspect, one small detail concerning this in the show that confuses me. How does Tink's propeller work? It seems to run off of magic, like the type cast by a unicorn or an alicorn. But no one's actually there casting the spell. What type of magic is this? First, let's see what we can figure out using the color of the magical glow. Yellow is the color of Snail's magic aurora, but I think you'll agree he's not likely to be the source. Instead, let's look at another much more plausible candidate, Princess Celestia. Yes, the colors match, but we still have that initial problem. We've never seen magic used quite like this. A spell that can be used constantly, even when the horn of the pony casting the spell isn't lit. If anyone is capable of a spell like this, it would be Celestia. But still, it doesn't seem right. Looking at the actual mechanism of Tank's helicopter thing, it doesn't look like it's anything more than a fancy axle with a spinning propeller. The magic is probably just responsible for the circular motion, which is pretty simple. Because spinning over and over again isn't that complicated, perhaps it's possible to put that magic on a loop. If replaying the same spell was possible, then the spell would have to be cast just once until it either runs out or gets put out. Now there's another possibility that I think is actually better than the whole magic loop thingy. In Rainbow Rocks, the one part with actual ponies, Twilight built this crazy contraption to connect the worlds using magic from Sunset Shimmer's book. Her dimension spanning invention seemed to harvest the magic straight from the book and ran it through lots of complicated machinery. Especially where it forms like a belt, the magic had a resemblance of the glow that might form around one's horn. Note that this magic magic wasn't from a pony either, but from a book. It's possible that the axle from Tank's propeller is conducting that magic, like those bits from Twilight's doohickey. This means the magic doesn't necessarily have to be from a pony, but as for the actual source of Tank's magic, I'm not sure. Maybe it's drawn from the air? Or maybe it stores magic like a theorized gems do? I don't know. If you guys have any good ideas that might explain the source of Tank's propeller magic, be sure to leave it in the comments. All of this makes me wonder why the designers didn't just make a self-functioning magicless propeller for Tank. It's not like the technology doesn't exist in Equestria. We've seen plenty of other fairly advanced tech. This clash between technology and magic is something I've noticed a lot in the show. Magic seems to replace technology in many different functions in Equestrian life, but other times they use the same modern things we use. I would guess this is due to the fact that two-thirds of the population don't have magic to lean on like unicorns do, so technology is still advanced in many places. But I want to hear what you guys have to say. Don't forget to let me know. Well, the school year is finally wrapping up, and due to finals and other big tests coming up, I'll be taking a two-week break from posting videos. I won't be uploading on the 4th or the 11th of June. That said, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until June 18th. Brohoof. Wait a second. What if Tank's magic was from Snail's? Like I said, Snail's magical glow is yellow. Yellow has six letters, but you know what else does? Turtle. And what are turtles known for? Being slow, just like a snail. This is what his cutie mark really represents. Snower. Snail power. But there's one more thing. Another word that has six letters. Snazzy. DJ Snazzy Snails was Snail's stage name in the talent showcase from Rainbow Rocks. Now zoom into this picture. What do you see? Illuminati confirmed. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed my remix of Winter Wrap Up. Yeah, I know it's the middle of June, but hey, it's almost winter in the Southern Hemisphere. This is for you, Australia. Anyway, in this video, I want to establish a backstory behind my OC. My OC's name is Sawtooth, which is a type of sound wave that can be used in electronic music. And it also seems pretty fitting for a changeling. What, you didn't know my OC was a changeling? I thought he made it obvious. Now, I'm not saying I'm on her side, although that might be true. Be cool, it's just gonna have- Be cool, it's just gonna have- Be cool, it's just gonna- have a Heck, the transformation was in my old intro. Don't worry though, it's not like I'm evil. But wait a second, you're asking. Changelings can only copy the forms of others, so who's the original gray and orange pony? Well, in my headcanon, not only can changelings copy the forms of others, but they can also morph into any look they want. Pretending to be other people is just the best way to absorb love. But they aren't necessarily limited to ponies that exist. For whatever reason, maybe because he had a change in heart, Sawtooth didn't want to steal anyone's identity. He designed a pony form to match his personality so he wouldn't 
wouldn't draw so much attention. I like to imagine he learned electronic music from vinyl and continues to take lessons. As for why or how he ended up living in Ponyville, I don't know. But the idea of a civilized changeling isn't just possible, it's canon. Well, as of last Saturday's episode, that very well could have been Sawtooth. Speaking of that episode, wow, I have a lot to say about it. I've already written the script for this Thursday's video, and it's a good one, so once it's up, make sure you check it out. See you guys on Thursday. Episode 100 of Friendship is Magic? More like 22 minutes of shipping and fan service, cause let's be honest, that's exactly what it was. My thoughts on the overall episode? Well, I loved it. And hated it. It's complicated. The episode was all over the place. It was almost too much, and boy it was cheesy. The writers certainly went all out on this one. Although, the references and sheer hilarity definitely made it worthwhile. Because this episode was all over the place, there's more than enough to talk about. So let's get this party started. <laughs> I've just hit a milestone. This is my 100th video on this channel. I think it's pretty cool how my 100th video ended up being about the 100th episode. Perfect timing because both me and Friendship is Magic just took a two week break. Anyway, one of the redeeming qualities of this episode were all of those references, especially in the realm of a certain British sci-fi show. The closest thing we had to a Doctor Who reference before Slice of Life was the Breezy's episode, where the Doctor and Rose walked by. This is obviously a nod towards the 10th Doctor and his first companion, Rose Tyler. Also, notice the 3D glasses from Doomsday. That was cool and all, but last Last Saturday's episode put that to shame. Nerds everywhere lost all ability to even. We never did see what room all of that TARDISy stuff was in, but I'm hoping Ponyville has phone boxes. Bigger on the inside, anybody? All of the winks to Doctor Who were nothing short of awesome. The time travel reference, the scarf, Alon Z. Wait, the scarf is a fourth Doctor thing. Close enough. But there's another one that was a lot less noticeable. I lost track of time, unbelievably, and forgot that the wedding is this afternoon. Linear, non subjective viewpoint. It's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. And those are just the Doctor Who references. You got the Twilight Cane, Berry Punch, Lyra sitting like a human, Liquid Pride. So much in this episode that fans have wanted, but never thought they would actually get. In this episode, they didn't just acknowledge the fan base, but gave them everything they wanted on a silver platter. No matter which way you slice it, this is an episode we've all wanted for a long time. As a consequence, Slice of Life is, in my opinion, the absolute worst episode to start someone on. I was even confused and imagined a potential new fan. However, Slice of Life did do several things right, one of which was the sibling rivalry between Celestia and Luna. Before this point, it was really unrealistic how Celestia was either getting along perfectly with Luna or banishing her to the moon. No in-betweens. This mini-conflict really revealed the character of these two, that they aren't perfect goddesses and can act just like normal ponies. Another thing I appreciated was the limited role the main six played in this. It was nice to have the focus elsewhere for once. Now the third thing they did right, Secret Agent Sweetie Drops. I had to go deep cover here in Ponyville and assume the name Bon Bon. Now we know why her voice is always changing. Well, I didn't put those in my bag. Is she still here? We heard Fluttershy was here. That incredible, amazing doll. It's got rocks in it. Go ahead, try one of your jokes out on me. I laugh at everything. Yes, take that in continuity. She shouldn't have sounded so much like Pinkie Pie, though. Speaking of Pinkie, my favorite part of the entire episode was the scene with Gummy. What is life? Is it nothing more than the endless search for a cutie mark? That was the hardest I've ever laughed in an episode. What seems to be the dumbest creature in Ponyville is actually the most philosophically profound. The irony. Wait, has this been going on the entire series? Are we alone in this universe? Maybe there's more out there than merely planets and stars. Sometimes the greatest struggles yield the smallest reward. Is there a meaning to life, or are we simply bound by the chains of our existence? Does this mean he could have made Pinky's cake in the Griffinstone episode? Nah. Now I want to talk about the most fabulous sea monster in Equestria, Steven Magnet. That wasn't his canon name in the pilot, but rather was Van Given and later implemented into merchandise. It's nice seeing him after 99 episodes, but his act of generosity to Cranky wasn't just a nod to Rarity's act of generosity towards him. It was an example of the philosophy shown in Rarity Takes Manhattan. Generosity inspires generosity. I thought it was really clever of the writers to put that in there. Now there's one reference in this episode that seems strange to me. In the wedding ceremony, there was a lone changeling, their first appearance since a Canterlot wedding. I was surprised by the seemingly random appearance until I remembered. Love. Changelings are powered by love, so if a civilized changeling did live in Ponyville, you can bet that they would attend a wedding. There was definitely an emphasis on love in this episode. Remember the flameless fireworks at the end? They ran off of love. In her speech, Mayor Mayor talked about how the love and friendship towards Cranky Matilda brought such a diverse group of ponies together. She went on to say how it's these friends that make their life so rich. And now that I'm thinking about it, I get the feeling this is the writer's message to us. Friendship is Magic brought such a large variety of people together, just like how love for the two donkeys brought that group 
group together. And similar to how all their friends enriched Cranky and Matilda's lives, all fans of MLP enriched the whole franchise. Ask anyone, My Little Pony would not be the same without the fandom. This is why there were so many references to things the fanbase made popular. The entire episode is one massive thank you to us for making the community what it is. The episode may have been corny, loosely organized, and situationally bizarre, but I think we can all appreciate its message. So what did you guys think about this episode? I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Thursday. Brohoof. Ah, what was the name of that monster that attacked Ponyville? Grizzly Bee? No, ah, this is gonna bug me. I can't bear it. Um, Insect Teddy. Yeah, that's what it was. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I remember how popular my last poll was. It had over 200 comments within the first hour, which is a lot, especially back then. I want to do more interactive things on this channel, so today I'm asking you, who is best background poem? Now this is a question I've been wanting to ask for a while, and since Slice of Life just recently aired, now is the best time. While before we could only depend on fan interpretations and headcanons, now we have official stuff to go off of. To clarify, when I say background pony, I'm talking about the background six. These are the characters that were primarily expanded upon in Slice of Life. The contestants are DJ Pony, or Final Scratch, Dr. Hooves, Derpy, Octavia, Bon Bon, I mean Special Agent Sweetie Drops, and Lyra. I acknowledge that there are other background ponies in the show which aren't on this list, but a poll by nature can't be open-ended. These are just the six most significant, so leave your personal favorite of these in the comments. I'll count up the results and post them in a later video. If you're wondering who my personal favorite is, I'm not going to give my own answer until I post the rest of the results. I wouldn't want to bias the outcome. With that said, comment away. I'm going to take the rest of this video to touch on two points I missed in last week's video. First of all, the changeling. I theorized how the random changeling during that wedding scene might have been there to benefit from the widely available love. It was, after all, a wedding. If a civilized changeling did live in Ponyville, of course they would show up. But this probably isn't what's going on here. Remember, changelings don't exactly have the best reputation. After... Yeah, that. It wouldn't make sense for a changeling to walk into a public place without changing forms. And even though the invasion happened in Camelot, the princesses were in the same room. At least they would have noticed if he was just some random changeling off the streets. This would lead me to believe he had some special permission, perhaps even from the princess herself, to join the wedding. As suspicious as it would be, I'm sure Celestia would allow a changeling guest, with caution of course. Because changelings aren't that well trusted, his ability to change forms might have been temporarily suspended in order to avoid confusion during his stay. We know the technology is possible from the Equestria Games episode. In the comments of my last video, Can Cream brought to my attention the possibility that the changeling was one of Cranky's friends that he encountered on his search for Matilda. That would definitely explain why he was at Cranky's wedding. CC said the love there would just be an extra benefit. Possibly that changeling will become significant in a later episode. I hope so, not to pat myself on the back, but changelings are pretty cool. Now back to Cranky. We can assume his adventures around a Equestria were also what led him to meet Stephen Magnet as well. I like the idea that during his search for Matilda, Cranky had a series of adventures around Equestria that resulted in him making friends with changelings and sea monsters alike. Perhaps Cranky will have some knowledge that will help the main six in a future world building episode. Next, I want to talk about magic. A couple weeks back, I briefly discussed the relationship between magic and science in the show. I didn't think this was anything the writers would ever bring up, but little did I know the very next episode to air would do just that. Near the beginning of the episode, the doctor talked about how trying to find the solution to time travel was his life's work. He even said it had taken centuries of research. My life's work. Decades, centuries really, of research and experimentation and I really had it cracked. I guess that means Dr. Hoops can regenerate. Time Pony confirmed. You know, I bet he has two hearts. But that's besides the point. The doctor's research on making time come forward to you was in vain. Magic already allows for time travel, as the audience has seen. But as he stated in his monologue, there are things magic can't explain, which is where science comes in and makes more things possible. However, the lines between the two aren't as distinct as he's making them out to be. Just look at his flameless fireworks. Before the wedding, the doctor couldn't figure out how to ignite them. This is because they required love, something you can't find in some lonely lab. It's fascinating how the answer to a scientific pursuit was a magical one. Perhaps science and magic are more connected than we thought. As Arthur C. Clarke put it, magic is just science we don't understand. So keep on researching, doctor. Oh yeah, and don't forget to vote for your favorite background pony in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Thursday. Brohoof. Buenos dias, mis pony amigos. Last week, I had you guys vote for your favorite background pony in the comments in my last video. You had these six to choose from. The comments were painstakingly counted up, and the results are in. Let's see who won. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, obviously the people who voted were a very small slice of the fandom, but the results give a pretty good representation of the whole. In 6th place, with a meager 5.02% of the vote, is Bon Bon. If you voted for Bon Bon, congrats, you avoided the mainstream. Some of those who voted for her liked how Slice of Life made her a special agent. Yeah, that was definitely a development I didn't see coming. Although, unless you really like Candy, there's not many other reasons to vote for her. Unfortunately, 5th place didn't score much better. With only 0.14% more votes, Octavia received 5.6% of the vote. She's appeared several times in the show, usually playing the cello. I play the cello. Awesome! What is it? A song? No, dude, it's like a giant violin. In fan work, she's constantly putting up with Vinyl's antics, which I find hilarious and many find relatable. It's pretty clear that she's very classically influenced. Some of her voters are probably fans of classical music or just appreciate the culture. She is, after all, hands down the classiest. Moving on, with 7.35% of the vote, fourth place goes to Lyra. Lyra is famous for sitting like a human? There's not a lot to appreciate about Lyra within context of the show. So why did she do better than Bon Bon or Octavia? Well, I think there's two answers to that. Many voters admired Lyra's obsession with humans and anthropology, an aspect of her character that isn't canon, which is fine. The second reason is her color scheme. If I had to vote for my favorite base solely on design, I would definitely vote for Lyra. Up next, my personal favorite. Third place goes to Dr. Hooves, who had nearly twice as many votes as Lyra, and I'm not at all surprised. I mean, come on. Time Lord. He's worked with time travel, and as I've mentioned before, he's alluded to the fact that he spans centuries, basically confirming pony regeneration. My vote went towards the Doctor, not just because I'm an avid fan of Doctor Who, but his character, in my opinion, has the most potential. Think about all the mystery that surrounds this guy. How similar to the Doctor is he? Is he an alien? Is this Doctor the last of his race? Or is he a normal pony, bearing only the resemblance of the Doctor? The world may never know plenty of opportunity for this guy. Now places 3 through 6 have been revealed, leaving only 2 left, Derpy and Vinyl Scratch. Who received the most votes? Is that even a question? I think everyone knew right off the bat who would win this. Who but the myth, the legend, the derp horse. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Vinyl Scratch got 16.75% of the vote, putting her in second place. Who doesn't love DJ Pony? She's a musical icon, has the raddest mane, and even prevented an invasion. Well, her human counterpart did. And through all this, she hasn't spoken one word. As epic as she is, Vinyl didn't even come close to Derpy. First place got more than three times as many votes as second place did. In fact, Derpy had more than half the entire votes. Wow, I mean, I knew she would win, but that's a lot. Why does the fandom love Derpy so much? Well, besides the fact that she's adorably charming and unique, there's another reason I think greatly contributes to the fandom's love for Derpy. Her history. First of all, her origin story. The Derp Eyes weren't intentional, but were rather an animation error that was overlooked in the pilot. However, the one thing that really boosted her popularity was the controversy behind her temporary censorship. The whole Save Derpy drama gave her plenty of publicity and encouraged many to support her return to the show. And not only is Derpy back, but she's a fan favorite. Congratulations to Derpy and everyone who voted for her, and thanks to everyone who participated in the poll. This summer, I'm planning on posting some extra videos here and there, so stay tuned for those. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Bro Hoof. A couple of days ago, we got a trailer for the third Equestria Girls movie. Even though it feels like Rainbow Rocks just came out, the sequel is less than three months away. Ever since the first installment, I've been curious about the original Human Twilight, so needless to say, I'm pretty excited. The reason why this character intrigues me so much is this. Human Twilight is what would have become of Pony Twilight if it weren't for her magic. If Pony Twilight didn't have magic, she wouldn't have become Celestia's student and never would have moved to Ponyville. Never having discovered the magic of friendship, she would still be that overly studious character we saw in the pilot. But wait a second, if this is the case, then wouldn't Human Twilight attend Canterlot High? Just look at Pony Twilight. Even before her magical talent was discovered, she lived in Canterlot. Why would her human counterpart attend Crystal Prep? Well, think about this in Pony terms. We can assume the two high schools are mirrors of the two regions in Equestria, the area around Canterlot and the Crystal Empire. Currently, our Twilight has a very special connection to the Crystal Empire. Her brother married the Empire's princess. Translating this back into the human world, I assume Cadence is the principal of Crystal Prep, just like how Celestia and Luna are the principals of Canterlot High. This probably means Shining Armor plays a big role in that school. He's most likely their coach. Since Twilight is very close to Crystal Prep's principal and her husband, maybe she chose to attend that school over Canterlot High. Hopefully this means we'll get to see Cadence and Shining Armor in this movie. Now, Human Twilight hasn't experienced the magic of friendship yet, but who says she will? Is she ever gonna put down those dusty old books like the other Twilight and discover friendship? 
it? Because, well, that seems sort of old hat, especially since we've already seen it twice, once with Twilight and another time with bushy eyebrows here. Somehow they have to switch things up. Maybe this one will just never discover friendship. Or maybe she's evil. Nah, although that would be really cool. I just hope that one scene in the trailer ends up with human Twilight going to Equestria. You know, as a unicorn. I definitely have high hopes for this movie. Can't wait to watch it. Until then, see you guys on Thursday. Bro hoof. Do you guys remember that video about why Rainbow Dash and Daring do look so similar? In that video, I never found a satisfying explanation. In the comments, many of you liked the idea that the two are twins separated at birth. Of all the other theories, that one seems more likely. But that question aside, now we have a new problem. And you thought one recolor was bad enough. <laughs> In last Saturday's episode, we were introduced to Moondancer, old name, new character. Turns out she looks an awful lot like a certain main character of the show. The reason she was designed after Twilight was to show how similar they are, and that if Twilight didn't discover friendship, she would be just like that. Sort of similar to the original human Twilight. Now, that's the actual reason based on reality, but like any good analysis, I'm looking for explanations within the world of My Little Pony. So just for now, pretend the character designers didn't plan this. Now the obvious differences between these two are their colors, cutie marks, voices, eyebrows, eyebrows, but other than that, their designs are a little too similar to be a coincidence. Fortunately, this look-alike is a lot easier to solve than the one between Daring Dew and Rainbow Dash. Unlike those two, Twilight and Moondancer go way back. Daring and Rainbow were twinning long before they even met, which is truly uncanny, but because the two unicorns knew each other, one might have influenced the other. It's no secret that Moondancer really admired Twilight. There were several reasons to admire her. She had the same interests as Moondancer, and chances are she was better at magic than her. Academically, she was probably brighter as well. It's not a stretch to say Moondancer styled her mane to look like Twilight. Instead of using her mane style to express herself, she may have used her mane style to associate with her best friend. This seems even more likely when you take into account her lack of social confidence. Later in life, after she felt abandoned by Twilight, she started wearing her mane up. Of course she wouldn't want to associate with the one who left without saying goodbye. When Twilight didn't show up at Moondancer's party, it crushed her. At that point, not only was Twilight her closest friend and academically brighter, but she was a student of Princess Celestia. What wasn't there to look up to? other than the fact that she was a horrible friend. But Moondancer saw past that. In my theory, Twilight was her idol, which is why that one decision to not show up literally ruined her life. Okay, so the one who she modeled her mane after in admiration abandoned her, so she started wearing her mane up. It's an interesting theory, but that doesn't explain her tail. Or the stripes, now that I think about it. I doubt Moondancer went to the length of dyeing her mane, especially since she still had those stripes long after Twilight left. Plus, you could argue that she only wore her hair up for convenience. Possibly her similarity to Twilight is unintentional. There's really no way to know for sure. Theories are the best we got. But the odds of this are a lot better than the odds of Daring Dew and Rainbow Dash looking alike. What do you guys think about this theory? Was Moondancer's style inspired by Twilight, or is it just an uncanny coincidence? Let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Brohoof. Do princesses dream of magic sheep? In case you were wondering, that title is a parody of a science fiction novel called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? But that's not important to this video. The big threat in this episode was the Tantibus, a creation of Luna. The Dreaming Ponies of Ponyville had to keep the Tantibus from entering the real world at all costs, even if it meant becoming an alicorn. But wait a second, this was just a dream. How can something that exists in the mind enter the real world? Boy do I have one heck of a theory. <laughs> This one's a little more in-depth than my other theories, so hold on tight. You know, I considered making a video about shared dreams after Bloom and Gloom, but it's a good thing I waited. This episode gave us lots of insight on how Luna walks in the dreams of others. When Luna entered the dreams of the main six, her magic took the form of white strings. They connected her horn to their foreheads. Now, this wasn't a shared dream, but rather Luna's method of entering the six dreams individually. She had no problem going from one dream to another. Now later, things get complicated. To catch the Tanibus, Luna connects not just the main six, but every sleeping pony in Ponyville. She creates a shared dream so the Tantibus wouldn't have anywhere else to go or hide. Think about the implications of this. In the episode Bloom and Gloom, the Cutie Mark Crusaders had an entire conversation in their dreams that each remembered when they woke up. And I thought that was impressive. Try all of Ponyville having the exact same experience. The best way I can think of describing this is to compare it to an online game. As long as you have a good connection, anyone with a PC can meet in the same server and experience the same things as other players. This is very similar to the shared dream, where Luna is the server and each 
person is connected through those wiry things. Running this dream was super tiring for Luna, although that makes sense. She would have to keep track of each pony's actions in relative locations to keep the dream going, so no surprise there. But there's one problem. Once the Tanibis had enough power, it threatened to enter the real world. If all these dreams take place in the minds of these ponies, then how can something in a dream pass into real life? It just doesn't work like that. Our current idea of a dream must be wrong. Instead of something in the brain, here's my theory. All dreams happen in a dream dimension, a dimension where reality is crafted by the minds of the ponies within it. Here's my reasoning. Remember Make New Friends But Keep Discord? Discord ripped open a tear in the pony dimension that led to the sock puppet dimension. The rip between dimensions was awfully similar to the rip into the real world that the Tantibus made. This leads me to believe that the dream world is just as real as any dimension. It's probably a dimension itself. That would mean in order to dreamwalk, Luna would have to know first of all how to access the dimension, and second of all how to maneuver between different dreams. It certainly doesn't seem inconceivable. Now the next part of this explanation is a little bit of a rabbit trail, so bear with me. From what we saw last Saturday, those lines are how Luna connects to the dreams of others. In Sleepless in Ponyville, Luna visited Scootaloo's dream. I think if we saw the real Scootaloo at that moment, she would have had that magic string connected to her forehead. Same with anyone else who got a visit from Luna in their dreams. The real Luna has that magic coming from her horn. This is necessary to connect her to their dreams, but notice the dream Luna never has that. Dream Luna exists because of those connections. There's a separation here. Real life Luna controls dream Luna. Here's where it gets even more complicated, and you thought it was impossible. Think back to the shared dream in Ponyville. In that dream, the connections were coming from Luna's horn. Wait, in this case, that couldn't possibly be Dream Luna. It's the real Luna that makes the connections. Somehow, the actual physical Luna is appearing in the dream world. Maybe that explains the bubble around her? Now, I realize how much of a mind blow this is, but just think about it. Each of these ponies are in bed somewhere in the real Ponyville. At the end of those connections are the four heads of the ponies around her. Don't worry, I'm just as confused as you are. As mind-boggling as this is, it certainly explains how the Tantibus, a dream being, can enter the real world, and Luna, the real one, can enter the dream world. It's a matter of moving from one dimension to another. This might prove that the dream world is just another dimension. For those of you who could keep up, does dreaming happen in another dimension, or does everything happen in the ponies' heads? Let me know what you guys think in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time, Brohoof. So there's this weird connection between ponies' names and their cutie marks. Flyer has a liar, Cheese Sandwich has a cheese sandwich, Snips and Snails have, well, scissors and a snail, Silver Spoon and Diamond Tiara, you get the point. These are just naming a few. Now this isn't the case across the line, but the fact that it happened more than once is mysterious. Were those ponies called that before they got their cutie marks? And more importantly, how do ponies even get their names? <laughs>
does know. Not necessarily Celestia. Who says it even has to be a person? It's a possibility that some force tells parents what to name the pony, directly or subconsciously. Although the answer could be a lot simpler. Who knows? Maybe everyone was just born with labels. There's lots of possibilities, but what do you guys think? I want to hear what you have to say in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Bro Hoop. Blank flanks? More like dank flanks. <laughs> Wow. Alicorns, the unicorns with wings, or the pegasi with horns, I guess. You know what I mean. As of right now, there are four alicorn princesses in Equestria. One used to be a unicorn, and according to Twilight Sparkle and the Crystal Heart spell, another used to be a pegasus. So is an alicorn something you can become? What about Celestia and Luna? Did they become alicorns at one point, or were they born alicorns? <laughs> You know what? I feel like being an alicorn today. Yeah, I know, alicorn OCs, Mary Sue, blah blah blah, who cares? Anyway, ever since Ink Rose's video on the subject, it's pretty widely accepted by the fandom that there are two types of alicorns. Naturally born alicorns like Celestia and Luna, and artificial alicorns like Twilight and Cadence. Even Lauren Fowl said Celestia and Luna were both born alicorns. Besides, a big difference can be seen between the two sets of princesses. Celestia and Luna don't seem to have aged at all. Even a thousand years before, they looked the same. Meanwhile, Cadence looks very different from her appearance in Twilight's flashback, and compared Compared to a thousand years, that wasn't so long ago. Okay, so that question's pretty much answered, but there's so much we still don't know about alicorns. For example, what makes alicorns so special? Wait, 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 I already played the intro. As I was saying, if an alicorn is just a unicorn with wings, then why is every single alicorn a princess? We know the correlation between alicorns and royalty is pretty well known, even to someone as isolated as Starlight Glimmer was. But Twilight could easily just whip up a spell that gives a unicorn wings. Heck, she already has. Albeit they were butterfly wings and didn't last very long, but the question still stands. Say Twilight magically gave a unicorn a pair of normal Pegasus wings. Would that person become royalty? No. There's another variable here that explains the difference between true alicorns and normal ponies. Magic. It's magic! Each of the four true alicorns have a very strong magic. The episode Twilight's Kingdom confirmed just how special alicorn magic is. Twilight, who contained the magic of four alicorns, was evenly matched against T-Rex, who had the magic of literally everyone else. A common question people seem to ask me a lot is why only Twilight became an alicorn. Each of the main six helped to spread friendship around Equestria, so why don't they all become princesses? Turns out the answer is right here. Twilight was always very magical. She is, after all, the element of magic. Magically speaking, the other five just don't have what it takes. Now, the process of becoming an alicorn is still very vague. We know Twilight was born with the raw potential, and we can assume the sisters were too. However, Cadence we don't really know much about. Even though she was a pegasus, it's been shown that you don't need a horn to hold magic. Maybe she had the same type of magical potential that Twilight had. And actually, now that I think about it, who says Twilight Sparkle and the Crystal Heart spell is even a valid source of information? It's possible that Cadence started out as a unicorn just like Twilight, but like I said, it's not the physical wings and horn combo that makes an alicorn special. It has to be their magic. Now back to naturally born alicorns. This is a topic I find really interesting, because it's an area the show has never expanded upon. There's only two naturally born alicorns that we know of. Now, obviously I'm not counting the various animation errors, but here's a really good question. Are there any other naturally born alicorns? <laughs> But, anyway, I like to believe that there are other alicorns out there. The big picture setup of the MLP universe might have a wider scope than we thought. I wouldn't be surprised if there was an entire kingdom of alicorns in some Olympus-like setting, maybe in a land outside Equestria. Since Celestia and Luna exist, you have to wonder if they came from alicorn parents. Maybe they have an entire alicorn family. What if there is a third sister of the stars? Maybe throw some male alicorns into the mix? Who knows? All I know is that the storyline potential for this is endless. Now, the reason why I assumed an Olympus-like setting is because alicorns have been likened to gods and ponies to demigods. I absolutely love I love this idea because it also explains my theory about magic. The alicorns, gods and goddesses, have much more magic than the demigod ponies. And just like Greek mythology, they're also the mortals, who have magic in very small amounts, if any at all. What do you guys think? Is magic what makes alicorns special? Are there natural alicorns other than Celestia and Luna? And do you even consider Celestia and Luna to be natural alicorns in the first place? I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments. Until then, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Brohoof!
Buenos dias, mis pony amigos. There are four alicorns in Equestria. This is a statement I made in my last video. In the comments, which I love to read, a good amount of people said that I forgot to mention a few characters. First of all, Fleur de Lis. You know, the one who hangs out with Fancy Pants. Interestingly, she's not actually an alicorn at all. This is a really common misconception, well, for two reasons. She seems to have the stature of an alicorn, or at least of someone with wings, when in reality, she doesn't have wings. Well, not in the show, at least. In the MLP app, she is an alicorn, which is another reason why there's so much confusion around her. This is most likely a mistake on the app developer's part. A mistake that I don't think holds any significance to the show. Now for the second character. Lots of people questioned why I didn't count Chrysalis in my list of alicorns. She does, after all, have wings and a horn. To answer that one, let me say this. All alicorns have wings and a horn, but not everyone with wings and a horn is an alicorn. Rarity did not become an alicorn in the Sonic Rainboom episode. It's pretty much the same with the changelings. Chrysalis can't be an alicorn because, well, she isn't even a pony. While her horn functions like a pony's might, her wings are more like those of an insect. The same goes for all the changelings. Some have theorized that Chrysalis is an alicorn under some spell which might explain why she looks different from the others. But I don't think this is the case either. Even though she's bigger and most likely smarter than the other changelings, that's just a reference to real-life insect colonies. Ant colonies, for example, usually have a single queen that's greater in size than the workers. That's why the name Queen Chrysalis was used. Now for Princess Sterling and Princess Gold Lily. For those of you who don't know, these are both toy characters that Hasbro has recently released. However, I don't consider toys to affect the canon of Friendship is Magic, and I don't think these two will be joining the show anytime soon. Now, I could be wrong. Wouldn't be the first time, but let's not forget Princess Skyla. When her toy was released, many speculated what roles the alleged daughter Cadence and Shining might play in Season 4. Yeah. Two years later, she still hasn't made an appearance. I'm pretty sure we can expect the same from these two as well. As of right now, I still believe that there are only four alicorns in Equestria, but I guess we'll just see. Now, I know this isn't like my normal videos, but I feel like those things need to be addressed. Also, unfortunately, I don't have the time this week to post one of my usual 3-4 to four minute videos. Thank you all so much for understanding, and I'll see you guys next Thursday. Bro hoof. The time has come for me to talk about one of the more hated characters in the MLP universe. That's right, none other than Flash Waifu Stealer Sentry. Lots of people criticize Flash for being a totally unnecessary part of the first movie. I mean, he was just a love interest for the sake of there being a love interest, but in this case, there might be more here than meets the eyes. <laughs> In the first Equestria Girls movie, Sunset Shimmer went through the portal and stole Twilight's crown. And I have to say, that robbery was pretty well planned out. She knew exactly what room to go in. Sunset was so prepared she even had an exact replica of Twilight's crown. But this raises some questions. How did she know that Twilight and her crown would be there? In fact, how did she even know that there was a fourth princess in the first place? The events of Equestria Girls happened smack dab after Magical Mystery Cure. Somehow, Sunset Shimmer was staying up to date with everything going on in Equestria. She must have known about even recent events, such as Twilight becoming a princess but how? Well, there are a few possibilities. There may have been some form of communication connecting the worlds, you know, like Sunset's book. But the book itself hadn't been used since Sunset was Celestia's student. There's really no evidence for or against a similar method of communication being used, so I'm ruling out that possibility altogether. I find it much more likely that the mirror was involved. Maybe she had been through the portal several times in the past and visits Equestria frequently. However, given the mirror's location and distance from Canterlot, I don't think this is the case. Now how about this? Instead of someone going into Equestria to gather information, what if someone from Equestria went into the human world and gave information? The Crystal Empire's castle is very well protected, so this would have to be an inside job. Say, a guard working the night shift could easily sneak through the portal and be back before morning. And you know I'm not talking about any random guard. Oh no. I think it was Flash Sentry. <laughs> He helped Sunset Shimmer stay up to date with events in Equestria. For further evidence, let's look at the timeline. According to Luna, the mirror used to be located in the throne room of the Canterlot Castle, but when Cadence took over the Crystal Empire, they moved it there for safekeeping. So the mirror had only recently been moved to its current location. Okay, now let's look at Flash Sentry. His presence as a royal guard is somewhat contrived. Just look at his design. He's the only member of the guard who doesn't have the default crystal look. Kinda suspicious, especially when you consider the fact that he's new. Who's that? He's a new member of the Castle Guard. Flash Sentry, I think. So the mirror is moved to the Crystal Castle, and all of a sudden this new recruit shows up. Not too long after, Sunset Shimmer makes her well-planned move. The timing is perfect. And if you watch that scene again, you'll notice Sunset knew exactly what room Twilight was staying in, and she also knew when Twilight Summit was taking place. These are all things the Crystal Empire's Royal Guard would need to know, when and where a princess would be. Someone had to have told her this, and I think Flash Sentry is our most likely candidate. 
So if my theory is true, does that make him a traitor? Not necessarily, maybe he didn't have bad intentions. Perhaps Sunset Shimmer was misleading him into thinking he was actually helping. I wouldn't put it past old Sunset to use someone in that way, but intentionally or not, I think Flash was involved with stealing more than just your waifu. Based on this theory, I would say Sunset Shimmer and Flash Sentry met by the horse statue every 30 moons and talked equestrian news. Now think about what this would look like to an outsider. Nothing would be even slightly suspicious. Why? Remember, Sunset and Human Flash were an item in that world, so to anyone else it would just look like an innocent date. We know the breakup happened a few weeks before Twilight arrived, but while it lasted, it would have made for a great cover-up. In Rainbow Rock, Sunset Shimmer explained how she only dated Brad, I mean, Flash Sentry, in order to gain popularity. But keep in mind that all of this was with the long-term goal of taking over Equestria. So all in all, I'd say this theory is definitely a possibility. But what do you guys think? Did Flash Sentry keep Sunset Shimmer up to date with events in Equestria? Is that how she knew all the details required to steal the crown? Let me know what you think in the comments. Bad news guys, I'm going out of town and I won't be able to post a video next week. But don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the Q&A or the collab, which may or may not be with a certain German brony YouTuber. Although I'm not posting next week, I will be working on those things. Thank you all so much for your patience. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Brohoof. The Sonic Rain Boom is legendary, so elusive that only one pony has ever been able to pull it off. And that pony is, of course, Rainbow Dash. The concept of a Sonic Rain Boom is really interesting. Going at a certain speed creates a massive explosion of color. Although you have to wonder why. How do Sonic Rain Booms work in the first place? <laughs> Let's start this off by establishing what a Sonic Rain Boom is. According to Pinkie Pie, if a Pegasus gets going fast enough, they can create a Sonic Boom and a Rainbow at the same time. Before we talk about the Rainbow aspect, let's discuss how Sonic Booms work. And I'm sorry, but this is gonna require a little science lesson. Back to school. So any movement in our atmosphere creates pressure waves, aka sound waves. These waves cause vibrations that our brains translate into sound. Now in this case, Rainbow Dash is emitting pressure waves. As she moves faster and faster, the waves in front of her become more and more compact. Once she hits Mach 1, the speed of sound, Rainbow Dash would be traveling at the same speed as the waves in front of her. The pressure waves would be so tightly packed together, breaking through them by going faster would cause a shock wave. This is how sonic booms get their, well, boom. Now take a deep breath. The science lesson is over, but if you'll remember, the sonic boom is really only half of the full thing. At the same time as the sonic boom, a rainbow explosion occurs as well. To establish what that rainbow is, I'll have to establish what it's not. Of course, this is all up for debate, but I don't think there's some sort of light refraction or anything like that going on here. The rain boom is just too big to be a natural water droplet light refractor. Plus, that wouldn't really explain the fiery look, so it's probably not a normal rainbow. Next, some have theorized that Rainbow Dash was breaking the visual spectrum as well as the audible, a photonic boom. However, there's no way Rainbow Dash is traveling even close to the speed of light, so that's out of the question too. I'm thinking the rainbow half of the rain boom can't be explained with science, but it can be explained with magic. This is a magical explosion. How do we know? Well, we don't know for sure, but there are a couple things that might hint towards this conclusion. For example, look at the return of Harmony. In the beginning, when Twilight casted her failsafe spell, which failed by the way, the animation on the ground had a very similar style to the fiery ring from the rain boom. Since that was magic related, one can assume that the rainbow is too. Now this raises a new question. Why does moving at a certain speed create a magical explosion? Well first, let's talk about Pegasus magic. The episode Twilight's Kingdom made it very clear that Pegasus magic is what makes flying possible. In the episode Sonic Rain Boom, it's revealed to us that only Pegasi can naturally walk on clouds, most likely due to the same magic. Now humor me for a moment, what if this magic works like sound waves? It would be these magic waves that allow ponies to manipulate the weather, fly, and walk on clouds. If these waves worked like sound waves, then going at a fast enough speed would cause the same bunching up of energy and release that the sonic boom causes. A magic boom. This is what I believe actually occurs during the sonic rain boom. A sonic boom and a magic boom at the same time. Here's my final evidence for this point. The color. Is it any coincidence that Rainbow Dash is the only one who's pulled off the rain boom? In the past, we've seen a strong correlation between a pony's magic and their color. In most cases, when some aspect of their magic gets taken away, their colors fade as well. Twilight's Kingdom is the odd exception here, only their eyes faded, but there's definitely a connection. In the magic boom theory, the magic in the explosion is from the pony causing it. And since color and magic are linked, the rain boom might just be reflecting the colors of the flying pony. That might be why the rain boom is a rainbow, and also why Twilight Spell, which I mentioned earlier, is colored just like her. So, say Lightning Dust got going fast enough to break the sound barrier. Well, I think the magical explosion would look like this. 
But what do you guys think? Is the rainbow part of the rain boom a so-called magic boom? Let me know what you think in the comments. In case you haven't noticed, which who am I kidding, you've noticed by now, I'm doing a little redesigning around my channel. Not only did I change my background from Sweet Apple Lakers, but I had my OC redrawn too. Chupchi at DeviantArt created a new set of poses for Sawtooth, and I must say, they're really great. I put a link to our DeviantArt in the description, so check that out. There's some more changes coming, but those will be discussed at the end of next Thursday's video. But that aside, on August 22nd, my channel passed 100,000 subscribers. That's one with five zeros. Now more than ever, I'm so grateful to have such a large number of supporting followers. This channel has become such a big part of my life, and it wouldn't be that way without you guys. Thank you so much for keeping up with and contributing to all my wild theories and ideas. It means a lot to me. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next Thursday. Brohoof. Last week, I talked about what might be the science behind the Sonic Rain Boom, but the lore behind this legendary occurrence is rather vague, so this week I'll address the Rain Boom's history. So far, we've been led to believe that Rainbow Dash was the first pony to ever pull off a Sonic Rain Boom. There's a problem with this though. Before the events of the Cutie Mark Chronicles, the Rain Boom was described as a mare's tale. While Rainbow Dash was narrating her Cutie Mark story, she even said she had proven the legends true. So if this was the first Rain Boom, how could stories of such an event exist beforehand? You see the problem? Well, there are a few possible solutions. First of all, it's a possibility that the science behind the Rain Boom was theorized long before it was actually proven. By being the first to pull one off, Rainbow Dash would have been proving a scientific theory. Admittedly, this explanation is a little bit disappointing. Sure, science rules, but the other explanations are a lot more interesting than scientific theories. Let's move on to the second explanation. In this theory, Rainbow Dash wasn't the first to pull off a sonic Rain Boom. Now, whoever this alleged first pony was, it must have been a pretty long time ago for it to be passed off as a mare's tail. Only stories of the Rain Boom seem to have survived. If a pre-Rainbow Dash Rain Boom happened at all, my guess is that it happened sometime before the sisters' reign, back when the tribes were separated. As for who it was, there's literally nothing to go off of. Maybe Commander Hurricane? I mean, he, or she, was involved with the magic of friendship, just like Rainbow Dash, and the Rain Boom is magical, but still, that's hardly evidence. Perhaps Star Swirl the Bearded was involved in some way. Although he's not a Pegasus himself, he might have hired someone with wings so he could research Pegasus magic. If there was a pre-Rainbow Dash Rain Boom, I would love to see that story expanded upon. It would definitely make for a cool fanfic. I'm looking at you, Ink Rose. Now the third explanation is my favorite. My personal belief is that the Rain Boom was predicted in prophecy. The concept of prophecy isn't foreign to the show. In fact, the very first episodes of Milpfin were centered around prophecy. For example, legend has it that in the longest day of the thousandth year, the stars will aid in her escape and she will bring about everlasting night. Or, when the five are present, a spark will cause the sixth element of harmony to appear. Nightmare Moon's return was a pretty significant event, and so was the appearance of the Sixth Element of Harmony. But why would the Rain Boom be prophesied? Well, if you think about it, the Sonic Rain Boom we saw in the Cutie Mark Chronicles could actually be considered as more significant than Nightmare Moon's return. This event is what brought the main six together, and from that one act, Equestria was given new bearers for the Element of Harmony, a new Princess of Friendship, and now an entire team that travels around Equestria resolving problems. Face it, without the main six, Equestria would be doomed. So it only makes sense that an event as important as the Rain Boom would be recorded in prophecy. On top of that, think about how people viewed the Rain Boom before. They disregarded it as just an old mare's tale. Sound familiar? Well, it should, because that's exactly how people viewed Nightmare Moon. This would lead me to believe that both tales came from a similar source, prophecy. But what do you guys think? Was Rainbow Dash actually the first to pull off a sonic Rain Boom? And which of my explanations do you like the best? Do you have any of your own? Let me know in the comments. As of the 4th of September, it's been two full years since I've posted my first video on this channel. And since then, I've uploaded new videos every week with only a few exceptions. The promise of weekly videos is what kept my channel going, but unfortunately, I have to drop the promise. The reason why is this. I'm starting senior year in high school. In fact, my first day was today. Last year, I barely had the time to focus on my studies and maintain a YouTube channel at the same time. While I could try to juggle between the two this year, I feel like that would get in the way of my performance in school. It's a matter of priorities. Now, that's not to say I'm gonna stop making videos altogether. I still wanna upload a pony video at least every other week, but this year, no promises. I'm not leaving the channel or the fandom anytime soon. There's still a whole lot I have planned. I also wanna start posting some non-pony content in the future. Theories about other shows and movies, non-pony remixes, musical analyses, so on and so forth. Don't worry though, as far as pony videos go, there's still a lot to look forward to. With all that said, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Brohoof. As she said during an interview, Lauren Faust had visions for many of the characters she helped to create. 
Her goal is for Rainbow Dash to become a Wonderbolt, for Rarity to get her shop in Canterlot, and for Twilight to become Celestia's successor. Fast forward half a decade now, the most recent episode as of the writing of the script was Rarity Investigates, and boy, so much has changed. Rainbow Dash is flying with the Wonderbolts, and she's close to becoming one. Rarity has her shop in Canterlot, and instead of replacing Celestia, Twilight is ruling alongside her. It's amazing to see how far these characters we've grown to love have come, but it makes you wonder, what lies ahead for the series? <laughs> Friendship is Magic is comprised of over 100 episodes now, and while each one tells its own narrative, the whole of them tells a bigger story. Let's review the overbranching story of our central characters, the main six. In the pilot episodes, the main six came together and used the elements of harmony for the first time. The elements were seen as what united them and became the center of the show's lore. For the next two seasons, Twilight studied friendship under Celestia until the end of season three, when she became the princess of friendship. The role she would play as princess, however, wasn't yet revealed. More on that later. On to the season four premiere. When the Tree of Harmony lost its energy, the main six sacrificed the elements of harmony to keep the magic going. This is important because it helped them realize their friendship had nothing to do with the elements. Just because friendship is magic doesn't mean friendship depends on magic. Interestingly, what used to be the center of the story haven't been used ever since. Now the mystery behind the elements has expanded into the mystery behind the tree. In the finale of that season, we were introduced to Twilight's castle, which brings us to season five. Twilight's role as a princess, a concept that had bothered her since she became a princess, was finally made clear. She and her friends, with the help of the kitty map, were to spread friendship across Equestria. And that's where we currently are. Twilight's role has finally been revealed. On a smaller scale, like I said in the intro, the main six have almost met their individual goals. If you were wondering about the other three, Pinkie Pie, Applejack, and Fluttershy, it doesn't look like they have any long-term major ambitions. They seem to be content with their current lifestyle. The only other major change I can think of that's yet to come is the Cutie Mark Crusaders actually getting their Cutie Marks. Although I say this, we're not running out of accomplishments. Things like this in the show will never change. New goals and ambitions can always be given to any person. For example, when the CMC do get their cutie marks, it's not the end of their story. They might have the new goal of helping other blank flanks. Also, think about the other three members of the main six, the ones who were never given any major long-term ambitions. Who's to say they never will? Fluttershy may want to open a veterinary hospital. Pinky may want to start her own bakery. Applejack is probably never going to do anything other than apples. But you get my point. And this doesn't just concern the protagonists. New villains can be introduced or old ones brought back and converted. The show will never run out of ways to keep the characters changing. They can never become fully exhausted of new scenarios the characters have to solve their way out of. When I ask what's left to be done, I'm not talking about the characters or episode plots. I'm talking about the monumental change. Equestria gaining new bearers of the elements of harmony, Twilight becoming a princess, the chest revealing Twilight's kingdom, the map, all of the big picture changes. It seems like new aspects of the magic of friendship have been introduced each season. The cutie map seems to be the final step. To me, it looks like all the major change, especially concerning magic, is coming to a close. I'm not saying the series is ending. As I said, there's endless potential for the main six and the secondary characters. But the overall story arc is gonna have to take a new direction. Whatever's coming in the season five finale or beyond has to continue revealing. Something that expands on our current understanding of magic and history. Five seasons have basically brought us to a happy ending. A team of six ponies meant to spread the magic of friendship. Yes, new problems will come, but the main six appear to be permanently tied to Ponyville in the cutie map. Future episodes can do two things. They can add branches to our current understanding of Equestria, like the Crystal Empire did. Although this would make for some interesting two-parters and shorter conflicts, this doesn't really add to the big picture story. The second thing they can do is explore Equestria's history, like Princess Twilight Sparkle did. What led to the creation of the elements, or the tree? Where did all this magic come from? from? Is it from an old alicorn civilization? Things like that. By exploring vertically, they would still be adding to the overarching story. Basically, prequels. And just because they explore the past doesn't mean they have to abandon the main six in the process. Look at how the season four premiere showed us about the past. Similar flashbacks or maybe even time travel can be used. No matter if they do one or the other or both, the main six's current position seems to be fixed. It's really looking like her current status quo doesn't have much room to change in the future, but all of that is speculation. What do you guys think? What does the future of Friendship as Magic look like? Let me know what you think in the comments. I can't wait to read your responses. Until then, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Bro hoof.
I was in the process of making a video about the Friendship Games, but I had to put that one on hold because, oh my gosh, last Saturday's episode was too good to be true. Not only did it give Diamond Tiara the depth and the motivation I've been requesting, but our blank flanks have finally ceased to be blank flanks. I thought it would never happen, but it did, and the way they pulled it off was so much better than I was expecting. The conclusion to this overarching theme was so satisfying. Think about it. The two main sets of characters in the show are the main six and the CMC. Now we know that they're connected in a much deeper way. It's clear that both groups were destined to be, but I think the CMC might be more strongly drawn together. The main six got their cutie marks at the same time, and so did the cutie mark crusaders. But unlike the main six, the CMC got their cutie marks together, all three in the same place having the same thought. We've never seen anything like that. Plus their cutie marks all have a united theme. The main six? Kinda, but hardly as much. There's no question in my mind that a strong magic has taken the CMC to this point, where they can benefit other ponies. Most cutie marks just sort of fade in, while theirs was much more dramatic and even magical. It's difficult to emphasize just how absolutely brilliant this is. These three ponies have a shared destiny, to help other ponies with their destinies, to assist any pony who's confused about who they're meant to be. We've already seen it with Troubleshoes, and now with Diamond Tiara. The mind-blowing part is how this fits in with the main six. As of the beginning of the season, the main six have finally discovered their destiny together, to go around Equestria solving friendship problems via the map. In this episode, the CMC have discovered their destiny together, to go around solving identity problems. How more perfect can you get? Ponies in Equestria can run into social problems, amongst others, or personal problems with themselves. And now there's a team to help both. People are saying that Crusaders of the Lost Mark was basically the magical mystery cure for the CMC, but it's even better than that. When Twilight became a princess, no one knew what that really meant, or what her role would be. However, in Crusaders of the Lost Mark, the CMC's destinies were made very clear, and as a result, it was much more satisfying. That's why this episode has replaced Magical Mystery Cure as my personal favorite. It really ties a neat bow on all the loose ends the show has built towards. What a perfect system! It would be a shame if someone were to mess things up. But this makes me wonder, if the CMC are meant to solve problems regarding cutie marks, how will they come into contact with these problems? The main six have the cutie map, which alerts them and shows them where they need to go. Is it possible that the CMC will get their own kind of cutie map? Or perhaps their cutie marks will start appearing on the main six's map. Who knows, maybe the problems will just come to them. What do you guys think? How similar are the roles of the main six in the CMC? Let me know in the comments. I can't wait to see what you guys have to say. And stay tuned for my next video about the Friendship Games. You guys are gonna like it. Until then, this is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Bro hoof. Wait a minute, they're colors. Where have I seen that? <gasps> the Candy Corn Crusaders. The finale of Friendship Games was basically a role reversal from the first movie. This time, it was Twilight who turned into a raging she-demon and Sunset Shimmer who set her straight. Granted, the Twilight we saw wasn't from the Pony World, but it is interesting to see just to what extent Sunset really has replaced Pony Twilight. In this movie, the same six elements were involved, however, the bearer of the element of magic seemed to be Sunset Shimmer. After all, it was Sunset who had that totally overused line. You know the one. The most important magic of all, the magic of friendship. Seriously though, that line's in like every movie. As I was saying, Sunset Shimmer has gone from one extreme to the other, Rainbow Rock serving as a transition. With each successive movie, Pony Twilight has played less and less of a role. She was barely in this one. And because of that, the human main six have become independent of her. On a side note, this is also Hasbro slowly weaning us away from the pony aspect of the story. With each successive movie, the actual ponies get less and less screen time. Anyway, Sunset is pretty much the element of magic now, which basically confirms the theory I came up with after Rainbow Rocks. Not that Sunset is the seventh element of harmony, but that she's the alternate sixth element of magic. Here's a link to my full video on the subject. I think the whole alternate element of magic theory also explains the ending. The purple spark which formed further away represents Twilight and the equestrian element of magic. The closer red spark represents Sunset Shimmer and the human world element of magic. While we're talking about the ending, I want to point out two more things. One is that the formation of the red spark occurs when the sun sets. Sunset. 
The purple one forms directly after, because twilight comes after sunset. The second thing I want to point out is how the light on the hills briefly forms what looks like a phoenix, another reference to Sunset's reformation and my past is not today. Now every time one of these movies comes out, more and more pieces of the puzzle come together, giving me more to talk and theorize about. Friendship Games was certainly no exception. Much to my delight, the question of how magic works in Equestria has finally been brought up in the movies. Sunset has gained the same curiosity that kept me and other theorists asking. It reminds me of a line in the first movie. Pop quiz. What happens when you bring an element of harmony? into an alternate world. You don't know? Seriously? No, we don't know. Tell us. Yeah, that was never really explained. The reason why simply putting on a crown resulted in this wasn't made clear in that movie, but that's why Friendship Games was so great. Well, one of the reasons. With Midnight Sparkle, we had a similar transformation. This second account told us so much about the first account, and how equestrian magic affects humans in general. But first, let's refer to Sunset Shimmer's transformation. In the original Equestria Girls movie, Sunset made it sound like her goal the entire time was to take over Equestria, you know, with an army of teenage zombies. However, I don't think this is the case. It's true that both accounts of transformation turned the character in question evil, but let's not stop at that. What do we mean by becoming evil? I really don't like that phrase because it's so vague. Evil is obviously a force in Equestria, but it has to have motive behind it, not just evil for the sake of evil. Fortunately enough, motive is what we saw in both cases. Sunset's motive was power, but before she became a demon, I don't think she would have resorted to mind control in a straight up battle, even if she could have. I'm not saying she didn't have bad intentions, but her demon's course of action was much more extreme than I think hers would have been. Twilight's account gives me a similar impression. I mean, she didn't just start wrecking things for fun, her motive was knowledge. She truly wanted to learn, to understand everything about magic. Destroying the human world is something non-demon Twilight wouldn't have even thought about doing, but her demon, that's a different story. When both of these girls transformed, they simply gained the power necessary to carry out their goals. And that is what I believe magic used incorrectly does to humans. It gives them a power so strong, it clouds out any sound judgment just to fulfill the goal of the person using it. Both instances of transformation were similar in quite a few ways. Although Twilight took a little pressuring, both willingly brought the magic upon themselves. However, once it started taking effect, they resisted. Both hated what they were becoming, but once it was complete, they forgot, suddenly happy with their forms. Their demons completely overshadowed their will. That's why Spike's puppy dog eyes helped to bring Twilight back. It reminded her of, well, herself, and made her hate what she had become. That's another big difference between these two. Sunset Shimmer didn't repent until after the main six took force, but Twilight willingly repented. Next off, let's transition into the magical side of this. It's important to note that both sources of magic were very different. One was the physical element of magic, and the other was the pendant that Twilight created. Putting on the element of magic instantly empowered Sunset Shimmer. This was not the magic of friendship though, possibly a corrupted version of it. My theory is that when the main six used the elements of harmony on Sunset Shimmer, all of that magic within her was turned into the magic of friendship. This may be why she bears the element of magic so well. Now onto Twilight's source of magic. Her pendant contained the magic of not one of the elements, like Sunset, but all of them. Instead of coming from six different people, Twilight took all of that magic in on herself. I suppose this would make her more powerful than Demon Sunset was. We didn't see Sunset tearing holes between dimensions, maybe that's because she couldn't. Remember, Sunset Shimmer was dependent on the portal. This adds up, because interdimensional interaction is something we've only seen beings with powerful magic accomplish, like Star Swirl or Discord. Star Swirl in Discord. What a funny connection. Anyway, I bet when Twilight released the magic, she was given much more power than Sunset. Well, Sunset the first time around. In this movie, Sunset Shimmer seemed to gain an equal and opposite force to that of Twilight. When Twilight used the pendant, it contained the magic individually stolen from each character. But when Sunset used the pendant, the magic came in from all of the elements at once. They were used in, keyword here, harmony. And much like how the elements expressed themselves through one individual, all the magic was properly channeled through Sunset. So the source of the magic is the same in both cases, but the difference is the harmony. That explains why the amount of magic she had was equal to Twilight, yet opposite in power. But what do you guys think? How do you feel about how Sunset has replaced Twilight, or my theory about how the transformations worked? Let me know in the comments. This is the Brony Notion, signing out until next time. Brohoof.